Welcome to the Bookcast YouTube channel. Today, the audiobook of Fyodor Dostoevsky's White Notes from Underground Part 2 is with you. You can subscribe to our channel to listen to more audiobooks and like our video to support us. Let's start our audiobook without making you wait too long. It was nearly 8 o'clock. The two young men hurried to Bakalyev's to arrive before Luzin. Why, who was that? asked Razumihin as soon as they were in the street. It was Svidrigailov, that landowner in whose house my sister was insulted when she was their governess. Through his persecuting her with his attentions, she was turned out by his wife, Marfa Petrovna. This Marfa Petrovna begged Dunya's forgiveness afterwards, and she's just died suddenly. It was of her we were talking this morning. I don't know why I'm afraid of that man. He came here at once after his wife's funeral. He is very strange, and is determined on doing something. We must guard Dunya from him, that's what I wanted to tell you, do you hear? Guard her. What can he do to harm Adosha Romanovna? Thank you, Rodia, for speaking to me like that. We will, we will guard her. Where does he live? I don't know. Why didn't you ask? What a pity. I'll find out, though. Did you see him? asked Raskolnikov after a pause. Yes, I noticed him, I noticed him well. You did really see him? You saw him clearly? Raskolnikov insisted. Yes, I remember him perfectly, I should know him in a thousand, I have a good memory for faces. They were silent again. H.M. That's all right, muttered Raskolnikov. Do you know, I fancied. I keep thinking that it may have been an hallucination. What do you mean? I don't understand you. Well, you all say, Raskolnikov went on, twisting his mouth into a smile, that I am mad. I thought just now that perhaps I really am mad, and have only seen a phantom. What do you mean? Why, who can tell? Perhaps I am really mad, and perhaps everything that happened all these days may be only imagination. ACH, Rodia, you have been upset again. But what did he say, what did he come for? Raskolnikov did not answer. Razumihin thought a minute. Now let me tell you my story, he began, I came to you, you were asleep. Then we had dinner, and then I went to Porphyry's, Zaimtov was still with him. I tried to begin, but it was no use. I couldn't speak in the right way. They don't seem to understand and can't understand, but are not a bit ashamed. I drew Porphyry to the window and began talking to him, but it was still no use. He looked away, and I looked away. At last I shook my fist in his ugly face and told him as a cousin I'd brain him. He merely looked at me, I cursed and came away. That was all. It was very stupid. To Zaimtov I didn't say a word. But, you see, I thought I'd made a mess of it, but as I went downstairs a brilliant idea struck me, why should we trouble? Of course if you were in any danger or anything, but why need you care? You needn't care a hang for them. We shall have a laugh at them afterwards, and if I were in your place I'd mystify them more than ever. How ashamed they'll be afterwards. Hang them. We can thrash them afterwards, but let's laugh at them now. To be sure, answered Raskolnikov. But what will you say tomorrow, he thought to himself. Strange to say, till that moment it had never occurred to him to wonder what Razumihin would think when he knew. As he thought it, Raskolnikov looked at him. Razumihin's account of his visit to Porphyry had very little interest for him, so much had come and gone since then. In the corridor, they came upon Lizin, he had arrived punctually at eight, and was looking for the number, so that all three went in together without greeting or looking at one another. The young men walked in first, while Pyotr Petrovich, for good manners, lingered a little in the passage, taking off his coat. 
Pulcheria Alexandrovna came forward at once to greet him in the doorway, Dunia was welcoming her brother. Pyotr Petrovich walked in and quite amiably, though with redoubled dignity, bowed to the ladies. He looked, however, as though he were a little put out and could not yet recover himself. Pulcheria Alexandrovna, who seemed also a little embarrassed, hastened to make them all sit down at the round table where a samovar was boiling. Dunia and Luzin were facing one another on opposite sides of the table. Razumihin and Raskolnikov were facing Pulcheria Alexandrovna, Razumihin was next to Luzin and Raskolnikov was beside his sister. A moment's silence followed. Pyotr Petrovich deliberately drew out a cambric handkerchief reeking of scent and blew his nose with an air of a benevolent man who felt himself slighted and was firmly resolved to insist on an explanation. In the passage, the idea had occurred to him to keep on his overcoat and walk away, and so give the two ladies a sharp and emphatic lesson and make them feel the gravity of the position. But he could not bring himself to do this. Besides, he could not endure uncertainty, and he wanted an explanation, if his request had been so openly disobeyed, there was something behind it, and in that case it was better to find it out beforehand, it rested with him to punish them and there would always be time for that. I trust you had a favorable journey, he inquired officially, of Pulcheria Alexandrovna. Oh, very, Pyotr Petrovich. I am gratified to hear it. And Avdosha Romanovna is not over-fatigued either? I am young and strong, I don't get tired, but it was a great strain for mother, answered Dunia. That's unavoidable. Our national railways are of terrible length. Mother Russia, as they say, is a vast country. In spite of all my desire to do so, I was unable to meet you yesterday. But I trust all passed off without inconvenience? Oh, no, Pyotr Petrovich, it was all terribly disheartening, Pulcheria Alexandrovna hastened to declare with peculiar intonation, and if Dmitri Prokofitch had not been sent us, I really believe by God himself, we should have been utterly lost. Here, he is. Dmitri Prokofitch Razumihin, she added, introducing him to Luzin. I had the pleasure, yesterday, muttered Pyotr Petrovich with a hostile glance sidelong at Razumihin, then he scowled and was silent. Pyotr Petrovich belonged to that class of persons, on the surface very polite in society, who make a great point of punctiliousness, but who, directly they are crossed in anything, are completely disconcerted, and become more like sacks of flour than elegant and lively men of society. Again all was silent, Raskolnikov was obstinately mute, Abdosha Romanovna was unwilling to open the conversation too soon. Razumihin had nothing to say, so Pulcheria Alexandrovna was anxious again. Marfa Petrovna is dead, have you heard? She began having recourse to her leading item of conversation. To be sure, I heard so. I was immediately informed, and I have come to make you acquainted with the fact that Arkady Ivanovich Svitergalev set off. In haste for Petersburg immediately after his wife's funeral. So at least I have excellent authority for believing. To Petersburg? Here? Dunia asked in alarm and looked at her mother. Yes, indeed, and doubtless not without some design, having in view the rapidity of his departure, and all the circumstances preceding it. Good heavens! Won't he leave Dunia in peace even here? cried Pulcheria Alexandrovna. I imagine that neither you nor Dosha Romanovna have any grounds for uneasiness, unless, of course, you are yourselves desirous of getting into communication with him. For my part one am on my guard, and am now discovering where he is lodging. Oh, Pyotr Petrovich, you would not believe what a fright you have given me, Pulcheria Alexandrovna went on, I've only seen him twice, but I thought him terrible, terrible. I am convinced that he was the cause of Marfa Petrovna's death. It's impossible to be certain about that. I have precise information. I do not dispute that he may have contributed to accelerate the course of events by the moral influence, so to say, of the affront, but as to the general conduct and moral characteristics of that personage, I am in agreement with you. I do not know whether he is well off now, 
and precisely what Marfa Petrovna left him, this will be known to me within a very short period, but no doubt here in Petersburg, if he has any pecuniary resources, he will relapse at once into his old ways. He is the most depraved and abjectly vicious specimen of that class of men. I have considerable reason to believe that Marfa Petrovna, who was so unfortunate as to fall in love with him and to pay his debts eight years ago, was of service to him also in another way. Solely by her exertions and sacrifices, a criminal charge, involving an element of fantastic and homicidal brutality for which he might well have been sentenced to Siberia, was hushed up. That's the sort of man he is, if you care to know. Good heavens, cried Polcheria Alexandrovna. Raskolnikov listened attentively. Are you speaking the truth when you say that you have good evidence of this? Dunia asked sternly and emphatically. I only repeat what I was told in secret by Marfa Petrovna. I must observe that from the legal point of view the case was far from clear. There was, and I believe still is, living here a woman called Reslich, a foreigner, who lent small sums of money at interest, and did other commissions, and with this woman. Svidrigailov had for a long while close and mysterious relations. She had a relation, a niece I believe, living with her, a deaf and dumb girl of fifteen, or perhaps not more than fourteen. Reslich hated this girl, and grudged her every crust, she used to beat her mercilessly. One day the girl was found hanging in the garret. At the inquest the verdict was suicide. After the usual proceedings the matter ended, but, later on, information was given that the child had been cruelly outraged by Svindergalov. It is true, this was not clearly established, the information was given by another German woman of loose character whose word could not be trusted, no statement was actually made to the police, thanks to Marfa Petrovna's money and exertions, it did not get beyond gossip. And yet the story is a very significant one. You heard, no doubt, Abdosha Romanovna, when you were with them the story of the servant Philip who died of ill-treatment he received six years ago, before the abolition of serfdom. I heard, on the contrary, that this Philip hanged himself. Quite so, but what drove him, or rather perhaps disposed him, to suicide was the systematic persecution and severity of Mr. Svidrigailov. I don't know that, answered Dunia, dryly. I only heard a queer story that Philip was a sort of hypochondriac, a sort of domestic philosopher, the servants used to say, he read himself silly, and that he hanged himself partly on account of Mr. Svidrigailov's mockery of him and not his blows. When I was there he behaved well to the servants, and they were actually fond of him, though they certainly did blame him for Philip's death. I perceive, Adosha Romanovna, that you seem disposed to undertake his defense all of a sudden, Lizan observed, twisting his lips into an ambiguous smile, there's no doubt that he is an astute man, and insinuating where ladies are concerned, of which Marfa Petrovna, who has died so strangely, is a terrible instance. My only desire has been to be of service to you and your mother with my advice, in view of the renewed efforts, which may certainly be anticipated from him. For my part, it's my firm conviction that he will end in a debtor's prison again. Marfa Petrovna had not the slightest intention of settling anything substantial on him, having regard for his children's interests, and, if she left him anything, it would only be the merest sufficiency, something insignificant and ephemeral, which would not last a year for a man of his habits. Pyotr Petrovich, I beg you, said Dunia, say no more of Mr. Svidrigailov. It makes me miserable. He has just been to see me, said Raskolnikov, breaking his silence for the first time. There were exclamations from all, and they all turned to him. Even Pyotr Petrovich was roused. An hour and a half ago, he came in when I was asleep, waked me, and introduced himself, Raskolnikov continued. He was fairly cheerful and at ease, and quite hopes that we shall become friends. He is particularly anxious, by the way, Dunia, for an interview with you, at which he asked me to assist. He has a proposition to make to you, and he told me about it. He told me, too, that a week before her death Marfa Petrovna left you 3,000 rubles in her will, Dunia, and that you can receive the money very shortly. Thank God, cried Polcheria Alexandrovna, crossing herself. 
pray for her soul, Dunia. It's a fact, broke from Luzin. Tell us, what more? Dunia urged Raskolnikov. Then he said that he wasn't rich and all the estate was left to his children who are now with an aunt, then that he was staying somewhere not far from me, but where, I don't know, I didn't ask. But what, what does he want to propose to Dunia, cried Pulcheria Alexandrovna in a fright. Did he tell you? Yes. What was it? I'll tell you afterwards. Raskolnikov ceased speaking and turned his attention to his tea. Pyotr Petrovich looked at his watch. I am compelled to keep a business engagement, and so I shall not be in your way, he added with an air of some pique, and he began getting up. Don't go, Pyotr Petrovich, said Dunia, you intended to spend the evening. Besides, you wrote yourself that you wanted to have an explanation with mother. Precisely so, Abdosha Romanovna, Pyotr Petrovich answered impressively, sitting down again, but still holding his hat. I certainly desired an explanation with you and your honored mother upon a very important point indeed. But as your brother cannot speak openly in my presence of some proposals of Mr. Svidrigailov, I, too, do not desire and am not able to speak. Openly, in the presence of others, of certain matters of the greatest gravity. Moreover, my most weighty and urgent request has been disregarded. Assuming an agreed air, Luzin relapsed into dignified silence. Your request that my brother should not be present at our meeting was disregarded solely at my insistence, said Dunia. You wrote that you had been insulted by my brother, I think that this must be explained at once, and you must be reconciled. And if Rodia really has insulted you, then he should and will apologize. Pyotr Petrovich took a stronger line. There are insults, Adosha Romanovna, which no goodwill can make us forget. There is a line in everything which it is dangerous to overstep, and when it has been overstepped, there is no return. That wasn't what I was speaking of exactly, Pyotr Petrovich, Dunia interrupted with some impatience. Please understand that our whole future depends now on whether all this is explained and set right as soon as possible. I tell you frankly at the start that I cannot look at it in any other light, and if you have the least regard for me, all this business must be ended today, however hard that may be. I repeat that if my brother is to blame he will ask your forgiveness. I am surprised at your putting the question like that, said Lizin, getting more and more irritated. Esteeming, and so to say, adoring you, I may at the same time, very well indeed, be able to dislike some member of your family. Though I lay claim to the happiness of your hand, I cannot accept duties incompatible with. Ah, don't be so ready to take offense, Pyotr Petrovich, Dunia interrupted with feeling, and be the sensible and generous man I have always considered, and wished to consider, you to be. I've given you a great promise, I am your betrothed. Trust me in this matter, and, believe me, I shall be capable of judging impartially. My assuming the part of judge is as much a surprise for my brother as for you. When I insisted on his coming to our interview today after your letter, I told him nothing of what I meant to do. Understand that, if you are not reconciled, I must choose between you, it must be either you or he. That is how the question rests on your side and on his. I don't want to be mistaken in my choice, and I must not be. For your sake I must break off with my brother, for my brother's sake I must break off with you. I can find out for certain now whether he is a brother to me, and I want to know it, and of you. Whether I am dear to you, whether you esteem me, whether you are the husband for me. Abdosha Romanovna, Luzin declared huffily, your words are of too much consequence to me, I will say more, they are offensive in view of the position I have the honor to occupy in relation to you. To say nothing of your strange and offensive setting me on a level with an impertinent boy, you admit the possibility of breaking your promise to me. You say you or he, showing thereby of how little consequence I am in your eyes. I cannot let this pass, considering the relationship and the obligations existing between us. What? cried Dunia, flushing. I set your interest beside all that has hitherto been most precious in my life 
what has made up the whole of my life, and here you are offended at my making too little account of you. Raskolnikov smiled sarcastically, Razumihin fidgeted, but Pyotr Petrovich did not accept the reproof, on the contrary, at every word he became more persistent and irritable, as though he relished it. Love for the future partner of your life, for your husband, ought to outweigh your love for your brother, he pronounced sententiously, and in any case I cannot be put on the same level. Although I said so emphatically that I would not speak openly in your brother's presence, nevertheless, I intend now to ask your honored mother for a necessary explanation on a point of great importance closely affecting my dignity. Your son, he turned to Pulcheria Alexandrovna, yesterday, in the presence of Mr. Razutkin, or... I think that's it? Excuse me, I have forgotten your surname, he bowed politely to Razumihin, insulted me by misrepresenting the idea I expressed to you in a private conversation, drinking coffee, that is, that marriage with a poor girl who has had experience of trouble is more advantageous from the conjugal point of view than with one who has lived in luxury, since it is more profitable for the moral character. Your son intentionally exaggerated the significance of my words and made them ridiculous, accusing me of malicious intentions, and, as far as I could see, relied upon your correspondence with him. I shall consider myself happy, Pulcheria Alexandrovna, if it is possible for you to convince me of an opposite conclusion, and thereby considerately reassure me. Kindly let me know in what terms precisely you repeated my words in your letter to Radion Romanovich. I don't remember, faltered Pulcheria Alexandrovna. I repeated them as I understood them. I don't know how Rodia repeated them to you, perhaps he exaggerated. He could not have exaggerated them, except at your instigation. Pyotr Petrovich, Pulcheria Alexandrovna declared with dignity, the proof that Dunya and I did not take your words in a very bad sense is the fact that we are here. Good, mother, said Dunya approvingly. Then this is my fault again, said Lizin, aggrieved. Well, Pyotr Petrovich, you keep blaming Radion, but you yourself have just written what was false about him, Pulcheria Alexandrovna added, gaining courage. I don't remember writing anything false. You wrote, Raskolnikov said sharply, not turning to Lizin, that I gave money yesterday not to the widow of the man who was killed as was the fact, but to his daughter, whom I had never seen till yesterday. You wrote this to make dissension between me and my family, and for that object added coarse expressions about the conduct of a girl whom you don't know. All that is mean slander. Excuse me, sir, said Lizin, quivering with fury. I enlarged upon your qualities and conduct in my letter solely in response to your sister's and mother's inquiries how I found you, and what impression you made on me. As for what you've alluded to in my letter, be so good as to point out one word of falsehood, show, that is, that you didn't throw away your money, and that there are not worthless persons in that family, however unfortunate. To my thinking, you, with all your virtues, are not worth the little finger of that unfortunate girl at whom you throw stones. Would you go so far then as to let her associate with your mother and sister? I have done so already, if you care to know. I made her sit down today with mother and Dunia. Rodia, cried Pulcheria Alexandrovna. Dunia crimsoned, Razumihin knitted his brows. Luzin smiled with lofty sarcasm. You may see for yourself, Avdosha Romanovna, he said, whether it is possible for us to agree. I hope now that this question is at an end, once and for all. I will withdraw, that I may not hinder the pleasures of family intimacy, and the discussion of secrets. He got up from his chair and took his hat. But in withdrawing, I venture to request that for the future I may be spared similar meetings, and, so to say, compromises. I appeal particularly to you, honored Pulcheria Alexandrovna, on this subject, the more as my letter was addressed to you and to no one else. Pulcheria Alexandrovna was a little offended. You seem to think we are completely under your authority, Pyotr Petrovich. Dunia has told you the reason your desire was disregarded, she had the best intentions. And indeed you write as though you were laying commands upon me. Are we to consider every desire of yours as a command? 
let me tell you on the contrary that you ought to show particular delicacy and consideration for us now, because we have thrown up everything, and have come here relying on you, and so we are in any case in a sense in your hands. That is not quite true, Pulcheria Alexandrovna, especially at the present moment, when the news has come of Marfa Petrovna's legacy, which seems indeed very apropos, judging from the new tone you take to me, he added sarcastically. Judging from that remark, we may certainly presume that you were reckoning on our helplessness, Dunia observed irritably. But now in any case I cannot reckon on it, and I particularly desire not to hinder your discussion of the secret proposals of Arkady Ivanovich Svidrigailov, which he has entrusted to your brother and which have, I perceive, a great and possibly a very agreeable interest for you. Good heavens, cried Pulcheria Alexandrovna. Razumihin could not sit still on his chair. Aren't you ashamed now, sister? asked Raskolnikov. I am ashamed, Rodia, said Dunia. Pyotr Petrovich, go away, she turned to him, white with anger. Pyotr Petrovich had apparently not at all expected such a conclusion. He had too much confidence in himself, in his power, and in the helplessness of his victims. He could not believe it even now. He turned pale, and his lips quivered. Avdosha Romanovna, if I go out of this door now, after such a dismissal, then, you may reckon on it, I will never come back. Consider what you are doing. My word is not to be shaken. What insolence, cried Dunia, springing up from her seat. I don't want you to come back again. What? So that's how it stands, cried Lizin, utterly unable to the last moment to believe in the rupture and so completely thrown out of his reckoning now. So that's how it stands. But do you know, Abdosha Romanovna, that I might protest? What right have you to speak to her like that? Pulcheria Alexandrovna intervened hotly. And what can you protest about? What rights have you? Am I to give my dunya to a man like you? Go away, leave us all together. We are to blame for having agreed to a wrong action, and I above all. But you have bound me, Pulcheria Alexandrovna, Lizin stormed in a frenzy, by your promise, and now you deny it, and, besides, I have been led on account of that into expenses. This last complaint was so characteristic of Pyotr Petrovich that Raskolnikov, pale with anger and with the effort of restraining it, could not help breaking into laughter. But Pulcheria Alexandrovna was furious. Expenses? What expenses? Are you speaking of our trunk? But the conductor brought it for nothing for you. Mercy on us, we have bound you. What are you thinking about, Pyotr Petrovich? It was you bound us, hand and foot, not we. Enough, mother, no more please, Avdosha Romanovna implored. Pyotr Petrovich, do be kind and go. I am going, but one last word, he said, quite unable to control himself. Your mama seems to have entirely forgotten that I made up my mind to take you, so to speak, after the gossip of the town had spread all over the district in regard to your reputation. Disregarding public opinion for your sake and reinstating your reputation, I certainly might very well reckon on a fitting return, and might indeed look for gratitude on your part. And my eyes have only now been opened. I see myself that I may have acted very, very recklessly in disregarding the universal verdict. Does the fellow want his head smashed? cried Razumihin, jumping up. You are a mean and spiteful man, cried Dunia. Not a word. Not a movement, cried Raskolnikov, holding Razumihin back, then going close up to Luzin, kindly leave the room, he said quietly and distinctly, and not a word more or... Pyotr Petrovich gazed at him for some seconds with a pale face that worked with anger, then he turned, went out, and rarely has any man carried away in his heart such vindictive hatred as he felt against Raskolnikov. Him and him alone, he blamed for everything. It is noteworthy that as he went downstairs he still imagined that his case was perhaps not utterly lost, and that, so far as the ladies were concerned, all might very well indeed be set right again. 
The fact was that up to the last moment he had never expected such an ending, he had been overbearing to the last degree, never dreaming that two destitute and defenseless women could escape from his control. This conviction was strengthened by his vanity and conceit, a conceit to the point of fatuity. Pyotr Petrovich, who had made his way up from insignificance, was morbidly given to self-admiration, had the highest opinion of his intelligence and capacities, and sometimes even gloated in solitude over his image in the glass. But what he loved and valued above all was the money he had amassed by his labor, and by all sorts of devices, that money made him the equal of all who had been his superiors. When he had bitterly reminded Dunyat that he had decided to take her in spite of evil report, Pyotr Petrovich had spoken with perfect sincerity and had, indeed, felt genuinely indignant at such black ingratitude. And yet, when he made Dunya his offer, he was fully aware of the groundlessness of all the gossip. The story had been everywhere contradicted by Marfa Petrovna, and was by then disbelieved by all the townspeople, who were warm in Dunya a defense. And he would not have denied that he knew all that at the time. Yet he still thought highly of his own resolution in lifting Dunya to his level and regarded it as something heroic. In speaking of it to Dunya, he had let up the secret feeling he cherished and admired, and he could not understand that others should fail to admire it too. He had called on Raskolnikov with the feelings of a benefactor who was about to reap the fruits of his good deeds and to hear agreeable flattery. And as he went downstairs now, he considered himself most undeservedly injured and unrecognized. Dunia was simply essential to him, to do without her was unthinkable. For many years he had had voluptuous dreams of marriage, but he had gone on waiting and amassing money. He brooded with relish, in profound secret, over the image of a girl, virtuous, poor, she must be poor, very young, very pretty, of good birth and education, very timid, one who had suffered much, and was completely humbled before him, one who would all her life look on him as her savior, worship him, admire him and only him. How many scenes, how many amorous episodes he had imagined on this seductive and playful theme, when his work was over. And, behold, the dream of so many years was all but realized, the beauty and education of Abdosha Romanovna had impressed him, her helpless position had been a great allurement, in her he had found even more than he dreamed of. Here was a girl of pride, character, virtue, of education and breeding superior to his own, he felt that, and this creature would be slavishly grateful all her life for his heroic condescension, and would humble herself in the dust before him, and he would have absolute, unbounded power over her. Not long before, he had, too, after long reflection and hesitation, made an important change in his career and was now entering on a wider circle of business. With this change his cherished dreams of rising into a higher class of society seemed likely to be realized. He was, in fact, determined to try his fortune in Petersburg. He knew that women could do a very great deal. The fascination of a charming, virtuous, highly educated woman might make his way easier, might do wonders in attracting people to him, throwing an aureole round him, and now everything was in ruins. This sudden horrible rupture affected him like a clap of thunder, it was like a hideous joke, an absurdity. He had only been a tiny bit masterful, had not even time to speak out, had simply made a joke, been carried away, and it had ended so seriously. And, of course, too, he did love Dunya in his own way, he already possessed her in his dreams, and all at once. No! The next day, the very next day, it must all be set right, smoothed over, settled. Above all, he must crush that conceited milksop who was the cause of it all. With a sick feeling he could not help recalling Razumihin too, but, he soon reassured himself on that score as though a fellow like that could be put on a level with him. The man he really dreaded in earnest was Svidrigailov. He had, in short, a great deal to attend to. No, I, I am more to blame than anyone, said Dunya, kissing and embracing her mother. I was tempted by his money, but on my honor, brother, I had no idea he was such a base man. If I had seen through him before, nothing would have tempted me. Don't blame me, brother. God has delivered us. God has delivered us.
Pulcheria Alexandrovna muttered, but half-consciously, as though scarcely able to realize what had happened. They were all relieved, and in five minutes they were laughing. Only now and then Dunia turned white and frowned, remembering what had passed. Pulcheria Alexandrovna was surprised to find that she, too, was glad she had. Only that morning thought rupture with Luzin a terrible misfortune. Razumihin was delighted. He did not yet dare to express his joy fully, but he was in a fever of excitement as though a ton weight had fallen off his heart. Now he had the right to devote his life to them, to serve them. Anything might happen now. But he felt afraid to think of further possibilities and dared not let his imagination range. But Raskolnikov sat still in the same place, almost sullen and indifferent. Though he had been the most insistent on getting rid of Luzin, he seemed now the least concerned at what had happened. Dunia could not help thinking that he was still angry with her, and Polcheria Alexandrovna watched him timidly. What did Svidrigailov say to you? said Dunia, approaching him. Yes, yes, cried Polcheria Alexandrovna. Raskolnikov raised his head. He wants to make you a present of 10,000 rubles, and he desires to see you once in my presence. See her. On no account, cried Polcheria Alexandrovna. And how dare he offer her money? Then Raskolnikov repeated, rather dryly, his conversation with Svidrigailov, omitting his account of the ghostly visitations of Marfa Petrovna, wishing to avoid all unnecessary talk. What answer did you give him? asked Dunia. At first I said I would not take any message to you. Then he said that he would do his utmost to obtain an interview with you without my help. He assured me that his passion for you was a passing infatuation, now he has no feeling for you. He doesn't want you to marry Luzin. His talk was altogether rather muddled. How do you explain him to yourself, Rodia? How did he strike you? I must confess I don't quite understand him. He offers you ten thousand, and yet says he is not well off. He says he is going away, and in ten minutes he forgets he has said it. Then he says he is going to be married and has already fixed on the girl. No doubt he has a motive, and probably a bad one. But it's odd that he should be so clumsy about it if he had any designs against you. Of course, I refuse this money on your account, once for all. Altogether, I thought him very strange. One might almost think he was mad. But I may be mistaken, that may only be the part he assumes. The death of Marfa Petrovna seems to have made a great impression on him. God rest her soul, exclaimed Pulcheria Alexandrovna. I shall always, always pray for her. Where should we be now, Dunia, without this three thousand? It's as though it had fallen from heaven. Why, Rodia, this morning we had only three rubles in our pocket and Dunia and I were just planning to pawn her watch, so as to avoid borrowing from that man until he offered help. Dunia seemed strangely impressed by Svidrigailov's offer. She still stood meditating. He has got some terrible plan, she said in a half-whisper to herself, almost shuddering. Raskolnikov noticed this disproportionate terror. I fancy I shall have to see him more than once again, he said to Dunia. We will watch him. I will track him out, cried Razumihin, vigorously. I won't lose sight of him. Rodia has given me leave. He said to me himself just now. Take care of my sister. Will you give me leave, too, Abdosha Romanovna? Dunia smiled and held out her hand, but the look of anxiety did not leave her face. Pulcheria Alexandrovna gazed at her timidly, but the three thousand rubles had obviously a soothing effect on her. A quarter of an hour later, they were all engaged in a lively conversation. Even Raskolnikov listened attentively for some time, though he did not talk. Razumihin was the speaker. And why, why should you go away? He flowed on ecstatically. And what are you to do in a little town? 
The great thing is, you are all here together and you need one another, you do need one another, believe me. For a time, anyway. Take me into partnership, and I assure you will plan a capital enterprise. Listen. I'll explain it all in detail to you, the whole project. It all flashed into my head this morning, before anything had happened. I tell you what, I have an uncle, I must introduce him to you, a most accommodating and respectable old man. This uncle has got a capital of a thousand rubles, and he lives on his pension and has no need of that money. For the last two years he has been bothering me to borrow it from him and pay him 6% interest. I know what that means, he simply wants to help me. Last year I had no need of it, but this year I resolved to borrow it as soon as he arrived. Then you lend me another thousand of your three and we have enough for a start, so we'll go into partnership, and what are we going to do? Then Razumahin began to unfold his project, and he explained at length that almost all our publishers and booksellers know nothing at all of what they are selling and for that reason they are usually bad publishers, and that any decent publications pay as a rule and give a profit, sometimes a considerable one. Razumihin had, indeed, been dreaming of setting up as a publisher. For the last two years he had been working in publishers' offices, and knew three European languages well, though he had told Raskolnikov six days before that he was Schwach in German with an object of persuading him to take half his translation and half the payment for it. He had told a lie then, and Raskolnikov knew he was lying. Why, why should we let our chance slip when we have one of the chief means of success, money of our own, cried Razumihin warmly. Of course there will be a lot of work, but we will work, you, Avdosha Romanovna, I, Radayan. You get a splendid profit on some books nowadays. And the great point of the business is that we shall know just what wants translating and we shall be translating, publishing, learning all at once. I can be of use because I have experience. For nearly two years I've been scuttling about among the publishers, and now I know every detail of their business. You need not be a saint to make pots, believe me. And why, why should we let our chance slip? Why, I know, and I kept the secret, two or three books which one might get a hundred rubles simply for thinking of translating and publishing. Indeed, and I would not take five hundred for the very idea of one of them. And what do you think? If I were to tell a publisher, I dare say he'd hesitate, they are such blockheads. And as for the business side, printing, paper, selling, you trust to me, I know my way about. We'll begin in a small way and go on to a large. In any case, it will get us our living and we shall get back our capital. Dunia's eyes shone. I like what you are saying, Dmitri Prokofitch, she said. I know nothing about it, of course, put in Pulcheria Alexandrovna, it may be a good idea, but again God knows. It's new and untried. Of course, we must remain here at least for a time. She looked at Rodia. What do you think, brother? said Dunia. I think he's got a very good idea, he answered. Of course, it's too soon to dream of a publishing firm, but we certainly might bring out five or six books and be sure of success. I know of one book myself, which would be sure to go well. And as for his being able to manage it, there's no doubt about that either. He knows the business. But we can talk it over later. Hurrah, cried Razumihin. Now, stay, there's a flat here in this house, belonging to the same owner. It's a special flat apart, not communicating with these lodgings. It's furnished, rent moderate, three rooms. Suppose you take them to begin with. I'll pawn your watch tomorrow and bring you the money, and everything can be arranged then. You can all three live together, and Rodia will be with you. But where are you off to, Rodia? What, Rodia, you are going already? Pulcheria Alexandrovna asked in dismay. At such a minute, cried Razumihin. Dunia looked at her brother with incredulous wonder. He held his cap in his hand, he was preparing to leave them. 
One would think you were burying me or saying goodbye forever, he said somewhat oddly. He attempted to smile, but it did not turn out a smile. But who knows, perhaps it is the last time we shall see each other, he let slip accidentally. It was what he was thinking, and it somehow was uttered aloud. What is the matter with you? cried his mother. Where are you going, Rodia? asked Dunia rather strangely. Oh, I'm quite obliged to, he answered vaguely, as though hesitating what he would say. But there was a look of sharp determination in his white face. I meant to say, as I was coming here. I meant to tell you, mother, and you, Dunia, that it would be better for us to part for a time. I feel ill, I am not at peace. I will come afterwards, I will come of myself, when it's possible. I remember you and love you. Leave me, leave me alone. I decided this even before. I'm absolutely resolved on it. Whatever may come to me, whether I come to ruin or not, I want to be alone. Forget me altogether, it's better. Don't inquire about me. When I can, I'll come of myself or... I'll send for you. Perhaps it will all come back, but now if you love me, give me up, else I shall begin to hate you, I feel it. Goodbye. Good God, cried Pulcheria Alexandrovna. Both his mother and his sister were terribly alarmed. Razumihin was also. Rodia, Rodia, be reconciled with us. Let us be as before, cried his poor mother. He turned slowly to the door and slowly went out of the room. Dunia overtook him. Brother, what are you doing to mother? She whispered, her eyes flashing with indignation. He looked dully at her. No matter, I shall come. I'm coming, he muttered in an undertone, as though not fully conscious of what he was saying, and he went out of the room. Wicked, heartless egoist, cried Dunia. He is insane, but not heartless. He is mad. Don't you see it? You're heartless after that. Razumihin whispered in her ear, squeezing her hand tightly. I shall be back directly, he shouted to the horror-stricken mother, and he ran out of the room. Raskolnikov was waiting for him at the end of the passage. I knew you would run after me, he said. Go back to them, be with them, be with them tomorrow, and always. I, perhaps I shall come, if I can. Goodbye. And without holding out his hand he walked away. But where are you going? What are you doing? What's the matter with you? How can you go on like this? Razumihin muttered, at his wit's end. Raskolnikov stopped once more. Once for all, never ask me about anything. I have nothing to tell you. Don't come to see me. Maybe I'll come here. Leave me, but don't leave them. Do you understand me? It was dark in the corridor, they were standing near the lamp. For a minute, they were looking at one another in silence. Razumihin remembered that minute all his life. Raskolnikov's burning and intent eyes grew more penetrating every moment, piercing into his soul, into his consciousness. Suddenly Razumihin started. Something strange, as it were, passed between them. Some idea, some hint, as it were, slipped, something awful, hideous, and suddenly understood on both sides. Razumihin turned pale. Do you understand now? said Raskolnikov, his face twitching nervously. Go back, go to them, he said suddenly, and turning quickly, he went out of the house. I will not attempt to describe how Razumihin went back to the ladies, how he soothed them, how he protested that Rodia needed rest in his illness, protested that Rodia was sure to come, that he would come every day, that he was very, very much upset, that he must not be irritated, that he, Razumihin, would watch over him, would get him a doctor, the best doctor, a consultation. In fact from that evening Razumihin took his place with them as a son and a brother. 
Raskolnikov went straight to the house on the canal bank where Sonia lived. It was an old greenhouse of three stories. He found the porter and obtained from him vague directions as to the whereabouts of Kapernaumov, the tailor. Having found in the corner of the courtyard the entrance to the dark and narrow staircase, he mounted to the second floor and came out into a gallery that ran round the whole second story over the yard. While he was wandering in the darkness, uncertain where to turn for Kapernaumov's door, a door opened three paces from him, he mechanically took hold of it. Who is there? A woman's voice asked uneasily. It's I, come to see you, answered Raskolnikov and he walked into the tiny entry. On a broken chair stood a candle in a battered copper candlestick. It's you! Good heavens, cried Sonia weakly, and she stood rooted to the spot. Which is your room? This way, and Raskolnikov, trying not to look at her, hastened in. A minute later Sonia, too, came in with the candle, set down the candlestick and, completely disconcerted, stood before him inexpressibly agitated and apparently frightened by his unexpected visit. The color rushed suddenly to her pale face and tears came into her eyes. She felt sick and ashamed and happy, too. Raskolnikov turned away quickly and sat on a chair by the table. He scanned the room in a rapid glance. It was a large but exceedingly low-pitched room, the only one led by the Kapernaumovs, to whose rooms a closed door led in the wall on the left. In the opposite side on the right-hand wall was another door, always kept locked. That led to the next flat, which formed a separate lodging. Sonia's room looked like a barn, it was a very irregular quadrangle, and this gave it a grotesque appearance. A wall with three windows looking out onto the canal ran aslant so that one corner formed a very acute angle, and it was difficult to see in it without very strong light. The other corner was disproportionately obtuse. There was scarcely any furniture in the big room, in the corner on the right was a bedstead, beside it, nearest the door, a chair. A plain, deal table covered by a blue cloth stood against the same wall, close to the door into the other. Flat. Two rush bottom chairs stood by the table. On the opposite wall, near the acute angle, stood a small plain wooden chest of drawers looking, as it were, lost in a desert. That was all there was in the room. The yellow, scratched and shabby wallpaper was black in the corners. It must have been damp and full of fumes in the winter. There was every sign of poverty, even the bedstead had no curtain. Sonia looked in silence at her visitor, who was so attentively and unceremoniously scrutinizing her room, and even began at last to tremble with terror, as though she was standing before her judge and the arbiter of her destinies. I am late. It's eleven, isn't it? he asked, still not lifting his eyes. Yes, muttered Sonia, oh yes, it is, she added, hastily, as though in that lay her means of escape. My landlady's clock has just struck. I heard it myself. I've come to you for the last time, Raskolnikov went on gloomily, although this was the first time. I may perhaps not see you again. Are you going away? I don't know, tomorrow. Then you are not coming to Katerina Ivanovna tomorrow? Sonia's voice shook. I don't know. I shall know tomorrow morning. Never mind that, I've come to say one word. He raised his brooding eyes to her and suddenly noticed that he was sitting down while she was all the while standing before him. Why are you standing? Sit down, he said in a changed voice, gentle and friendly. She sat down. He looked kindly and almost compassionately at her. How thin you are! What a hand! Quite transparent, like a dead hand. He took her hand. Sonia smiled faintly. I have always been like that, she said. Even when you lived at home? Yes. Of course, you were, he added abruptly, and the expression of his face and the sound of his voice changed again suddenly. He looked round him once more. You rent this room from the Kapernaumovs? 
Yes. They live there, through that door? Yes. They have another room like this. All in one room? Yes. I should be afraid in your room at night, he observed gloomily. They are very good people, very kind, answered Sonia, who still seemed bewildered, and all the furniture, everything, everything is theirs. And they are very kind, and the children, too, often come to see me. They all stammer, don't they? Yes. He stammers, and he's lame. And his wife, too. It's not exactly that she stammers, but she can't speak plainly. She is a very kind woman. And he used to be a house serf. And there are seven children, and it's only the eldest one that stammers, and the others are simply ill, but they don't stammer. But where did you hear about them? She added with some surprise. Your father told me, then. He told me all about you. And how you went out at six o'clock and came back at nine, and how Katerina Ivanovna knelt down by your bed. Sonia was confused. I fancied I saw him today, she whispered hesitatingly. Whom? Father. I was walking in the street, out there at the corner, about ten o'clock, and he seemed to be walking in front. It looked just like him. I wanted to go to Katerina Ivanovna. You were walking in the streets? Yes, Sonia whispered abruptly, again overcome with confusion and looking down. Katerina Ivanovna used to beat you, I dare say? Oh no, what are you saying? No. Sonia looked at him almost with dismay. You love her, then? Love her? Of course, said Sonia with plaintive emphasis, and she clasped her hands in distress. Ah, you don't. If you only knew. You see, she is quite like a child. Her mind is quite unhinged, you see, from sorrow. And how clever she used to be, how generous, how kind. Ah, you don't understand, you don't understand. Sonia said this as though in despair, wringing her hands in excitement and distress. Her pale cheeks flushed, there was a look of anguish in her eyes. It was clear that she was stirred to the very depths, that she was longing to speak, to champion, to express something. A sort of insatiable compassion, if one may so express it, was reflected in every feature of her face. Beat me! How can you? Good heavens, beat me! And if she did beat me, what then? What of it? You know nothing, nothing about it. She is so unhappy, ah, how unhappy! And ill. She is seeking righteousness, she is pure. She has such faith that there must be righteousness everywhere, and she expects it. And if you were to torture her, she wouldn't do wrong. She doesn't see that it's impossible for people to be righteous, and she is angry at it. Like a child, like a child. She is good. And what will happen to you? Sonia looked at him inquiringly. They are left on your hands, you see. They were all on your hands before, though. And your father came to you to beg for drink. Well, how will it be now? I don't know, Sonia articulated mournfully. Will they stay there? I don't know. They are in debt for the lodging, but the landlady, I hear, said today that she wanted to get rid of them and Katerina Ivanovna says that she won't stay another minute. How is it she is so bold? She relies upon you? Oh, no, don't talk like that. We are one, we live like one. Sonia was agitated again and even angry, as though a canary or some other little bird were to be angry. And what could she do? What, what could she do? She persisted, getting hot and excited. And how she cried today. Her mind is unhinged, haven't you noticed it? At one minute, she is worrying like a child that everything should be right tomorrow, the lunch and all that. 
Then she is wringing her hands, spitting blood, weeping, and all at once she will begin knocking her head against the wall, in despair. Then she will be comforted again. She builds all her hopes on you, she says that you will help her now, and that she will borrow a little money somewhere, and go to her native town with me, and set up a boarding school for the daughters of gentlemen, and take me to superintend it, and we will begin a new splendid life. And she kisses, and hugs me, comforts me, and you know she has such faith, such faith in her fancies. One can't contradict her. And all the day long she has been washing, cleaning, mending. She dragged the wash tub into the room with her feeble hands and sank on the bed, gasping for breath. We went this morning to the shops to buy shoes for Polenka and Lita for theirs are quite worn out. Only the money we'd reckoned wasn't enough, not nearly enough. And she picked out such dear little boots, for she has taste, you don't know. And there in the shop, she burst out crying before the shopman because she hadn't enough. Ah, it was sad to see her. Well, after that I can understand your living like this, Raskolnikov said with a bitter smile. And aren't you sorry for them? Aren't you sorry? Sonia flew at him again. Why, I know, you gave your last penny yourself, though you'd seen nothing of it, and if you'd seen everything, oh dear. And how often, how often I brought her to tears. Only last week. Yes, I. Only a week before his death. I was cruel. And how often I've done it. Ah, I've been wretched at the thought of it all day. Sonia wrung her hands as she spoke at the pain of remembering it. You were cruel? Yes, I, I. I went to see them, she went on, weeping, and father said, read me something, Sonia, my head aches, read to me, here's a book. He had a book he had got from Andrei Semyonovich Lebeziatnikov, he lives there, he always used to get hold of such funny books. And I said, I can't stay, as I didn't want to read, and I'd gone in chiefly to show Katerina Ivanovna some collars. Lizavita, the peddler, sold me some collars and cuffs, cheap, pretty, new, embroidered ones. Katerina Ivanovna liked them very much. She put them on and looked at herself in the glass and was delighted with them. Make me a present of them, Sonia, she said. Please do. Please do, she said. She wanted them so much. And when could she wear them? They just reminded her of her old happy days. She looked at herself in the glass, admired herself, and she has no clothes at all, no things of her own, hasn't had all these years. And she never asks anyone for anything, she is proud, she'd sooner give away everything. And these she asked for, she liked them so much. And I was sorry to give them. What use are they to you, Katerina Ivanovna? I said. I spoke like that to her. I ought not to have said that. She gave me such a look. And she was so grieved, so grieved at my refusing her. And it was so sad to see. And she was not grieved for the callers, but for my refusing, I saw that. Ah, if only I could bring it all back, change it, take back those words. Ah, if I, but it's nothing to you. Did you know Lizavita, the peddler? Yes. Did you know her? Sonia asked with some surprise. Katerina Ivanovna is in consumption, rapid consumption, she will soon die, said Raskolnikov after a pause, without answering her question. Oh, no, no, no. And Sonia unconsciously clutched both his hands, as though imploring that she should not. But it will be better if she does die. No, not better, not at all better. Sonia unconsciously repeated in dismay. And the children? What can you do except take them to live with you? Oh, I don't know, cried Sonia, almost in despair, and she put her hands to her head. It was evident that that idea had very often occurred to her before, and he had only roused it again. And, what, if even now, while Katerina Ivanovna is alive, you get ill and are taken to the hospital, 
What will happen then? He persisted pitilessly. How can you? That cannot be. And Sonia's face worked with awful terror. Cannot be? Raskolnikov went on with a harsh smile. You are not insured against it, are you? What will happen to them then? They will be in the street, all of them, she will cough and beg and knock her head against some wall, as she did today, and the children will cry. Then she will fall down, be taken to the police station and to the hospital, she will die, and the children. Oh, no! God will not let it be, broke at last from Sonia's overburdened bosom. She listened, looking imploringly at him, clasping her hands in dumb entreaty, as though it all depended upon him. Raskolnikov got up and began to walk about the room. A minute passed. Sonia was standing with her hands and her head hanging in terrible dejection. And can't you save? Put by for a rainy day? he asked, stopping suddenly before her. No, whispered Sonia. Of course not. Have you tried? he added almost ironically. Yes. And it didn't come off. Of course not. No need to ask. And again he paced the room. Another minute passed. You don't get money every day? Sonia was more confused than ever and color rushed into her face again. No, she whispered with a painful effort. It will be the same with Polenka, no doubt, he said suddenly. No, no. It can't be, no. Sonia cried aloud in desperation, as though she had been stabbed. God would not allow anything so awful. He lets others come to it. No, no. God will protect her, God, she repeated beside herself. But, perhaps, there is no God at all, Raskolnikov answered with a sort of malignance, laughed and looked at her. Sonia's face suddenly changed, a tremor passed over it. She looked at him with unutterable reproach, tried to say something, but could not speak and broke into bitter, bitter sobs, hiding her face in her hands. You say Katerina Ivanovna's mind is unhinged, your own mind is unhinged, he said after a brief silence. Five minutes passed. He still paced up and down the room in silence, not looking at her. At last he went up to her, his eyes glittered. He put his two hands on her shoulders and looked straight into her tearful face. His eyes were hard, feverish and piercing, his lips were twitching. All at once he bent down quickly and dropping to the ground, kissed her foot. Sonia drew back from him as from a madman. And certainly he looked like a madman. What are you doing to me? She muttered, turning pale, and a sudden anguish clutched at her heart. He stood up at once. I did not bow down to you, I bowed down to all the suffering of humanity, he said wildly and walked away to the window. Listen, he added, turning to her a minute later. I said just now to an insolent man that he was not worth your little finger, and that I did my sister honor making her sit beside you. ACH, you said that to them. And in her presence, cried Sonia, frightened. Sit down with me. An honor. Why, I'm dishonorable. Ah, uh, why did you say that? It was not because of your dishonor and your sin I said that of you, but because of your great suffering. But you are a great sinner, that's true, he added almost solemnly, and your worst sin is that you have destroyed and betrayed yourself for nothing. Isn't that fearful? Isn't it fearful that you are living in this filth, which you loathe so, and at the same time you know yourself? You've only to open your eyes, that you are not helping anyone by it, not saving anyone from anything? Tell me, he went on almost in a frenzy, how this shame and degradation can exist in you side by side with other, opposite, holy feelings? It would be better, a thousand times better and wiser to leap into the water and end it all. But what would become of them? Sonia asked faintly, gazing at him with eyes of anguish, 
but not seeming surprised at his suggestion. Raskolnikov looked strangely at her. He read it all on her face, so she must have had that thought already, perhaps many times, and earnestly she had thought out in her despair how to end it and so earnestly, that now she scarcely wondered at his suggestion. She had not even noticed the cruelty of his words. The significance of his reproaches and his peculiar attitude to her shame she had, of course, not noticed either, and that, too, was clear to him. But he saw how monstrously the thought of her disgraceful, shameful position was torturing her and had long tortured her. What, what, he thought, could hitherto have hindered her from putting an end to it? Only then he realized what those poor little orphan children and that pitiful half-crazy Katerina Ivanovna, knocking her head against the wall in her consumption, meant for Sonia. But, nevertheless, it was clear to him again that with her character and the amount of education she had after all received, she could not in any case remain so. He was still confronted by the question, how could she have remained so long in that position without going out of her mind, since she could not bring herself to jump into the water? Of course he knew that Sonia's position was an exceptional case, though unhappily not unique and not infrequent, indeed, but that very exceptionalness, her tinge of education, her previous life might, one would have thought, have killed her at the first step on that revolting path. What held her up, surely not depravity? All that infamy had obviously only touched her mechanically, not one drop of real depravity had penetrated to her heart, he saw that. He saw through her as she stood before him. There are three ways before her, he thought, the canal, the madhouse, or, at last, to sink into depravity, which obscures the mind and turns the heart to stone. The last idea was the most revolting, but he was a skeptic, he was young, abstract, and therefore cruel, and so he could not help believing that the last end was the most likely. But can that be true? he cried to himself. Can that creature who has still preserved the purity of her spirit be consciously drawn at last into that sink of filth and iniquity? Can the process already have begun? Can it be that she has only been able to bear it till now, because vice has begun to be less loathsome to her? No, no, that cannot be, he cried, as Sonia had just before. No, what has kept her from the canal till now is the idea of sin and they, the children. And if she has not gone out of her mind, but who says she has not gone out of her mind? Is she in her senses? Can one talk, can one reason as she does? How can she sit on the edge of the abyss of loathsomeness into which she is slipping and refuse to listen when she is told of danger? Does she expect a miracle? No doubt she does. Doesn't that all mean madness? He stayed obstinately at that thought. He liked that explanation indeed better than any other. He began looking more intently at her. So you pray to God a great deal, Sonia? he asked her. Sonia did not speak. He stood beside her waiting for an answer. What should I be without God? she whispered rapidly, forcibly, glancing at him with suddenly flashing eyes, and squeezing his hand. Ah, so that is it, he thought. And what does God do for you? he asked, probing her further. Sonia was silent a long while, as though she could not answer. Her weak chest kept heaving with emotion. Be silent. Don't ask. You don't deserve, she cried suddenly, looking sternly and wrathfully at him. That's it, that's it, he repeated to himself. He does everything, she whispered quickly, looking down again. That's the way out. That's the explanation, he decided, scrutinizing her with eager curiosity, with a new, strange, almost morbid feeling. He gazed at that pale, thin, irregular, angular little face, those soft blue eyes, which could flash with such fire, such stern energy, that little body still shaking with indignation and anger, and it all seemed to him more and more strange, almost impossible. She is a religious maniac, he repeated to himself. There was a book lying on the chest of drawers. He had noticed it every time he paced up and down the room. Now he took it up and looked at it. It was the New Testament in the Russian translation. 
It was bound in leather, old and worn. Where did you get that? He called to her across the room. She was still standing in the same place, three steps from the table. It was brought me, she answered, as it were unwillingly, not looking at him. Who brought it? Lizabita, I asked her for it. Lizabita. Strange, he thought. Everything about Sonia seemed to him stranger and more wonderful every moment. He carried the book to the candle and began to turn over the pages. Where is the story of Lazarus? he asked suddenly. Sonia looked obstinately at the ground and would not answer. She was standing sideways to the table. Where is the raising of Lazarus? Find it for me, Sonia. She stole a glance at him. You are not looking in the right place. It's in the fourth gospel, she whispered sternly, without looking at him. Find it and read it to me, he said. He sat down with his elbow on the table, leaned his head on his hand and looked away sullenly, prepared to listen. In three weeks' time, they'll welcome me in the madhouse. I shall be there if I am not in a worse place, he muttered to himself. Sonia heard Raskolnikov's request distrustfully and moved hesitatingly to the table. She took the book, however. Haven't you read it? she asked, looking up at him across the table. Her voice became sterner and sterner. Long ago. When I was at school. Read. And haven't you heard it in church? I haven't been. Do you often go? And no, whispered Sonia. Raskolnikov smiled. I understand. And you won't go to your father's funeral tomorrow? Yes, I shall. I was at church last week, too. I had a requiem service. For whom? For Lizabeta. She was killed with an axe. His nerves were more and more strained. His head began to go round. Were you friends with Lizavita? Yes. She was good. She used to come, not often. She couldn't. We used to read together and talk. She will see God. The last phrase sounded strange in his ears. And here was something new again, the mysterious meetings with Lizavita and both of them religious maniacs. I shall be a religious maniac myself soon. It's infectious. Read, he cried irritably and insistently. Sonia still hesitated. Her heart was throbbing. She hardly dared to read to him. He looked almost with exasperation at the unhappy lunatic. What for? You don't believe? She whispered softly and as it were breathlessly. Read. I want you to, he persisted. You used to read to Lizavita. Sonia opened the book and found the place. Her hands were shaking, her voice failed her. Twice she tried to begin and could not bring out the first syllable. Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany. She forced herself at last to read, but at the third word her voice broke like an overstrained string. There was a catch in her breath. Raskolnikov saw in part why Sonia could not bring herself to read to him and the more he saw this, the more roughly and irritably he insisted on her doing so. He understood only too well how painful it was for her to betray and unveil all that was her own. He understood that these feelings really were her secret treasure, which she had kept perhaps for years, perhaps from childhood, while she lived with an unhappy father and a distracted stepmother crazed by grief, in the midst of starving children and unseemly abuse and reproaches. But at the same time he knew now and knew for certain that, although it filled her with dread and suffering, yet she had a tormenting desire to read and to read to him that he might hear it, and to read now whatever might come of it. He read this in her eyes, he could see it in her intense emotion. She mastered herself, controlled the spasm in her throat and went on reading the eleventh chapter of St. John. She went on to the nineteenth verse. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. 
Then Martha as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming went and met him, but Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Then she stopped again with a shamefaced feeling that her voice would quiver and break again. Jesus said unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life, he that believeth in me though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him. And drawing a painful breath, Sonia read distinctly and forcibly as though she were making a public confession of faith. Yeah, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. She stopped and looked up quickly at him, but controlling herself went on reading. Raskolnikov sat without moving, his elbows on the table and his eyes turned away. She read to the thirty-second verse. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled, and said, Where have ye laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Raskolnikov turned and looked at her with emotion. Yes, he had known it. She was trembling in a real physical fever. He had expected it. She was getting near the story of the greatest miracle and a feeling of immense triumph came over her. Her voice rang out like a bell, triumph and joy gave it power. The lines danced before her eyes, but she knew what she was reading by heart. At the last verse could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind, dropping her voice she passionately reproduced the doubt, the reproach and censure of the blind disbelieving Jews, who in another moment would fall at his feet as though struck by thunder, sobbing and believing. And he, he, too, is blinded and unbelieving, he, too, will hear, he, too, will believe, yes, yes. At once, now, was what she was dreaming, and she was quivering with happy anticipation. Jesus therefore again groaning in himself cometh to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. She laid emphasis on the word for. Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth. She read loudly, cold and trembling with ecstasy, as though she were seeing it before her eyes. Bound hand and foot with great clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him and let him go. Then many of the Jews, which came to Mary, and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him. She could read no more, closed the book and got up from her chair quickly. That is all about the raising of Lazarus, she whispered severely and abruptly, and turning away she stood motionless, not daring to raise her eyes to him. She still trembled feverishly. The candle end was flickering out in the battered candlestick, dimly lighting up in the poverty-stricken room the murderer and the harlot who had so strangely been reading together the eternal book. Five minutes or more passed. I came to speak of something, Raskolnikov said aloud, frowning. He got up and went to Sonia. She lifted her eyes to him in silence. 
His face was particularly stern and there was a sort of savage determination in it. I have abandoned my family today, he said, my mother and sister. I am not going to see them. I've broken with them completely. What for? asked Sonia amazed. Her recent meeting with his mother and sister had left a great impression which she could not analyze. She heard his news almost with horror. I have only you now, he added. Let us go together. I've come to you, we are both accursed, let us go our way together. His eyes glittered as though he were mad, Sonia thought, in her turn. Go where? she asked in alarm and she involuntarily stepped back. How do I know? I only know it's the same road, I know that and nothing more. It's the same goal. She looked at him and understood nothing. She knew only that he was terribly, infinitely unhappy. No one of them will understand, if you tell them, but I have understood. I need you, that is why I have come to you. I don't understand, whispered Sonia. You'll understand later. Haven't you done the same? You, too, have transgressed, have had the strength to transgress. You have laid hands on yourself, you have destroyed a life, your own, it's all the same. You might have lived in spirit and understanding, but you'll end in the hay market. But you won't be able to stand it, and if you remain alone you'll go out of your mind like me. You are like a mad creature already. So we must go together on the same road. Let us go. What for? What's all this for? said Sonia, strangely and violently agitated by his words. What for? Because you can't remain like this, that's why. You must look things straight in the face at last, and not weep like a child and cry that God won't allow it. What will happen, if you should really be taken to the hospital tomorrow? She is mad and in consumption, she'll soon die and the children? Do you mean to tell me Palenka won't come to grief? Haven't you seen children here at the street corners sent out by their mothers to beg? I've found out where those mothers live and in what surroundings. Children can't remain children there. At seven, the child is vicious and a thief. Yet children, you know, are the image of Christ, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He bade us honor and love them, they are the humanity of the future. What's to be done, what's to be done, repeated Sonia, weeping hysterically and wringing her hands. What's to be done? Break what must be broken, once for all, that's all, and take the suffering on oneself. What, you don't understand? You'll understand later. Freedom and power, and above all, power. Over all trembling creation and all the ant heap. That's the goal, remember that. That's my farewell message. Perhaps it's the last time I shall speak to you. If I don't come tomorrow, you'll hear of it all, and then remember these words. And some day later on, in years to come, you'll understand perhaps what they meant. If I come tomorrow, I'll tell you who killed Lizavita. Goodbye. Sonia started with terror. Why, do you know who killed her? She asked, chilled with horror, looking wildly at him. I know and will tell, you, only you. I have chosen you out. I'm not coming to you to ask forgiveness, but simply to tell you. I chose you out long ago to hear this, when your father talked of you, and when Lizavita was alive, I thought of it. Goodbye, don't shake hands. Tomorrow. He went out. Sonia gazed at him as at a madman. But she herself was like one insane and felt it. Her head was going round. Good heavens, how does he know who killed Lizavita? What did those words mean? It's awful. But at the same time, the idea did not enter her head, not for a moment. Oh, he must be terribly unhappy. He has abandoned his mother and sister. What for? What has happened? 
And what had he in his mind? What did he say to her? He had kissed her foot and said, said, yes, he had said it clearly, that he could not live without her. Oh, merciful heavens! Sonia spent the whole night feverish and delirious. She jumped up from time to time, wept and wrung her hands, then sank again into feverish sleep and dreamt of Polenka, Katerina Ivanovna and Lizaveta, of reading the gospel and him, him with pale face, with burning eyes, kissing her feet, weeping. On the other side of the door on the right, which divided Sonia's room from Madame Reslich's flat, was a room which had long stood empty. A card was fixed on the gate and a notice stuck in the windows over the canal advertising it to let. Sonia had long been accustomed to the rooms being uninhabited. But all that time Mr. Svidrigailov had been standing, listening at the door of the empty room. When Raskolnikov went out he stood still, thought a moment. Went on tiptoe to his own room which adjoined the empty one, brought a chair and noiselessly carried it to the door that led to Sonia's room. The conversation had struck him as interesting and remarkable, and he had greatly enjoyed it, so much so that he brought a chair that he might not in the future, tomorrow, for instance, have to endure the inconvenience of standing a whole hour, but might listen in comfort. When next morning at eleven o'clock punctually Raskolnikov went into the Department of the Investigation of Criminal Causes and sent his name in to Porfiry Petrovich, he was surprised at being kept waiting so long, it was at least ten minutes before he was summoned. He had expected that they would pounce upon him. But he stood in the waiting room, and people, who apparently had nothing to do with him, were continually passing to and fro before him. In the next room, which looked like an office, several clerks were sitting writing, and obviously they had no notion who or what Raskolnikov might be. He looked uneasily and suspiciously about him to see whether there was not some guard, some mysterious watch being kept on him to prevent his escape. But there was nothing of the sort, he saw only the faces of clerks absorbed in petty details, then other people, no one seemed to have any concern with him. He might go where he liked for them. The conviction grew stronger in him that if that enigmatic man of yesterday, that phantom sprung out of the earth, had seen everything, they would not have let him stand and wait like that. And would they have waited till he elected to appear at eleven? Either the man had not yet given information, or, or simply he knew nothing, had seen nothing, and how could he have seen anything, and so all that had happened to him the day before was again a phantom exaggerated by his sick and overstrained imagination. This conjecture had begun to grow strong the day before, in the midst of all his alarm and despair. Thinking it all over now and preparing for a fresh conflict, he was suddenly aware that he was trembling, and he felt a rush of indignation at the thought that he was trembling with fear at facing that hateful Porfiry Petrovich. What he dreaded above all was meeting that man again, he hated him with an intense, unmitigated hatred and was afraid his hatred might betray him. His indignation was such that he ceased trembling at once, he made ready to go in with a cold and arrogant bearing and vowed to himself to keep as silent as possible, to watch and listen and for once at least to control his overstrained nerves. At that moment, he was summoned to Porfiry Petrovich. He found Porfiry Petrovich alone in his study. His study was a room neither large nor small, furnished with a large writing table that stood before a sofa, upholstered in checked material, a bureau, a bookcase in the corner and several chairs, all government furniture, a polished yellow wood. In the further wall there was a closed door, beyond it there were no doubt other rooms. On Raskolnikov's entrance Porfiry Petrovich had at once closed the door by which he had come in and they remained alone. He met his visitor with an apparently genial and good-tempered air, and it was only after a few minutes that Raskolnikov saw signs of a certain awkwardness in him, as though he had been thrown out of his reckoning or caught in something very secret. Ah, my dear fellow! Here you are, in our domain, began Porfiry, holding out both hands to him. Come, sit down, old man, or perhaps you don't like to be called my dear fellow and old man. Tout court? Please don't think it too familiar. Here, on the sofa. Raskolnikov sat down, keeping his eyes fixed on him. In our domain, the apologies for familiarity, the French phrase tout court, were all characteristic signs. 
He held out both hands to me, but he did not give me one, he drew it back in time, struck him suspiciously. Both were watching each other, but when their eyes met, quick as lightning they looked away. I brought you this paper, about the watch. Here it is. Is it all right, or shall I copy it again? What? A paper? Yes, yes, don't be uneasy, it's all right, Porfiry Petrovich said as though in haste, and after he had said it he took the paper and looked at it. Yes, it's all right. Nothing more is needed, he declared with the same rapidity, and he laid the paper on the table. A minute later when he was talking of something else he took it from the table and put it on his bureau. I believe you said yesterday you would like to question me, formally, about my acquaintance with the murdered woman? Raskolnikov was beginning again. Why did I put an I believe pass through his mind in a flash? Why am I so uneasy at having put in that I believe, came in a second flash? And he suddenly felt that his uneasiness at the mere contact with Porphyry, at the first words, at the first looks, had grown in an instant to monstrous proportions, and that this was fearfully dangerous. His nerves were quivering, his emotion was increasing. It's bad, it's bad. I shall say too much again. Yes, yes, yes. There's no hurry, there's no hurry, muttered Porfiry Petrovich, moving to and fro about the table without any apparent aim, as it were making dashes towards the window, the bureau, and the table, at one moment avoiding Raskolnikov's suspicious glance, then again standing still and looking him straight in the face. His fat round little figure looked very strange, like a ball rolling from one side to the other and rebounding back. We've plenty of time. Do you smoke? Have you your own? Here, a cigarette, he went on, offering his visitor a cigarette. You know I am receiving you here, but my own quarters are through there, you know, my government quarters. But I am living outside for the time, I had to have some repairs done here. It's almost finished now. Government quarters, you know, are a capital thing. Eh, what do you think? Yes, a capital thing, answered Raskolnikov, looking at him almost ironically. A capital thing, a capital thing, repeated Porfiry Petrovich, as though he had just thought of something quite different. Yes, a capital thing, he almost shouted at last, suddenly staring at Raskolnikov and stopping short two steps from him. This stupid repetition was too incongruous in its ineptitude with the serious, brooding and enigmatic glance he turned upon his visitor. But this stirred Raskolnikov's spleen more than ever and he could not resist an ironical and rather incautious challenge. Tell me, please, he asked suddenly, looking almost insolently at him and taking a kind of pleasure in his own insolence. I believe it's a sort of legal rule, a sort of legal tradition, for all investigating lawyers, to begin their attack from afar, with a trivial, or at least an irrelevant subject, so as to encourage, or rather, to divert the man they are cross-examining, to disarm his caution and then all at once to give him an unexpected knockdown blow with some fatal question. Isn't that so? It's a sacred tradition, mentioned, I fancy, in all the manuals of the art? Yes, yes. Why, do you imagine that was why I spoke about government quarters, eh? And as he said this Porfiry Petrovich screwed up his eyes and winked, a good-humored, crafty look passed over his face. The wrinkles on his forehead were smoothed out, his eyes contracted, his features broadened and he suddenly went off into a nervous prolonged laugh, shaking all over and looking Raskolnikov straight in the face. The latter forced himself to laugh, too, but when Porfiry, seeing that he was laughing, broke into such a guffaw that he turned almost crimson, Raskolnikov's repulsion overcame all. Precaution, he left off laughing, scowled and stared with hatred at Porfiry, keeping his eyes fixed on him while his intentionally prolonged laughter lasted. There was lack of precaution on both sides, however, for Porfiry Petrovich seemed to be laughing in his visitor's face and to be very little disturbed at the annoyance with which the visitor received it. The latter fact was very significant in Raskolnikov's eyes, he saw that Porfiry Petrovich had not been embarrassed just before either, 
but that he, Raskolnikov, had perhaps fallen into a trap, that there must be something, some motive here unknown to him, that, perhaps, everything was in readiness and in another moment would break upon him. He went straight to the point at once, rose from his seat, and took his cap. Porfiry Petrovitch, he began resolutely, though with considerable irritation, yesterday you expressed a desire that I should come to you for some inquiries, he laid special stress on the word inquiries. I have come and if you have anything to ask me, ask it, and if not, allow me to withdraw. I have no time to spare. I have to be at the funeral of that man who was run over, of whom you know also, he added, feeling angry at once at having made this addition and more irritated at his anger. I am sick of it all, do you hear? And have long been. It's partly what made me ill. In short, he shouted, feeling that the phrase about his illness was still more out of place, in short, kindly examine me or let me go, at once. And if you must examine me, do so in the proper form. I will not allow you to do so otherwise, and so meanwhile, goodbye, as we have evidently nothing to keep us now. Good heavens! What do you mean? What shall I question you about, cackled Porfiry Petrovitch, with a change of tone, instantly leaving off laughing. Please don't disturb yourself, he began fidgeting from place to place and fussily making Raskolnikov sit down. There's no hurry, there's no hurry, it's all nonsense. Oh, no, I'm very glad you've come to see me at last. I look upon you simply as a visitor. And as for my confounded laughter, please excuse it, Radion Romanovich. Radion Romanovich? That is your name? It's my nerves, you tickled me so with your witty observation, I assure you, sometimes I shake with laughter like an India rubber ball for half an hour at a time. I'm often afraid of an attack of paralysis. Do sit down. Please do, or I shall think you are angry. Raskolnikov did not speak, he listened, watching him, still frowning angrily. He did sit down, but still held his cap. I must tell you one thing about myself, my dear Radion Romanovich, Porfiry Petrovich continued, moving about the room and again avoiding his visitor's eyes. You see, I'm a bachelor, a man of no consequence and not used to society, besides, I have nothing before me, I'm set, I'm running to seat and, and have you noticed, Radion Romanovich, that in our Petersburg circles, if two clever men meet who are not intimate, but respect each other, like you and me, it takes them half an hour before they can find a subject for conversation, they are dumb, they sit opposite each other and feel awkward. Everyone has subjects of conversation, ladies for instance. People in high society always have their subjects of conversation, say de rigueur, but people of the middle sort like us, thinking people that is, are always tongue-tied and awkward. What is the reason of it? Whether it is the lack of public interest, or whether it is we are so honest, we don't want to deceive one another, I don't know. What do you think? Do put down your cap, it looks as if you were just going, it makes me uncomfortable. I am so delighted. Raskolnikov put down his cap and continued listening in silence with a serious frowning face to the vague and empty chatter of Porfiry Petrovich. Does he really want to distract my attention with his silly babble? I can't offer you coffee here, but why not spend five minutes with a friend? Porfiry pattered on, and you know all these official duties, please don't mind my running up and down, excuse it, my dear fellow. I am very much afraid of offending you, but exercise is absolutely indispensable for me. I'm always sitting and so glad to be moving about for five minutes. I suffer from my sedentary life. I always intend to join a gymnasium, they say that officials of all ranks, even privy councillors, may be seen skipping gaily there, there you have it, modern science, yes, yes. But as for my duties here, inquiries and all such formalities, you mentioned inquiries yourself just now. I assure you these interrogations are sometimes more embarrassing for the interrogator than for the interrogated. You made the observation yourself just now very aptly and wittily. Raskolnikov had made no observation of the kind. One gets into a muddle. A regular muddle. 
one keeps harping on the same note, like a drum. There is to be a reform and we shall be called by a different name, at least, he he he. And as for our legal tradition, as you so wittily called it, I thoroughly agree with you. Every prisoner on trial, even the rudest peasant, knows that they begin by disarming him with irrelevant questions, as you so happily put it, and then deal him a knockdown blow, he he he, your felicitous comparison, he he. So you really imagined that I meant by government quarters, he he. You are an ironical person. Come. I won't go on. Ah, by the way, yes. One word leads to another. You spoke of formality just now, apropos of the inquiry, you know. But what's the use of formality? In many cases it's nonsense. Sometimes one has a friendly chat and gets a good deal more out of it. One can always fall back on formality, allow me to assure you. And after all, what does it amount to? An examining lawyer cannot be bounded by formality at every step. The work of investigation is, so to speak, a free art in its own way, he he he. Porfiry Petrovich took breath a moment. He had simply babbled on uttering empty phrases, letting slip a few enigmatic words, and again reverting to incoherence. He was almost running about the room, moving his fat little legs quicker and quicker, looking at the ground, with his right hand behind his back, while with his left making gesticulations that were extraordinarily incongruous with his words. Raskolnikov suddenly noticed that as he ran about the room he seemed twice to stop for a moment near the door, as though he were listening. Is he expecting anything? You are certainly quite right about it, Porfiry began gaily, looking with extraordinary simplicity at Raskolnikov, which startled him and instantly put him on his guard, certainly quite right in laughing so wittily at our legal forms, he he. Some of these elaborate psychological methods are exceedingly ridiculous and perhaps useless, if one adheres too closely to the forms. Yes. I am talking of forms again. Well, if I recognize, or more strictly speaking, if I suspect someone or other to be a criminal in any case entrusted to me, you're reading for the law, of course, Radion Romanovich? Yes, I was. Well, then it is a precedent for you for the future, though don't suppose I should venture to instruct you after the articles you publish about crime. No, I simply make bold to state it by way of fact. If I took this man or that for a criminal, why, I ask, should I worry him prematurely, even though I had evidence against him? In one case I may be bound, for instance, to arrest a man at once, but another may be in quite a different position, you know, so why shouldn't I let him walk about the town a bit? He he he! But I see you don't quite understand, so I'll give you a clearer example. If I put him in prison too soon, I may very likely give him, so to speak, moral support, he <laughs> he. You're laughing? Raskolnikov had no idea of laughing. He was sitting with compressed lips, his feverish eyes fixed on Porfiry Petrovich's. Yet that is the case, with some types especially, for men are so different. You say evidence. Well, there may be evidence. But evidence, you know, can generally be taken two ways. I am an examining lawyer and a weak man, I confess it. I should like to make a proof, so to say, mathematically clear. I should like to make a chain of evidence such as twice two are four, it ought to be a direct, irrefutable proof. And if I shut him up too soon, even though I might be convinced he was the man, I should very likely be depriving myself of the means of getting further evidence against him. And how? By giving him, so to speak, a definite position, I shall put him out of suspense and set his mind at rest, so that he will retreat into his shell. They say that at Sebastopol, soon after Alma, the clever people were in a terrible fright that the enemy would attack openly and take Sebastopol at once. But when they saw that the enemy preferred a regular siege, they were delighted, I am told and reassured, for the thing would drag on for two months at least. You're laughing, you don't believe me again? Of course, you're right, too. You're right, you're right. 
These are special cases, I admit. But you must observe this, my dear Rodion Romanovich, the general case, the case for which all legal forms and rules are intended, for which they are calculated and laid down in books, does not exist at all, for the reason that every case, every crime, for instance, so soon as it actually occurs, at once becomes a thoroughly special case and sometimes a case unlike any that's gone before. Very comic cases of that sort sometimes occur. If I leave one man quite alone, if I don't touch him and don't worry him, but let him know or at least suspect every moment that I know all about it and am watching him day and night, and if he is in continual suspicion and terror, he'll be bound to lose his head. He'll come of himself, or maybe do something which will make it as plain as twice two or four, it's delightful. It may be so with a simple peasant, but with one of our sort, an intelligent man cultivated on a certain side, it's a dead certainty. For, my dear fellow, it's a very important matter to know on what side a man is cultivated. And then there are nerves, there are nerves, you have overlooked them. Why, they are all sick, nervous, and irritable. And then how they all suffer from spleen. That I assure you is a regular gold mine for us. And it's no anxiety to me, his running about the town free. Let him, let him walk about for a bit. I know well enough that I've caught him and that he won't escape me. Where could he escape to, he he? Abroad, perhaps? A pole will escape abroad, but not here, especially as I am watching and have taken measures. Will he escape into the depths of the country, perhaps? But you know, peasants live there, real rude Russian peasants. A modern cultivated man would prefer prison to living with such strangers as our peasants. He he! But that's all nonsense, and on the surface. It's not merely that he has nowhere to run to, he is psychologically unable to escape me, he he! What an expression! Through a law of nature, he can't escape me if he had anywhere to go. Have you seen a butterfly round a candle? That's how he will keep circling and circling round me. Freedom will lose its attractions. He'll begin to brood, he'll weave a tangle round himself, he'll worry himself to death. What's more he will provide me with a mathematical proof, if I only give him long enough interval. And he'll keep circling round me, getting nearer and nearer, and then, flop. He'll fly straight into my mouth, and I'll swallow him, and that will be very amusing, he he he. You don't believe me? Raskolnikov made no reply, he sat pale and motionless, still gazing with the same intensity into Porfiry's face. It's a lesson, he thought, turning cold. This is beyond the cat playing with a mouse, like yesterday. He can't be showing off his power with no motive, prompting me, he is far too clever for that, he must have another object. What is it? It's all nonsense, my friend, you are pretending to scare me. You've no proofs and the man I saw had no real existence. You simply want to make me lose my head, to work me up beforehand and so to crush me. But you are wrong, you won't do it. But why give me such a hint? Is he reckoning on my shattered nerves? No, my friend, you are wrong, you won't do it even though you have some trap for me. Let us see what you have in store for me. And he braced himself to face a terrible and unknown ordeal. At times he longed to fall on Porphyry and strangle him. This anger was what he dreaded from the beginning. He felt that his parched lips were flecked with foam, his heart was throbbing. But he was still determined not to speak till the right moment. He realized that this was the best policy in his position because instead of saying too much he would be irritating his enemy by his silence and provoking him into speaking too freely. Anyhow, this was what he hoped for. No, I see you don't believe me, you think I am playing a harmless joke on you, Porphyry began again, getting more and more lively, chuckling at every instant and again pacing round the room. And to be sure you're right, God has given me a figure that can awaken none but comic ideas in other people, a buffoon, 
but let me tell you, and I repeat it, excuse an old man, my dear Radion Romanovich, you are a man still young, so to say, in your first youth, and so you put intellect above everything, like all young people. Playful wit and abstract arguments fascinate you and that's for all the world like the old Austrian Hofkriegsrath, as far as I can judge of military matters, that is, on paper they'd beaten Napoleon and taken him prisoner, and there in their study they worked it all out in the cleverest fashion, but look you, General Mack surrendered with all his army, he he he. I see, I see, Radion Romanovich, you are laughing at a civilian like me, taking examples out of military history. But I can't help it, it's my weakness. I am fond of military science. And I'm ever so fond of reading all military histories. I've certainly missed my proper career. I ought to have been in the army, upon my word I ought. I shouldn't have been a Napoleon, but I might have been a major, he he. Well, I'll tell you the whole truth, my dear fellow, about this special case, I mean, actual fact and a man's temperament, my dear sir, are weighty matters, and it's astonishing how they sometimes deceive the sharpest calculation. I, listened to an old man, am speaking seriously, Radion Romanovich, as he said this Porfiry Petrovich, who was scarcely five and thirty, actually seemed to have grown old, even his voice changed and he seemed to shrink together, moreover, I'm a candid man, am I a candid man or not? What do you say? I fancy I really am. I tell you these things for nothing and don't even expect a reward for it. He <laughs> he. Well, to proceed, what in my opinion is a splendid thing, it is, so to say, an adornment of nature and a consolation of life, and what tricks it can play. So that it sometimes is hard for a poor examining lawyer to know where he is, especially when he's liable to be carried away by his own fancy, too, for you know he is a man after all. But the poor fellow is saved by the criminal's temperament, worse luck for him. But young people carried away by their own wit don't think of that when they overstep all obstacles, as you wittily and cleverly expressed it yesterday. He will lie, that is, the man who is a special case, the incognito, and he will lie well, in the cleverest fashion, you might think he would triumph and enjoy the fruits of his wit, but at the most interesting, the most flagrant moment he will faint. Of course there may be illness and a stuffy room as well, but anyway. Anyway, he's given us the idea. He lied incomparably, but he didn't reckon on his temperament. That's what betrays him. Another time he will be carried away by his playful wit into making fun of the man who suspects him, he will turn pale as it were on purpose to mislead, but his paleness will be too natural, too much like the real thing, again he has given us an idea. Though his questioner may be deceived at first, he will think differently next day if he is not a fool, and, of course, it is like that at every step. He puts himself forward where he is not wanted, speaks continually when he ought to keep silent, brings in all sorts of allegorical illusions, he he. Comes and asks why didn't you take me long ago? He he he. And that can happen, you know, with the cleverest man, the psychologist, the literary man. The temperament reflects everything like a mirror. Gaze into it and admire what you see. But why are you so pale, Radion Romanovich? Is the room stuffy? Shall I open the window? Oh, don't trouble, please, cried Raskolnikov and he suddenly broke into a laugh. Please don't trouble. Porfiry stood facing him, paused a moment and suddenly he too laughed. Raskolnikov got up from the sofa, abruptly checking his hysterical laughter. Porfiry Petrovich, he began, speaking loudly and distinctly, though his legs trembled and he could scarcely stand. I see clearly at last that you actually suspect me of murdering that old woman and her sister Lizaveta. Let me tell you for my part that I am sick of this. If you find that you have a right to prosecute me legally, to arrest me, then prosecute me, arrest me. But I will not let myself be jeered at to my face and worried. His lips trembled, his eyes glowed with fury, and he could not restrain his voice. I won't allow it, he shouted, bringing his fist down on the table. Do you hear that, Porfiry Petrovich? I won't allow it. Good heavens! 
What does it mean? cried Porfiry Petrovich, apparently quite frightened. Radayan Romanovich, my dear fellow, what is the matter with you? I won't allow it, Raskolnikov shouted again. Hush, my dear man. They'll hear and come in. Just think, what could we say to them? Porfiry Petrovich whispered in horror, bringing his face close to Raskolnikov's. I won't allow it, I won't allow it, Raskolnikov repeated mechanically, but he too spoke in a sudden whisper. Porfiry turned quickly and ran to open the window. Some fresh air! And you must have some water, my dear fellow. You're ill, and he was running to the door to call for some when he found a decanter of water in the corner. Come, drink a little, he whispered, rushing up to him with the decanter. It will be sure to do you good. Porfiry Petrovich's alarm and sympathy were so natural that Raskolnikov was silent and began looking at him with wild curiosity. He did not take the water, however. Radayan Romanovich, my dear fellow, you'll drive yourself out of your mind, I assure you, ACH, ACH. Have some water, do drink a little. He forced him to take the glass. Raskolnikov raised it mechanically to his lips, but set it on the table again with disgust. Yes, you've had a little attack. You'll bring back your illness again, my dear fellow, Porfiry Petrovich cackled with friendly sympathy, though he still looked rather disconcerted. Good heavens, you must take more care of. Yourself. Dmitri Prokofitch was here, came to see me yesterday, I know, I know, I've a nasty, ironical temper, but what they made of it. Good heavens, he came yesterday after you'd been. We dined, and he talked and talked away, and I could only throw up my hands in despair. Did he come from you? But do sit down, for mercy's sake, sit down. No, not from me, but I knew he went to you, and why he went, Raskolnikov answered sharply. You knew? I knew. What of it? Why this, Radayan Romanovich, that I know more than that about you, I know about everything. I know how you went to take a flat at night when it was dark and how you rang the bell and asked about the blood, so that the workman and the porter did not know what to make of it. Yes, I understand your state of mind at that time, but you'll drive yourself mad like that, upon my word. You'll lose your head. You're full of generous indignation at the wrongs you've received, first from destiny, and then from the police officers, and so you rush from one thing to another to force them to speak out and make an end of it all because you are sick of all this suspicion and foolishness. That's so, isn't it? I have guessed how you feel, haven't I? Only in that way you'll lose your head and Razumihin's, too, he's too good a man for such a position, you must know that. You are ill and he is good and your illness is infectious for him. I'll tell you about it when you are more yourself. But do sit down, for goodness sake. Please rest, you look shocking, do sit down. Raskolnikov sat down, he no longer shivered, he was hot all over. In amazement he listened with strained attention to Porfiry Petrovich, who still seemed frightened as he looked after him with friendly solicitude. But he did not believe a word he said, though he felt a strange inclination to believe. Porfiry's unexpected words about the flat had utterly overwhelmed him. How can it be, he knows about the flat then, he thought suddenly, and he tells it me himself. Yes, in our legal practice there was a case almost exactly similar, a case of morbid psychology, Porfiry went on quickly. A man confessed to murder and how he kept it up. It was a regular hallucination, he brought forward facts, he imposed upon everyone and why? He had been partly, but only partly, unintentionally the cause of a murder and when he knew that he had given the murderers the opportunity, he sank into dejection, it got on his mind and turned his brain, he began imagining things and he persuaded himself that he was the murderer. But at last the High Court of Appeal went into it and the poor fellow was acquitted and put under proper care. Thanks to the Court of Appeal. Tut tut tut. 
Why, my dear fellow, you may drive yourself into delirium if you have the impulse to work upon your nerves, to go ringing bells at night and asking about blood. I've studied all this morbid psychology in my practice. A man is sometimes tempted to jump out of a window or from a belfry. Just the same with bell ringing. It's all illness, Radayan Romanovich. You have begun to neglect your illness. You should consult an experienced doctor. What's the good of that fat fellow? You are light-headed. You were delirious when you did all this. For a moment Raskolnikov felt everything going round. Is it possible, is it possible, flashed through his mind, that he is still lying? He can't be, he can't be. He rejected that idea, feeling to what a degree of fury it might drive him feeling that that fury might drive him mad. I was not delirious. I knew what I was doing, he cried, straining every faculty to penetrate Porphyry's game, I was quite myself, do you hear? Yes, I hear and understand. You said yesterday you were not delirious, you were particularly emphatic about it. I understand all you can tell me. A-A-C-H Listen, Radayan Romanovich, my dear fellow. If you were actually a criminal, or were somehow mixed up in this damnable business, would you insist that you were not delirious, but in full possession of your faculties? And so emphatically and persistently? Would it be possible? Quite impossible, to my thinking. If you had anything on your conscience, you certainly ought to insist that you were delirious. That's so, isn't it? There was a note of slyness in this inquiry. Raskolnikov drew back on the sofa as Porphyry bent over him and stared in silent perplexity at him. Another thing about Razumihin, you certainly ought to have said that he came of his own accord, to have concealed your part in it. But you don't conceal it. You lay stress on his coming at your instigation. Raskolnikov had not done so. A chill went down his back. You keep telling lies, he said slowly and weakly, twisting his lips into a sickly smile, you are trying again to show that you know all my game, that you know all I shall say beforehand, he said, conscious himself that he was not weighing his words as he ought. You want to frighten me, or you are simply laughing at me. He still stared at him as he said this, and again there was a light of intense hatred in his eyes. You keep lying, he said. You know perfectly well that the best policy for the criminal is to tell the truth as nearly as possible, to conceal as little as possible. I don't believe you. What a wily person you are. Porphyry tittered, there's no catching you, you've a perfect monomania. So you don't believe me? But still you do believe me, you believe a quarter, I'll soon make you believe the whole because I have a sincere liking for you and genuinely wish you good. Raskolnikov's lips trembled. Yes, I do, went on Porphyry, touching Raskolnikov's arm genially, you must take care of your illness. Besides, your mother and sister are here now, you must think of them. You must soothe and comfort them and you do nothing but frighten them. What has that to do with you? How do you know it? What concern is it of yours? You are keeping watch on me and want to let me know it? Good heavens! Why, I learned it all from you yourself. You don't notice that in your excitement you tell me and others everything. From Razumihin, too, I learned a number of interesting details yesterday. No, you interrupted me, but I must tell you that, for all your wit, your suspiciousness makes you lose the common-sense view of things. To return to bell ringing, for instance. I, an examining lawyer, have betrayed a precious thing like that, a real fact, for it is a fact worth having, and you see nothing in it. Why, if I had the slightest suspicion of you, should I have acted like that? No, I should first have disarmed your suspicions and not let you see I knew of that fact should have diverted your attention and suddenly have dealt you a knock-down blow, your expression, saying, And what were you doing, sir, pray, at ten or nearly eleven at the murdered woman's flat, and why did you ring the bell, and why did you ask about blood? 
And why did you invite the porters to go with you to the police station, to the lieutenant? That's how I ought to have acted if I had a grain of suspicion of you. I ought to have taken your evidence in due form, searched your lodging and perhaps have arrested you, too, so I have no suspicion of you, since I have not done that. But you can't look at it normally, and you see nothing, I say again. Raskolnikov started so that Porfiry Petrovich could not fail to perceive it. You are lying all the while, he cried, I don't know your object, but you are lying. You did not speak like that just now, and I cannot be mistaken. I am lying? Porfiry repeated, apparently incensed, but preserving a good-humored and ironical face, as though he were not in the least concerned at Raskolnikov's opinion of him. I am lying, but how did I treat you just now, I, the examining lawyer? Prompting you and giving you every means for your defense, illness, I said, delirium, injury, melancholy, and the police officers, and all the rest of it? Ah! He he he! Though, indeed, all those psychological means of defense are not very reliable and cut both ways, illness, delirium, I don't remember, that's all right, but why, my good sir, in your illness and in your delirium were you haunted by just those delusions and not by any others? There may have been others, eh? He he he! Raskolnikov looked haughtily and contemptuously at him. Briefly, he said loudly and imperiously, rising to his feet and in so doing pushing Porfiry back a little, Briefly, I want to know, do you acknowledge me perfectly free from suspicion or not? Tell me, Porfiry Petrovich, tell me once for all and make haste. What a business I'm having with you, cried Porfiry with a perfectly good-humored, sly and composed face. And why do you want to know, why do you want to know so much, since they haven't begun to worry you? Why, you are like a child asking for matches. And why are you so uneasy? Why do you force yourself upon us, eh? He he he! I repeat, Raskolnikov cried furiously, that I can't put up with it. With what? Uncertainty, interrupted Porphyry. Don't jeer at me. I won't have it. I tell you I won't have it. I can't and I won't, do you hear, do you hear? He shouted, bringing his fist down on the table again. Hush! Hush! They'll overhear. I warn you seriously, take care of yourself. I am not joking, Porphyry whispered, but this time there was not the look of old womanish good nature and alarm in his face. Now he was peremptory, stern, frowning and for once laying aside all mystification. But this was only for an instant. Raskolnikov, bewildered, suddenly fell into actual frenzy, but, strange to say, he again obeyed the command to speak quietly, though he was in a perfect paroxysm of fury. I will not allow myself to be tortured, he whispered, instantly recognizing with hatred that he could not help obeying the command and driven to even greater fury by the thought. Arrest me, search me, but kindly act in due form and don't play with me. Don't dare. Don't worry about the form, Porfiry interrupted with the same sly smile, as it were, gloating with enjoyment over Raskolnikov. I invited you to see me quite in a friendly way. I don't want your friendship and I spit on it. Do you hear? And, here, I take my cap and go. What will you say now if you mean to arrest me? He took up his cap and went to the door. And won't you see my little surprise? Chuckled Porphyry, again taking him by the arm and stopping him at the door. He seemed to become more playful and good-humored, which maddened Raskolnikov. What surprise, he asked, standing still and looking at Porphyry in alarm. My little surprise, it's sitting there behind the door, he he he. He pointed to the locked door. I locked him in that he should not escape. What is it? Where? What? Raskolnikov walked to the door and would have opened it, but it was locked. It's locked, here is the key and he brought a key out of his pocket. 
You are lying, roared Raskolnikov without restraint. You lie, you damned Punchinello. And he rushed at Porfiry who retreated to the other door, not at all alarmed. I understand it all. You are lying and mocking so that I may betray myself to you. Why, you could not betray yourself any further, my dear Radion Romanovich. You are in a passion. Don't shout, I shall call the clerks. You are lying. Call the clerks. You knew I was ill and tried to work me into a frenzy to make me betray myself. That was your object. Produce your facts. I understand it all. You've no evidence. You have only wretched rubbishly suspicions like Zaintov's. You knew my character. You wanted to drive me to fury and then to knock me down with priests and deputies. Are you waiting for them? Eh? What are you waiting for? Where are they? Produce them? Why deputies, my good man? What things people will imagine? And to do so would not be acting in form as you say, you don't know the business, my dear fellow. And there's no escaping form, as you see, Porphyry muttered, listening at the door through which a noise could be heard. Ah, they're coming, cried Raskolnikov. You've sent for them. You expected them. Well, produce them all, your deputies, your witnesses, what you like. I am ready. But at this moment a strange incident occurred, something so unexpected that neither Raskolnikov nor Porfiry Petrovich could have looked for such a conclusion to their interview. When he remembered the scene afterwards, this is how Raskolnikov saw it. The noise behind the door increased, and suddenly the door was opened a little. What is it? cried Porfiry Petrovich, annoyed. Why? I gave orders. For an instant there was no answer, but it was evident that there were several persons at the door, and that they were apparently pushing somebody back. What is it? Porfiry Petrovich repeated, uneasily. The prisoner Nikolai has been brought, someone answered. He is not wanted. Take him away. Let him wait. What's he doing here? How irregular, cried Porfiry, rushing to the door. But he began the same voice and suddenly ceased. Two seconds, not more, were spent in actual struggle, then someone gave a violent shove, and then a man, very pale, strode into the room. This man's appearance was at first sight very strange. He stared straight before him, as though seeing nothing. There was a determined gleam in his eyes, at the same time there was a deathly pallor in his face, as though he were being led to the scaffold. His white lips were faintly twitching. He was dressed like a workman and was of medium height, very young, slim, his hair cut in round crop, with thin spare features. The man whom he had thrust back followed him into the room and succeeded in seizing him by the shoulder. He was a warder, but Nikolai pulled his arm away. Several persons crowded inquisitively into the doorway. Some of them tried to get in. All this took place almost instantaneously. Go away, it's too soon. Wait till you are sent for. Why have you brought him so soon? Porfiry Petrovich muttered, extremely annoyed, and as it were thrown out of his reckoning. But Nikolai suddenly knelt down. What's the matter? cried Porfiry, surprised. I am guilty. Mine is the sin. I am the murderer, Nikolai articulated suddenly, rather breathless, but speaking fairly loudly. For ten seconds there was silence as though all had been struck dumb, even the warder stepped back, mechanically retreated to the door, and stood immovable. What is it? cried Porfiry Petrovich, recovering from his momentary stupefaction. I am the murderer, repeated Nikolai, after a brief pause. What, you, what, whom did you kill? Porfiry Petrovich was obviously bewildered. Nikolai again was silent for a moment. Aliona Ivanovna and her sister Lizaveta Ivanovna, I, killed, with an axe. 
darkness came over me, he added suddenly, and was again silent. He still remained on his knees. Porfiry Petrovich stood for some moments as though meditating, but suddenly roused himself and waved back the uninvited spectators. They instantly vanished and closed the door. Then he looked towards Raskolnikov, who was standing in the corner, staring wildly at Nikolai and moved towards him, but stopped short, looked from Nikolai to Raskolnikov and then again at Nikolai, and seeming unable to restrain himself, darted at the latter. You're in too great a hurry, he shouted at him, almost angrily. I didn't ask you what came over you. Speak, did you kill them? I am the murderer. I want to give evidence, Nikolai pronounced. A-C-H. What did you kill them with? An axe. I had it ready. A-C-H, he is in a hurry. Alone? Nikolai did not understand the question. Did you do it alone? Yes, alone. And Mitka is not guilty and had no share in it. Don't be in a hurry about Mitka. A-A-C-H. How is it you ran downstairs like that at the time? The porters met you both. It was to put them off the scent. I ran after Mitka, Nikolai replied hurriedly, as though he had prepared the answer. I knew it, cried Porfiry, with vexation. It's not his own tale he is telling, he muttered as though to himself, and suddenly his eyes rested on Raskolnikov again. He was apparently so taken up with Nikolai that for a moment he had forgotten Raskolnikov. He was a little taken aback. My dear Radion Romanovich, excuse me, he flew up to him, this won't do, I'm afraid you must go, it's no good you're staying. I will, you see, what a surprise. Goodbye. And taking him by the arm, he showed him to the door. I suppose you didn't expect it, said Raskolnikov, who, though he had not yet fully grasped the situation, had regained his courage. You did not expect it either, my friend. See how your hand is trembling. He he. You're trembling, too, Porfiry Petrovich. Yes, I am, I didn't expect it. They were already at the door. Porfiry was impatient for Raskolnikov to be gone. And your little surprise, aren't you going to show it to me? Raskolnikov said, sarcastically. Why, his teeth are chattering as he asks, he he. You are an ironical person. Come, till we meet. I believe we can say goodbye. That's in God's hands, muttered Porfiry, with an unnatural smile. As he walked through the office, Raskolnikov noticed that many people were looking at him. Among them he saw the two porters from the house, whom he had invited that night to the police station. They stood there waiting. But he was no sooner on the stairs than he heard the voice of Porfiry Petrovich behind him. Turning round, he saw the latter running after him, out of breath. One word, Radion Romanovich, as to all the rest, it's in God's hands, but as a matter of form there are some questions I shall have to ask you, so we shall meet again, shan't we? And Porfiry stood still, facing him with a smile. Shan't we? he added again. He seemed to want to say something more, but could not speak out. You must forgive me, Porfiry Petrovich, for what has just passed. I lost my temper, began Raskolnikov, who had so far regained his courage that he felt irresistibly inclined to display his coolness. Don't mention it, don't mention it, Porfiry replied, almost gleefully. I myself, too. I have a wicked temper, I admit it. But we shall meet again. If it's God's will, we may see a great deal of one another. And we'll get to know each other through and through, added Raskolnikov. Yes, know each other through and through, assented Porfiry Petrovich, and he screwed up his eyes, looking earnestly at Raskolnikov. Now you're going to a birthday party? To a funeral. Of course, the funeral. Take care of yourself, and get well. 
I don't know what to wish you, said Raskolnikov, who had begun to descend the stairs, but looked back again. I should like to wish you success, but your office is such a comical one. Why comical? Porfiry Petrovich had turned to go, but he seemed to prick up his ears at this. Why, how you must have been torturing and harassing that poor Nikolai psychologically, after your fashion, till he confessed. You must have been at him day and night, proving to him that he was the murderer, and now that he has confessed, you'll begin vivisecting him again. You are lying, you'll say. You are not the murderer. You can't be. It's not your own tale you are telling. You must admit it's a comical business. He he he. You noticed then that I said to Nikolai just now that it was not his own tale he was telling? How could I help noticing it? He he. You are quick-witted. You notice everything. You've really a playful mind. And you always fasten on the comic side. He he. They say that was the marked characteristic of Gogol, among the writers. Yes, of Gogol. Yes, of Gogol. I shall look forward to meeting you. So shall I. Raskolnikov walked straight home. He was so muddled and bewildered that on getting home he sat for a quarter of an hour on the sofa, trying to collect his thoughts. He did not attempt to think about Nikolai, he was stupefied. He felt that his confession was something inexplicable, amazing, something beyond his understanding. But Nikolai's confession was an actual fact. The consequences of this fact were clear to him at once, its falsehood could not fail to be discovered, and then they would be after him again. Till then, at least, he was free and must do something for himself, for the danger was imminent. But how imminent? His position gradually became clear to him. Remembering, sketchily, the main outlines of his recent scene with Porphyry, he could not help shuddering again with horror. Of course, he did not yet know all Porphyry's aims, he could not see into all his calculations. But he had already partly shown his hand, and no one knew better than Raskolnikov how terrible Porphyry's lead had been for him. A little more, and he might have given himself away, completely, circumstantially. Knowing his nervous temperament and from the first glance seeing through him, Porphyry, though playing a bold game, was bound to win. There's no denying that Raskolnikov had compromised himself seriously, but no facts had come to light as yet, there was nothing positive. But was he taking a true view of the position? Wasn't he mistaken? What had Porphyry been trying to get at? Had he really some surprise prepared for him? And what was it? Had he really been expecting something or not? How would they have parted if it had not been for the unexpected appearance of Nikolai? Porphyry had shown almost all his cards, of course, he had risked something in showing them, and if he had really had anything up his sleeve, Raskolnikov reflected, he would have shown that, too. What was that surprise? Was it a joke? Had it meant anything? Could it have concealed anything like a fact, a piece of positive evidence? His yesterday's visitor? What had become of him? Where was he today? If Porphyry really had any evidence, it must be connected with him. He sat on the sofa with his elbows on his knees and his face hidden in his hands. He was still shivering nervously. At last he got up, took his cap, thought a minute, and went to the door. He had a sort of presentiment that, for today, at least, he might consider himself out of danger. He had a sudden sense almost of joy, he wanted to make haste to Katerina Ivanovna's. He would be too late for the funeral, of course, but he would be in time for the memorial dinner, and there at once he would see Sonia. He stood still, thought a moment, and a suffering smile came for a moment onto his lips. Today. Today, he repeated to himself. Yes, today. So it must be. But as he was about to open the door, it began opening of itself. He started and moved back. 
The door opened gently and slowly, and there suddenly appeared a figure, yesterday's visitor from underground. The man stood in the doorway, looked at Raskolnikov without speaking, and took a step forward into the room. He was exactly the same as yesterday, the same figure, the same dress, but there was a great change in his face, he looked dejected and sighed deeply. If he had only put his hand up to his cheek and leaned his head on one side, he would have looked exactly like a peasant woman. What do you want? asked Raskolnikov, numb with terror. The man was still silent, but suddenly he bowed down almost to the ground, touching it with his finger. What is it? cried Raskolnikov. I have sinned, the man articulated softly. How? By evil thoughts. They looked at one another. I was vexed. When you came, perhaps in drink, and bade the porters go to the police station and asked about the blood, I was vexed that they let you go and took you for drunken. I was so vexed that I lost my sleep. And remembering the address, we came here yesterday and asked for you. Who came? Raskolnikov interrupted, instantly beginning to recollect. I did, I've wronged you. Then you come from that house? I was standing at the gate with them, don't you remember? We have carried on our trade in that house for years past. We cure and prepare hides, we take work home, most of all I was vexed. And the whole scene of the day before yesterday in the gateway came clearly before Raskolnikov's mind, he recollected that there had been several people there besides the porters, women among them. He remembered one voice had suggested taking him straight to the police station. He could not recall the face of the speaker, and even now he did not recognize it, but he remembered that he had turned round and made him some answer. So this was the solution of yesterday's horror. The most awful thought was that he had been actually almost lost, had almost done for himself on account of such a trivial circumstance. So this man could tell nothing except his asking about the flat and the blood stains. So Porphyry, too, had nothing but that delirium, no facts but this psychology which cuts both ways, nothing positive. So if no more facts come to light, and they must not, they must not, then, then what can they do to him? How can they convict him, even if they arrest him? And Porphyry then had only just heard about the flat and had not known about it before. Was it you who told Porphyry that I'd been there? He cried, struck by a sudden idea. What Porphyry? The head of the detective department? Yes. The porters did not go there, but I went. Today? I got there two minutes before you. And I heard, I heard it all, how he worried you. Where? What? When? Why, in the next room? I was sitting there all the time. What? Why, then you were the surprise. But how could it happen? Upon my word. I saw that the porters did not want to do what I said, began the man, for it's too late, said they, and maybe he'll be angry that we did not come at the time. I was vexed and I lost my sleep, and I began making inquiries. And finding out yesterday where to go, I went today. The first time I went he wasn't there, when I came an hour later, he couldn't see me. I went the third time, and they showed me in. I informed him of everything, just as it happened, and he began skipping about the room and punching himself on the chest. What do scoundrels mean by it? If I'd known about it, I should have arrested him. Then he ran out, called somebody and began talking to him in the corner, then he turned to me, scolding and questioning me. He scolded me a great deal, and I told him everything, and I told him that you didn't dare to say a word in answer to me yesterday, and that you didn't recognize me. And he fell to running about again and kept hitting himself on the chest, and getting angry and running about and when you were announced, he told me to go into the next room. Sit there a bit, he said. Don't move, whatever you may hear. And he set a chair there for me and locked me in. Perhaps, he said, I may call you. 
and when Nikolai'd been brought, he let me out as soon as you were gone. I shall send for you again and question you, he said. And did he question Nikolai while you were there? He got rid of me as he did of you, before he spoke to Nikolai. The man stood still, and again suddenly bowed down, touching the ground with his finger. Forgive me for my evil thoughts and my slander. May God forgive you, answered Raskolnikov. And as he said this, the man bowed down again, but not to the ground, turned slowly and went out of the room. It all cuts both ways, now it all cuts both ways, repeated Raskolnikov, and he went out more confident than ever. Now we'll make a fight for it, he said, with a malicious smile, as he went down the stairs. His malice was aimed at himself, with shame and contempt he recollected his cowardice. The morning that followed the fateful interview with Dunya and her mother brought sobering influences to bear on Pyotr Petrovich. Intensely unpleasant as it was, he was forced little by little to accept as a fact beyond recall what had seemed to him only the day before fantastic and incredible. The black snake of wounded vanity had been gnawing at his heart all night. When he got out of bed, Pyotr Petrovich immediately looked in the looking glass. He was afraid that he had jaundice. However, his health seemed unimpaired so far, and looking at his noble, clear-skinned countenance, which had grown fattish of late, Pyotr Petrovich for an instant was positively comforted in the conviction that he would find another bride, and, perhaps, even a better one. But coming back to the sense of his present position, he turned aside and spat vigorously, which excited a sarcastic smile in Andrei Semyonovich Lebeziatnikov, the young friend with whom he was staying. That smile Pyotr Petrovich noticed, and at once set it down against his young friend's account. He had set down a good many points against him of late. His anger was redoubled when he reflected that he ought not to have told Andrei Semyonovich about the result of yesterday's interview. That was the second mistake he had made in temper, through impulsiveness and irritability. Moreover, all that morning one unpleasantness followed another. He even found a hitch awaiting him in his legal case in the Senate. He was particularly irritated by the owner of the flat which had been taken in view of his approaching marriage and was being redecorated at his own expense. The owner, a rich German tradesman, would not entertain the idea of breaking the contract which had just been signed and insisted on the full forfeit money, though Pyotr Petrovich would be giving him back the flat practically redecorated. In the same way, the upholsterers refused to return a single ruble of the installment paid for the furniture purchased but not yet removed to the flat. Am I to get married simply for the sake of the furniture? Pyotr Petrovich ground his teeth, and at the same time once more he had a gleam of desperate. Hope! Can all that be really so irrevocably over? Is it no use to make another effort? The thought of Dunya sent a voluptuous pain through his heart. He endured anguish at that moment, and if it had been possible to slay Raskolnikov instantly by wishing it, Pyotr Petrovich would promptly have uttered the wish. It was my mistake, too, not to have given them money, he thought, as he returned dejectedly to Lebeziatnikov's room, and why on earth was I such a Jew? It was false economy. I meant to keep them without a penny so that they should turn to me as their providence and look at them. Foo! If I'd spent some 1,500 rubles on them for the trousseau and presents, on knickknacks, dressing cases, jewelry, materials, and all that sort of trash from Knobs and the English shop, my position would have been better and stronger. They could not have refused me so easily. They are the sort of people that would feel bound to return money and presents if they broke it off, and they would find it hard to do it. And their conscience would prick them. How can we dismiss a man who has hitherto been so generous and delicate? Hum. I've made a blunder. And grinding his teeth again, Pyotr Petrovich called himself a fool, but not aloud, of course. He returned home, twice as irritated and angry as before. The preparations for the funeral dinner at Katerina Ivanovna's excited his curiosity as he passed. He had heard about it the day before. He fancied, indeed, that he had been invited, but absorbed in his own cares, he had paid no attention. 
inquiring of Madame Lipovexel, who was busy laying the table while Katerina Ivanovna was away at the cemetery, he heard that the entertainment was to be a great affair, that all the lodgers had been invited, among them some who had not known the dead man, that even Andrei Semyonovich Lebeziatnikov was invited in spite of his previous quarrel with Katerina Ivanovna, that he, Pyotr Petrovich, was not only invited, but was eagerly expected as he was the most important of the lodgers. Amalia Ivanovna herself had been invited with great ceremony in spite of the recent unpleasantness, and so she was very busy with preparations and was taking a positive pleasure in them. She was moreover dressed up to the nines, all in new black silk, and she was proud of it. All this suggested an idea to Pyotr Petrovich, and he went into his room, or rather Lebeziatnikov's, somewhat thoughtful. He had learned that Raskolnikov was to be one of the guests. Andrei Semyonovich had been at home all the morning. The attitude of Pyotr Petrovich to this gentleman was strange, though perhaps natural. Pyotr Petrovich had despised and hated him from the day he came to stay with him and at the same time he seemed somewhat afraid of him. He had not come to stay with him on his arrival in Petersburg simply from parsimony, though that had been perhaps his chief object. He had heard of Andrei Semyonovich, who had once been his ward, as a leading young progressive who was taking an important part in certain interesting circles, the doings of which were a legend in the provinces. It had impressed Pyotr Petrovich. These powerful omniscient circles who despised everyone and showed everyone up had long inspired in him a peculiar but quite vague alarm. He had not, of course, been able to form even an approximate notion of what they meant. He, like everyone, had heard that there were, especially in Petersburg, progressives of some sort, nihilists and so on, and, like many people, he exaggerated and distorted the significance of those words to an absurd degree. What for many years past he had feared more than anything was being shown up and this was the chief ground for his continual uneasiness at the thought of transferring his business to Petersburg. He was afraid of this as little children are sometimes panic-stricken. Some years before, when he was just entering on his own career, he had come upon two cases in which rather important personages in the province, patrons of his, had been cruelly shown up. One instance had ended in great scandal for the person attacked and the other had very nearly ended in serious trouble. For this reason Pyotr Petrovich intended to go into the subject as soon as he reached Petersburg and, if necessary, to anticipate contingencies by seeking the favor of our younger generation. He relied on Andrei Semyonovich for this and before his visit to Raskolnikov he had succeeded in picking up some current phrases. He soon discovered that Andrei Semyonovich was a commonplace simpleton, but that by no means reassured Pyotr Petrovich. Even if he had been certain that all the progressives were fools like him, it would not have allayed his uneasiness. All the doctrines, the ideas, the systems, with which Andrei Semyonovich pestered him had no interest for him. He had his own object, he simply wanted to find out at once what was happening here. Had these people any power or not? Had he anything to fear from them? Would they expose any enterprise of his? And what precisely was now the object of their attacks? Could he somehow make up to them and get round them if they really were powerful? Was this the thing to do or not? Couldn't he gain something through them? In fact, hundreds of questions presented themselves. Andrei Semyonovich was an anemic, scrofulous little man, with strangely flax and mutton chop whiskers of which he was very proud. He was a clerk and had almost always something wrong with his eyes. He was rather soft. Hearted, but self-confident and sometimes extremely conceited in speech, which had an absurd effect, incongruous with his little figure. He was one of the lodgers most respected by Amalia Ivanovna for he did not get drunk and paid regularly for his lodgings. Andrei Semyonovich really was rather stupid, he attached himself to the cause of progress and our younger generation from enthusiasm. He was one of the numerous and varied legion of dullards, of half-animate abortions, conceited, half-educated coxcombs, who attach themselves to the idea most in fashion only to vulgarize it and who caricature every cause they serve, however sincerely. 
Though Lebeziatnikov was so good-natured, he, too, was beginning to dislike Pyotr Petrovich. This happened on both sides unconsciously. However simple Andrei Semyonovich might be, he began to see that Pyotr Petrovich was duping him and secretly despising him, and that he was not the right sort of man. He had tried expounding to him the system of Fourier and the Darwinian theory, but of late Pyotr Petrovich began to listen too sarcastically and even to be rude. The fact was he had begun instinctively to guess that Lebeziatnikov was not merely a commonplace simpleton, but, perhaps, a liar, too, and that he had no connections of any consequence even in his own circle, but had simply picked things up third-hand, and that very likely he did not even know much about his own work of propaganda, for he was in too great a muddle. A fine person he would be to show anyone up. It must be noted, by the way, that Pyotr Petrovich had during those ten days eagerly accepted the strangest praise from Andrei Semyonovich. He had not protested, for instance, when Andrei Semyonovich belauded him for being ready to contribute to the establishment of the new commune, or to abstain from christening his future children, or to acquiesce if Dunia were to take a lover a month after marriage, and so on. Pyotr Petrovich so enjoyed hearing his own praises that he did not disdain even such virtues when they were attributed to him. Pyotr Petrovich had had occasion that morning to realize some 5% bonds, and now he sat down to the table and counted over bundles of notes. Andrei Semyonovich, who hardly ever had any money, walked about the room pretending to himself to look at all those banknotes with indifference and even contempt. Nothing would have convinced Pyotr Petrovich that Andrei Semyonovich could really look on the money unmoved, and the latter, on his side, kept thinking bitterly that Pyotr Petrovich was capable of entertaining such an idea about him and was, perhaps, glad of the opportunity of teasing his young friend by reminding him of his inferiority and the great difference between them. He found him incredibly inattentive and irritable, though he, Andrei Semyonovich, began enlarging on his favorite subject, the foundation of a new special commune. The brief remarks that dropped from Pyotr Petrovich between the clicking of the beads on the reckoning frame betrayed unmistakable and discourteous irony. But the humane Andrei Semyonovich ascribed Pyotr Petrovich's ill humor to his recent breach with Dunia, and he was burning with impatience to discourse on that theme. He had something progressive to say on the subject, which might console his worthy friend and could not fail to promote his development. There is some sort of festivity being prepared at that, at the widow's, isn't there? Pyotr Petrovich asked suddenly, interrupting Andrei Semyonovich at the most interesting passage. Why, don't you know? Why, I was telling you last night what I think about all such ceremonies. And she invited you too, I heard. You were talking to her yesterday. I should never have expected that beggarly fool would have spent on this feast all the money she got from that other fool, Raskolnikov. I was surprised just now as I came through at the preparations there, the wines. Several people are invited. It's beyond everything, continued Pyotr Petrovich, who seemed to have some object in pursuing the conversation. What? You say I am asked to? When was that? I don't remember. But I shan't go. Why should I? I only said a word to her in passing yesterday of the possibility of her obtaining a year's salary as a destitute widow of a government clerk. I suppose she has invited me on that account, hasn't she? He he he. I don't intend to go either, said Lebeziatnikov. I should think not, after giving her a thrashing. You might well hesitate, he he. Who thrashed? Whom, cried Lebeziatnikov, flustered and blushing. Why, you thrashed Katerina Ivanovna a month ago. I heard so yesterday, so that's what your convictions amount to, and the woman question, too, wasn't quite sound, he he he, and Pyotr Petrovich, as though comforted, went back to clicking his beads. It's all slander and nonsense, cried Lebeziatnikov who was always afraid of allusions to the subject. It was not like that at all, it was quite different. You've heard it wrong, it's a libel. I was simply defending myself. She rushed. At me first with her nails, she pulled out all my whiskers. 
it's permissible for anyone, I should hope, to defend himself and I never allow anyone to use violence to me on principle, for it's an act of despotism. What was I to do? I simply pushed her back. He he he. Luzin went on laughing maliciously. You keep on like that because you are out of humor yourself. But that's nonsense and it has nothing, nothing whatever to do with the woman question. You don't understand, I used to think, indeed, that if women are equal to men in all respects, even in strength, as is maintained now, there ought to be equality in that, too. Of course, I reflected afterwards that such a question ought not really to arise, for there ought not to be fighting and in the future society fighting is unthinkable, and that it would be a queer thing to seek for equality in fighting. I am not so stupid, though, of course, there is fighting, there won't be later, but at present there is, confound it. How muddled one gets with you. It's not on that account that I am not going. I am not going on principle, not to take part in the revolting convention of memorial dinners, that's why. Though, of course, one might go to laugh at it. I am sorry, there won't be any priests at it. I should certainly go if there were. Then you would sit down at another man's table and insult it and those who invited you. Eh? Certainly not insult, but protest. I should do it with a good object. I might indirectly assist the cause of enlightenment and propaganda. It's a duty of every man to work for enlightenment and propaganda, and the more harshly, perhaps, the better. I might drop a seed, an idea. And something might grow up from that seed. How should I be insulting them? They might be offended at first, but afterwards they'd see I'd done them a service. You know, Terabiva, who is in the community now, was blamed because when she left her family and, devoted, herself, she wrote to her father and mother that she wouldn't go on living conventionally and was entering on a free marriage and it was said that that was too harsh, that she might have spared them and have written more kindly. I think that's all nonsense and there's no need of softness, on the contrary, what's wanted is protest. Varence had been married seven years, she abandoned her two children, she told her husband straight out in a letter, I have realized that I cannot be happy with you. I can never forgive you that you have deceived me by concealing from me that there is another organization of society by means of the communities. I have only lately learned it from a great-hearted man to whom I have given myself and with whom I am establishing a community. I speak plainly because I consider it dishonest to deceive you. Do as you think best. Do not hope to get me back. You are too late. I hope you will be happy. That's how letters like that ought to be written. Is that Terabiva the one you said had made a third free marriage? No, it's only the second, really. But what if it were the fourth? What if it were the fifteenth? That's all nonsense. And if ever I regretted the death of my father and mother, it is now, and I sometimes think if my parents were living what a protest I would have aimed at them. I would have done something on purpose. I would have shown them. I would have astonished them. I am really sorry there is no one. To surprise. He he. Well, be that as you will, Pyotr Petrovich interrupted, but tell me this. Do you know the dead man's daughter, the delicate-looking little thing? It's true what they say about her, isn't it? What of it? I think, that is, it is my own personal conviction that this is the normal condition of women. Why not? I mean, distinguins. In our present society, it is not altogether normal, because it is compulsory, but in the future society it will be perfectly normal because it will be voluntary. Even as it is, she was quite right, she was suffering and that was her asset, so to speak, her capital, which she had a perfect right to dispose of. Of course, in the future society there will be no need of assets, but her part will have another significance, rational and in harmony with her environment. As to Sofia Semyonovna personally, I regard her action as a vigorous protest against the organization of society, and I respect her deeply for it, I rejoice indeed when I look at her. 
I was told that you got her turned out of these lodgings. Lebeziatnikov was enraged. That's another slander, he yelled. It was not so at all. That was all Katerina Ivanovna's invention, for she did not understand. And I never made love to Sofia Semyonovna. I was simply developing her, entirely disinterestedly, trying to rouse her to protest. All I wanted was her protest and Sofia Semyonovna could not have remained here anyway. Have you asked her to join your community? You keep on laughing and very inappropriately, allow me to tell you. You don't understand. There is no such role in a community. The community is established that there should be no such roles. In a community, such a role is essentially transformed and what is stupid here is sensible there, what, under present conditions, is unnatural becomes perfectly natural in the community. It all depends on the environment. It's all the environment and man himself is nothing. And I am on good terms with Sofia Semyonovna to this day, which is a proof that she never regarded me as having wronged her. I am trying now to attract her to the community, but on quite, quite a different footing. What are you laughing at? We are trying to establish a community of our own, a special one, on a broader basis. We have gone further in our convictions. We reject more. And meanwhile, I'm still developing Sofia Semyonovna. She has a beautiful, beautiful character. And you take advantage of her fine character, eh? He he. No, no. Oh, no. On the contrary. Oh, on the contrary. He he he. A queer thing to say. Believe me. Why should I disguise it? In fact, I feel it strange myself how timid, chaste and modern she is with me. And you, of course, are developing her, he he. Trying to prove to her that all that modesty is nonsense? Not at all, not at all. How coarsely, how stupidly, excuse me saying so, you misunderstand the word development. Good heavens, how crude you still are. We are striving for the freedom of women and you have only one idea in your head. Setting aside the general question of chastity and feminine modesty as useless in themselves and indeed prejudices, I fully accept her chastity with me, because that's for her to decide. Of course if she were to tell me herself that she wanted me, I should think myself very lucky, because I like the girl very much, but as it is, no one has ever treated her more courteously than I, with more respect for her dignity. I wait in hopes, that's all. You had much better make her a present of something. I bet you never thought of that. You don't understand, as I've told you already. Of course, she is in such a position, but it's another question. Quite another question. You simply despise her. Seeing a fact which you mistakenly consider deserving of contempt, you refuse to take a humane view of a fellow creature. You don't know what a character she is. I am only sorry that of late she has quite given up reading and borrowing books. I used to lend them to her. I am sorry, too, that with all the energy and resolution in protesting, which she has already shown once, she has little self-reliance, little, so to say, independence, so as to break free from certain prejudices and certain foolish ideas. Yet she thoroughly understands some questions, for instance about kissing of hands, that is, that it's an insult to a woman for a man to kiss her hand, because it's a sign of inequality. We had a debate about it and I described it to her. She listened attentively to an account of the workmen's associations in France, too. Now I am explaining the question of coming into the room in the future society. And what's that, pray? We had a debate lately on the question, has a member of the community the right to enter another member's room, whether man or woman, at any time, and we decided that he has. It might be at an inconvenient moment, he he. Lubiziatnikov was really angry. You are always thinking of something unpleasant, he cried with aversion. 
fool! How vexed I am that when I was expounding our system, I referred prematurely to the question of personal privacy. It's always a stumbling block to people like you, they turn it into ridicule before they understand it. And how proud they are of it, too. Foo! I've often maintained that that question should not be approached by a novice till he has a firm faith in the system. And tell me, please, what do you find so shameful even in cesspools? I should be the first to be ready to clean out any cesspool you like. And it's not a question of self-sacrifice, it's simply work, honorable, useful work which is as good as any other and much better than the work of a Raphael and a Pushkin, because it is more useful. And more honorable, more honorable, he he he. What do you mean by more honorable? I don't understand such expressions to describe human activity. More honorable, nobler, all those are old-fashioned prejudices which I reject. Everything which is of use to mankind is honorable. I only understand one word, useful. You can snigger as much as you like, but that's so. Pyotr Petrovich laughed heartily. He had finished counting the money and was putting it away. But some of the notes he left on the table. The cesspool question had already been a subject of dispute between them. What was absurd was that it made Lebeziatnik of really angry, while it amused Luzin and at that moment he particularly wanted to anger his young friend. It's your ill luck yesterday that makes you so ill-humored and annoying, blurted out Lebeziatnikov, who in spite of his independence and his protests did not venture to oppose Pyotr Petrovich and still behaved to him with some of the respect habitual in earlier years. You'd better tell me this, Pyotr Petrovich interrupted with haughty displeasure, can you, or rather are you really friendly enough with that? Young person to ask her to step in here for a minute? I think they've all come back from the cemetery. I heard the sound of steps. I want to see her, that young person. What for? Lebeziatnikov asked with surprise. Oh, I want to. I am leaving here today or tomorrow and therefore I wanted to speak to her about. However, you may be present during the interview. It's better you should be, indeed. For there's no knowing what you might imagine. I shan't imagine anything. I only asked and, if you've anything to say to her, nothing is easier than to call her in. I'll go directly, and you may be sure I won't be in your way. Five minutes later, Lebeziatnikov came in with Sonia. She came in very much surprised and overcome with shyness as usual. She was always shy in such circumstances and was always afraid of new people, she had been as a child and was even more so now. Pyotr Petrovich met her politely and affably, but with a certain shade of bantering familiarity which in his opinion was suitable for a man of his respectability and weight in dealing with a creature so young and so interesting as she. He hastened to reassure her and made her sit down facing him at the table. Sonia sat down, looked about her, at Lebeziatnikov, at the notes lying on the table, and then again at Pyotr Petrovich and her eyes remained riveted on him. Lebeziatnikov was moving to the door. Pyotr Petrovich signed to Sonia to remain seated and stop Lebeziatnikov. Is Raskolnikov in there? Has he come? He asked him in a whisper. Raskolnikov? Yes. Why? Yes, he is there. I saw him just come in. Why? Well, I particularly beg you to remain here with us and not to leave me alone with this young woman. I only want a few words with her, but God knows what they may make of it. I shouldn't like Raskolnikov to repeat anything. You understand what I mean? I understand. Lebeziatnikov saw the point. Yes, you are right. Of course, I am convinced personally that you have no reason to be uneasy, but, still, you are right. Certainly, I'll stay. I'll stand here at the window and not be in your way. I think you are right. 
Pyotr Petrovich returned to the sofa, sat down opposite Sonia, looked attentively at her and assumed an extremely dignified, even severe expression, as much as to say, don't you make any mistake, madam. Sonia was overwhelmed with embarrassment. In the first place, Sofia Semyonovna, will you make my excuses to your respected mama? That's right, isn't it? Katerina Ivanovna stands in the place of a mother to you? Pyotr Petrovich began with great dignity, though affably. It was evident that his intentions were friendly. Quite so, yes, the place of a mother, Sonia answered, timidly and hurriedly. Then will you make my apologies to her? Through inevitable circumstances, I am forced to be absent and shall not be at the dinner in spite of your mama's kind invitation. Yes. I'll tell her, at once. And Sonia hastily jumped up from her seat. Wait, that's not all, Pyotr Petrovich detained her, smiling at her simplicity and ignorance of good manners, and you know me little, my dear Sofia Semyonovna, if you suppose I would have ventured to trouble a person like you for a matter of so little consequence affecting myself only. I have another object. Sonia sat down hurriedly. Her eyes rested again for an instant on the gray and rainbow-colored notes that remained on the table, but she quickly looked away and fixed her eyes on Pyotr Petrovich. She felt it horribly indecorous, especially for her, to look at another person's money. She stared at the gold eyeglass which Pyotr Petrovich held in his left hand and at the massive and extremely handsome ring with a yellow stone on his middle finger. But suddenly she looked away and, not knowing where to turn, ended by staring Pyotr Petrovich again straight in the face. After a pause of still greater dignity he continued. I chanced yesterday in passing to exchange a couple of words with Katerina Ivanovna, poor woman. That was sufficient to enable me to ascertain that she is in a position, preternatural, if one may so express it. Yes, preternatural, Sonia hurriedly assented. Or it would be simpler and more comprehensible to say, Illinois. Yes, simpler and more comprehend, yes, Illinois. Quite so. So then from a feeling of humanity, and so to speak compassion, I should be glad to be of service to her in any way, foreseeing her unfortunate position. I believe the whole of this poverty-stricken family depends now entirely on you? Allow me to ask, Sonia rose to her feet, did you say something to her yesterday of the possibility of a pension? Because she told me you had undertaken to get her one. Was that true? Not in the slightest, and indeed it's an absurdity. I merely hinted at her obtaining temporary assistance as the widow of an official who had died in the service, if only she has patronage, but apparently your late parent had not served his full term and had not indeed been in the service at all of late. In fact, if there could be any hope, it would be very ephemeral, because there would be no claim for assistance in that case, far from it. And she is dreaming of a pension already, he he he. A go-ahead lady. Yes, she is. For she is credulous and good-hearted, and she believes everything from the goodness of her heart and, and, and she is like that, yes. You must excuse her, said Sonia, and again she got up to go. But you haven't heard what I have to say. No, I haven't heard, muttered Sonia. Then sit down. She was terribly confused, she sat down again a third time. Seeing her position with her unfortunate little ones, I should be glad, as I have said before, so far as lies in my power, to be of service, that is, so far as is in my power, not more. One might for instance get up a subscription for her, or a lottery, something of the sort, such as is always arranged in such cases by friends or even outsiders desirous of assisting people. It was of that I intended to speak to you, it might be done. Yes, yes. God will repay you for it, faltered Sonia, gazing intently at Pyotr Petrovich. It might be, but we will talk of it later. We might begin it today, we will talk it over this evening and lay the foundation so to speak. Come to me at seven o'clock. Mr. Lebeziatnikov, I hope, will assist us. 
but there is one circumstance of which I ought to warn you beforehand and for which I venture to trouble you, Sofia Semyonovna, to come here. In my opinion money cannot be, indeed it's unsafe to put it into Katerina Ivanovna's own hands. The dinner today is a proof of that. Though she has not, so to speak, a crust of bread for tomorrow and, well, boots or shoes, or anything, she has bought today Jamaica rum and even, I believe, Madeira and, and coffee. I saw it as I passed through. Tomorrow it will all fall upon you again, they won't have a crust of bread. It's absurd, really, and so, to my thinking, a subscription ought to be raised so that the unhappy widow should not know of the money, but only you, for instance. Am I right? I don't know, this is only today, once in her life. She was so anxious to do honor, to celebrate the memory. And she is very sensible, but just as you think and I shall be very, very, they will all be, and God will reward, and the orphans. Sonia burst into tears. Very well, then, keep it in mind, and now will you accept for the benefit of your relation the small sum that I am able to spare, from me personally. I am very anxious that my name should not be mentioned in connection with it. Here, having so to speak anxieties of my own, I cannot do more. And Pyotr Petrovich held out to Sonia a ten-ruble note carefully unfolded. Sonia took it, flushed crimson, jumped up, muttered something and began taking leave. Pyotr Petrovich accompanied her ceremoniously to the door. She got out of the room at last, agitated and distressed, and returned to Katerina Ivanovna, overwhelmed with confusion. All this time Lebeziatnikov had stood at the window or walked about the room, anxious not to interrupt the conversation, when Sonia had gone he walked up to Pyotr Petrovich and solemnly held out his hand. I heard and saw everything, he said, laying stress on the last verb. That is honorable, I mean to say, it's humane. You wanted to avoid gratitude, I saw. And although I cannot, I confess, in principle sympathize with private charity, for it not only fails to eradicate the evil but even promotes it, yet I must admit that I saw your action with pleasure, yes, yes, I like it. That's all nonsense, muttered Pyotr Petrovich, somewhat disconcerted, looking carefully at Lebeziatnikov. No, it's not nonsense. A man who has suffered distress and annoyance as you did yesterday, and who yet can sympathize with the misery of others, such a man, even though he is making a social mistake, is still deserving of respect. I did not expect it indeed of you, Pyotr Petrovich, especially as according to your ideas, oh, what a drawback your ideas are to you. How distressed you are for instance by your ill luck yesterday, cried the simple-hearted Lebeziatnikov, who felt a return of affection for Pyotr Petrovich. And, what do you want with marriage, with legal marriage, my dear, noble Pyotr Petrovich? Why do you cling to this legality of marriage? Well, you may beat me if you like, but I am glad, positively glad it hasn't come off, that you are free, that you are not quite lost for humanity. You see, I've spoken my mind. Because I don't want in your free marriage to be made a fool of and to bring up another man's children, that's why I want legal marriage, Lizen replied in order to make some answer. He seemed preoccupied by something. Children? You referred to children, Lebeziatnikov started off like a warhorse at the trumpet call. Children are a social question and a question of first importance, I agree, but the question of children has another solution. Some refuse to have children altogether, because they suggest the institution of the family. We'll speak of children later, but now as to the question of honor, I confess that's my weak point. That horrid, military, Pushkin expression is unthinkable in the dictionary of the future. What does it mean indeed? It's nonsense, there will be no deception in a free marriage. That is only the natural consequence of a legal marriage, so to say, it's corrective, a protest. So that indeed it's not humiliating, and if I ever, to suppose an absurdity, were to be legally married, I should be positively glad of it. I should say to my wife, my dear, hitherto I have loved you, now I respect you, for you've shown you can protest. 
You laugh. That's because you are incapable of getting away from prejudices. Confound it all. I understand now where the unpleasantness is of being deceived in a legal marriage, but it's simply a despicable consequence of a despicable position in which both are humiliated. When the deception is open, as in a free marriage, then it does not exist, it's unthinkable. Your wife will only prove how she respects you by considering you incapable of opposing her happiness and avenging yourself on her for her new husband. Damn it all! I sometimes dream if I were to be married, pho. I mean if I were to marry, legally or not, it's just the same, I should present my wife with a lover if she had not found one for herself. My dear, I should say, I love you, but even more than that I desire you to respect me. C. Am I not right? Pyotr Petrovich sniggered as he listened, but without much merriment. He hardly heard it indeed. He was preoccupied with something else, and even Lebeziatnikov at last noticed it. Pyotr Petrovich seemed excited and rubbed his hands. Lebeziatnikov remembered all this and reflected upon it afterwards. It would be difficult to explain exactly what could have originated the idea of that senseless dinner in Katerina Ivanovna's disordered brain. Nearly ten of the twenty rubles, given by Raskolnikov for Marmoladov's funeral, were wasted upon it. Possibly Katerina Ivanovna felt obliged to honor the memory of the deceased suitably, that all the lodgers, and still more Amalia Ivanovna, might know that he was in no way their inferior, and perhaps very much their superior and that no one had the right to turn up his nose at him. Perhaps the chief element was that peculiar poor man's pride, which compels many poor people to spend their last savings on some traditional social ceremony, simply in order to do like other people, and not to be looked down upon. It is very probable, too, that Katerina Ivanovna longed on this occasion, at the moment when she seemed to be abandoned by everyone, to show those wretched contemptible lodgers that she knew how to do things, how to entertain and that she had been brought up in a genteel, she might almost say aristocratic colonel's family and had not been meant for sweeping floors and washing the children's rags at night. Even the poorest and most broken-spirited people are sometimes liable to these paroxysms of pride and vanity which take the form of an irresistible nervous craving. And Katerina Ivanovna was not broken-spirited, she might have been killed by circumstance but her spirit could not have been broken, that is, she could not have been intimidated, her will could not be crushed. Moreover, Sonia had said with good reason that her mind was unhinged. She could not be said to be insane, but for a year past she had been so harassed that her mind might well be overstrained. The later stages of consumption are apt, doctors tell us, to affect the intellect. There was no great variety of wines, nor was there Madeira, but wine there was. There was vodka, rum and Lisbon wine, all of the poorest quality, but in sufficient quantity. Besides the traditional rice and honey, there were three or four dishes, one of which consisted of pancakes, all prepared in Amalia Ivanovna's kitchen. Two samovars were boiling, that tea and punch might be offered after dinner. Katerina Ivanovna had herself seen to purchasing the provisions, with the help of one of the lodgers, an unfortunate little Pole who had somehow been stranded at Madame Lipovexel's. He promptly put himself at Katerina Ivanovna's disposal and had been all that morning and all. The day before running about as fast as his legs could carry him, and very anxious that everyone should be aware of it. For every trifle, he ran to Katerina Ivanovna, even hunting her out at the bazaar, at every instant called her Pawnee. She was heartily sick of him before the end, though she had declared at first that she could not have got on without this serviceable and magnanimous man. It was one of Katerina Ivanovna's characteristics to paint everyone she met in the most glowing colors. Her praises were so exaggerated as sometimes to be embarrassing, she would invent various circumstances to the credit of her new acquaintance and quite genuinely believe in the reality. Then all of a sudden she would be disillusioned and would rudely and contemptuously repulse the person she had only a few hours before been literally adoring. 
She was naturally of a gay, lively, and peace-loving disposition, but from continual failures and misfortunes she had come to desire so keenly that all should live in peace and joy and should not dare to break the peace, that the slightest jar, the smallest disaster reduced her almost to frenzy, and she would pass in an instant from the brightest hopes and fancies to cursing her fate and raving, and knocking her head against the wall. Amalia Ivanovna, too, suddenly acquired extraordinary importance in Katerina Ivanovna's eyes and was treated by her with extraordinary respect, probably only because Amalia Ivanovna had thrown herself heart and soul into the preparations. She had undertaken to lay the table, to provide the linen, crockery, etc., and to cook the dishes in her kitchen, and Katerina Ivanovna had left it all in her hands and gone herself to the cemetery. Everything had been well done. Even the tablecloth was nearly clean, the crockery, knives, forks and glasses were, of course, of all shapes and patterns, lent by different lodgers, but the table was properly laid at the time fixed, and Amalia Ivanovna, feeling she had done her work well, had put on a black silk dress and a cap with new morning ribbons and met the returning party with some pride. This pride, though justifiable, displeased Katerina Ivanovna for some reason, as though the table could not have been laid except by Amalia Ivanovna. She disliked the cap with new ribbons, too. Could she be stuck up, the stupid German, because she was mistress of the house, and had consented as a favor to help her poor lodgers? As a favor! Fancy that! Katerina Ivanovna's father who had been a colonel and almost a governor had sometimes had the table set for forty persons, and then anyone like Amalia Ivanovna, or rather Ledwigovna, would not have been allowed into the kitchen. Katerina Ivanovna, however, put off expressing her feelings for the time and contented herself with treating her coldly, though she decided inwardly that she would certainly have to put Amalia Ivanovna down and set her in her proper place, for goodness only knew what she was fancying herself. Katerina Ivanovna was irritated too by the fact that hardly any of the lodgers invited had come to the funeral, except the Pole who had just managed to run into the cemetery, while to the memorial dinner the poorest and most insignificant of them had turned up, the wretched creatures, many of them not quite sober. The older and more respectable of them all, as if by common consent, stayed away. Pyotr Petrovich Lizin, for instance, who might be said to be the most respectable of all the lodgers, did not appear, though Katerina Ivanovna had the evening before told all the world, that is Amalia Ivanovna, Polenka, Sonia, and the Pole, that he was the most generous, noble-hearted man with a large property and vast connections, who had been a friend of her first husband's, and a guest in her father's house, and that he had promised to use all his influence to secure her a considerable pension. It must be noted that when Katerina Ivanovna exalted anyone's connections and fortune, it was without any ulterior motive, quite disinterestedly, for the mere pleasure of adding to the consequence of the person praised. Probably taking his cue from Luzin, that contemptible wretch Lebeziatnikov had not turned up either. What did he fancy himself? He was only asked out of kindness, and because he was sharing the same room with Pyotr Petrovich and was a friend of his, so that it would have been awkward not to invite him. Among those who failed to appear were the genteel lady and her old maidish daughter, who had only been lodgers in the house for the last fortnight, but had several times complained of the noise and uproar in Katerina Ivanovna's room, especially when Marmeladov had come back drunk. Katerina Ivanovna heard this from Amalia Ivanovna who, quarreling with Katerina Ivanovna, and threatening to turn the whole family out of doors, had shouted at her that they were not worth the foot of the honorable lodgers whom they were disturbing. Katerina Ivanovna determined now to invite this lady and her daughter, whose foot she was not worth, and who had turned away haughtily when she casually met them, so that they might know that she was more noble in her thoughts and feelings and did not harbor malice, and might see that she was not accustomed to her way of living. She had proposed to make this clear to them at dinner with allusions to her late father's governorship, and also at the same time to hint that it was exceedingly stupid of them to turn away on meeting her. The fat Colonel Major, he was really a discharged officer of low rank, was also absent, but it appeared that he had been not himself for the last two days. 
The party consisted of the pole, a wretched-looking clerk with a spotty face and a greasy coat, who had not a word to say for himself, and smelt abominably, a deaf and almost blind old man who had once been in the post office and who had been from immemorial ages maintained by someone at Amalia Ivanovna's. A retired clerk of the commissariat department came, too, he was drunk, had a loud and most unseemly laugh and only fancy was without a waistcoat. One of the visitors sat straight down to the table without even greeting Katerina Ivanovna. Finally one person having no suit appeared in his dressing gown, but this was too much, and the efforts of Amalia Ivanovna and the Pole succeeded in removing him. The Pole brought with him, however, two other Poles who did not live at Amalia Ivanovna's and whom no one had seen here before. All this irritated Katerina Ivanovna intensely. For whom had they made all these preparations, then? To make room for the visitors, the children had not even been laid for at the table, but the two little ones were sitting on a bench in the furthest corner with their dinner laid on a box, while Polenka as a big girl had to look after them, feed them, and keep their noses wiped like well-bred children's. Katerina Ivanovna, in fact, could hardly help meeting her guests with increased dignity and even haughtiness. She stared at some of them with special severity and loftily invited them to take their seats. Rushing to the conclusion that Amalia Ivanovna must be responsible for those who were absent, she began treating her with extreme nonchalance, which the latter promptly observed and resented. Such a beginning was no good omen for the end. All were seated at last. Raskolnikov came in almost at the moment of their return from the cemetery. Katerina Ivanovna was greatly delighted to see him, in the first place, because he was the one educated visitor, and, as everyone knew, was in two years to take a professorship in the university, and secondly, because he immediately and respectfully apologized for having been unable to be at the funeral. She positively pounced upon him, and made him sit on her left hand, Amalia Ivanovna was on her right. In spite of her continual anxiety that the dishes should be passed round correctly and that everyone should taste them, in spite of the agonizing cough which interrupted her every minute and seemed to have grown worse during the last few days, she hastened to pour out in a half-whisper to Raskolnikov all her suppressed feelings and her just indignation at the failure of the dinner, interspersing her remarks with lively and uncontrollable laughter at the expense of her visitors and especially of her landlady. It's all that cuckoo's fault. You know whom I mean? Her, her. Katerina Ivanovna nodded towards the landlady. Look at her, she's making round eyes. She feels that we are talking about her and can't understand. Fool, the owl. Ha ha. Cough, cough, cough. And what does she put on that cap for? Cough, cough, cough. Have you noticed that she wants everyone to consider that she is patronizing me and doing me an honor by being here? I asked her like a sensible woman to invite people, especially those who knew my late husband, and look at the set of fools she has brought. The sweeps! Look at that one with the spotty face. And those wretched poles, ha ha ha. Cough, cough, cough. Not one of them has ever poked his nose in here. I've never set eyes on them. What have they come here for, I ask you? There they sit in a row. Hey, Pan, she cried suddenly to one of them, have you tasted the pancakes? Take some more. Have some beer. Won't you have some vodka? Look, he's jumped up and is making his bows, they must be quite starved, poor things. Never mind, let them eat. They don't make a noise, anyway, though I'm really afraid for our landlady's silver spoons. Amalia Ivanovna, she addressed her suddenly, almost aloud, if your spoon should happen to be stolen, I won't be responsible, I warn you. Ha ha ha. She laughed turning to Raskolnikov, and again nodding towards the landlady, in high glee at her sally. She didn't understand, she didn't understand again. Look how she sits with her mouth open. An owl, a real owl. An owl in new ribbons, ha ha ha. Here her laugh turned again to an insufferable fit of coughing that lasted five minutes. 
Drops of perspiration stood out on her forehead and her handkerchief was stained with blood. She showed Raskolnikov the blood in silence, and as soon as she could get her breath began whispering to him again with extreme animation and a hectic flush on her cheeks. Do you know, I gave her the most delicate instructions, so to speak, for inviting that lady and her daughter, you understand of whom I am speaking? It needed the utmost delicacy, the greatest nicety, but she has managed things so that that fool, that conceited baggage, that provincial non-entity, simply because she is the widow of a major, and has come to try and get a pension and to fray out her skirts in the government offices, because at fifty she paints her face, everybody knows it, a creature like that did not think fit to come, and has not even answered the invitation, which the most ordinary good manners required. I can't understand why Pyotr Petrovich has not come. But where's Sonia? Where has she gone? Ah, there she is at last. What is it, Sonia? Where have you been? It's odd that even at your father's funeral you should be so unpunctual. Radion Romanovich, make room for her beside you. That's your place, Sonia, take what you like. Have some of the cold entree with jelly, that's the best. They'll bring the pancakes directly. Have they given the children some? Polenka, have you got everything? Cough, cough, cough. That's all right. Be a good girl, Lita, and, Kolya, don't fidget with your feet, sit like a little gentleman. What are you saying, Sonia? Sonia hastened to give her Pyotr Petrovich's apologies, trying to speak loud enough for everyone to hear and carefully choosing the most respectful phrases which she attributed to Pyotr Petrovich. She added that Pyotr Petrovich had particularly told her to say that, as soon as he possibly could, he would come immediately to discuss business alone with her and to consider what could be done for her, etc., etc. Sonia knew that this would comfort Katerina Ivanovna, would flatter her and gratify her pride. She sat down beside Raskolnikov, she made him a hurried bow, glancing curiously at him. But for the rest of the time she seemed to avoid looking at him or speaking to him. She seemed absent-minded, though she kept looking at Katerina Ivanovna, trying to please her. Neither she nor Katerina Ivanovna had been able to get mourning, Sonia was wearing dark brown, and Katerina Ivanovna had on her only dress, a dark striped cotton one. The message from Pyotr Petrovich was very successful. Listening to Sonia with dignity, Katerina Ivanovna inquired with equal dignity how Pyotr Petrovich was, then at once whispered almost aloud to Raskolnikov that it certainly would have been strange for a man of Pyotr Petrovich's position and standing to find himself in such extraordinary company in spite of his devotion to her family and his old friendship with her father. That's why I am so grateful to you, Radion Romanovich, that you have not disdained my hospitality, even in such surroundings, she added almost aloud. But I am sure that it was only your special affection for my poor husband that has made you keep your promise. Then once more with pride and dignity she scanned her visitors, and suddenly inquired aloud across the table of the deaf man, wouldn't he have some more meat? and had he been given some wine? The old man made no answer and for a long while could not understand what he was asked, though his neighbors amused themselves by poking and shaking him. He simply gazed about him with his mouth open, which only increased the general mirth. What an imbecile! Look, look! Why was he brought? But as to Pyotr Petrovich, I always had confidence in him, Katerina Ivanovna continued, and, of course, he is not like, with an extremely stern face she addressed Amalia Ivanovna so sharply and loudly that the latter was quite disconcerted, not like your dressed-up draggletails whom my father would not have taken as cooks into his kitchen, and my late husband would have done them honor if he had invited them in the goodness of his heart. Yes, he was fond of drink, he was fond of it, he did drink, cried the commissariat clerk, gulping down his twelfth glass of vodka. My late husband certainly had that weakness, and everyone knows it, Katerina Ivanovna attacked him at once, but he was a kind and honorable man, who loved and respected his family. The worst of it was his good nature made him trust all sorts of disreputable people, and he drank with fellows who were not worth the sole of his shoe. Would you believe it, Radion Romanovich, they found a gingerbread cock in his pocket, 
he was dead drunk, but he did not forget the children. A cock? Did you say a cock? shouted the commissariat clerk. Katerina Ivanovna did not vouchsafe a reply. She sighed, lost in thought. No doubt you think, like everyone, that I was too severe with him, she went on, addressing Raskolnikov. But that's not so. He respected me, he respected me very much. He was a kind-hearted man. And how sorry I was for him sometimes. He would sit in a corner and look at me, I used to feel so sorry for him, I used to want to be kind to him and then would think to myself, be kind to him and he will drink again, it was only by severity that you could keep him within bounds. Yes, he used to get his hair pulled pretty often, roared the commissariat clerk again, swallowing another glass of vodka. Some fools would be the better for a good drubbing, as well as having their hair pulled. I am not talking of my late husband now. Katerina Ivanovna snapped at him. The flush on her cheeks grew more and more marked, her chest heaved. In another minute, she would have been ready to make a scene. Many of the visitors were sniggering, evidently delighted. They began poking the commissariat clerk and whispering something to him. They were evidently trying to egg him on. Allow me to ask what are you alluding to, began the clerk, that is to say, who's, about whom, did you say just now? But I don't care. That's nonsense. Widow. I forgive you. Pass. And he took another drink of vodka. Raskolnikov sat in silence, listening with disgust. He only ate from politeness, just tasting the food that Katerina Ivanovna was continually putting on his plate, to avoid hurting her feelings. He watched Sonia intently. But Sonia became more and more anxious and distressed. She, too, foresaw that the dinner would not end peaceably, and saw with terror Katerina Ivanovna's growing irritation. She knew that she, Sonia, was the chief reason for the genteel lady's contemptuous treatment of Katerina Ivanovna's invitation. She had heard from Amalia Ivanovna that the mother was positively offended at the invitation and had asked the question, how could she let her daughter sit down beside that young person? Sonia had a feeling that Katerina Ivanovna had already heard this and an insult to Sonia meant more to Katerina Ivanovna than an insult to herself, her children, or her father. Sonia knew that Katerina Ivanovna would not be satisfied now, till she had shown those draggle tales that they were both, to make matters worse someone passed Sonia, from the other end of the table, a plate with two hearts pierced with an arrow, cut out of black bread. Katerina Ivanovna flushed crimson and at once said aloud across the table that the man who sent it was a drunken ass. Amalia Ivanovna was foreseeing something amiss, and at the same time deeply wounded by Katerina Ivanovna's haughtiness, and to restore the good humor of the company and raise herself in their esteem she began, apropos of nothing, telling a story about an acquaintance of hers Carl from the chemists, who was driving one night in a cab, and that the cabman wanted him to kill and Carl very much begged him not to kill, and wept and clasped hands, and frightened and from fear pierced his heart. Though Katerina Ivanovna smiled, she observed at once that Amalia Ivanovna ought not to tell anecdotes in Russian, the latter was still more offended, and she retorted that her father A.U.S. Berlin was a very important man, and always went with his hands in pockets. Katerina Ivanovna could not restrain herself and laughed so much that Amalia Ivanovna lost patience and could scarcely control herself. Listen to the owl! Katerina Ivanovna whispered at once, her good humor almost restored, she meant to say he kept his hands in his pockets, but she said he put his hands in people's pockets. Cough, cough! And have you noticed, Radion Romanovich, that all these Petersburg foreigners, the... Germans especially, are all stupider than we. Can you fancy any one of us telling how Karl from the chemists pierced his heart from fear and that the idiot, instead of punishing the cabman, clasped his hands and wept, and much begged? Ah, the fool! And you know she fancies it's very touching and does not suspect how stupid she is. To my thinking that drunken commissariat clerk is a great deal cleverer, anyway one can see that he has addled his brains with drink, but you know, these foreigners are always so well-behaved and serious. 
Look how she sits glaring. She is angry, ha ha. Cough, cough, cough. Regaining her good humor, Katerina Ivanovna began at once telling Raskolnikov that when she had obtained her pension, she intended to open a school for the daughters of gentlemen in her native town T. This was the first time she had spoken to him of the project, and she launched out into the most alluring details. It suddenly appeared that Katerina Ivanovna had in her hands the very certificate of honor of which Marmeladov had spoken to Raskolnikov in the tavern when he told him that Katerina Ivanovna, his wife, had danced the shawl dance before the governor and other great personages on leaving school. This certificate of honor was obviously intended now to prove Katerina Ivanovna's right to open a boarding school, but she had armed herself with it chiefly with the object of overwhelming those two stuck-up draggletails if they came to the dinner and proving incontestably that Katerina Ivanovna was of the most noble, she might even say aristocratic family, a colonel's daughter, and was far superior to certain adventuresses who have been so much to the fore of late. The certificate of honor immediately passed into the hands of the drunken guests, and Katerina Ivanovna did not try to retain it, for it actually contained the statement and touts lettre that her father was of the rank of a major, and also a companion of an order, so that she really was almost the daughter of a colonel. Warming up, Katerina Ivanovna proceeded to enlarge on the peaceful and happy life they would lead in tea, on the gymnasium teachers whom she would engage to give lessons in her boarding school, what a most respectable old Frenchman, one man got, who had taught Katerina Ivanovna herself in old days and was still living in tea, and would no doubt teach in her school on moderate terms. Next she spoke of Sonia who would go with her to tea and help her in all her plans. At this, someone at the further end of the table gave a sudden guffaw. Though Katerina Ivanovna tried to appear to be disdainfully unaware of it, she raised her voice and began at once speaking with conviction of Sonia's undoubted ability to assist her, of her gentleness, patience, devotion, generosity and good education, tapping Sonia on the cheek and kissing her warmly twice. Sonia flushed crimson, and Katerina Ivanovna suddenly burst into tears, immediately observing that she was nervous and silly, that she was too much upset, that it was time to finish, and as the dinner was over, it was time to hand round the tea. At that moment, Amalia Ivanovna, deeply aggrieved at taking no part in the conversation and not being listened to, made one last effort, and with secret misgivings ventured on an exceedingly deep and weighty observation that in the future boarding school she would have to pay particular attention to dye wash, and that there certainly must be a good dame to look after the linen, and secondly, that the young ladies must not novels at night read. Katerina Ivanovna, who certainly was upset and very tired, as well as heartily sick of the dinner, at once cut short Amalia Ivanovna, saying she knew nothing about it and was talking nonsense, that it was the business of the laundry maid, and not of the directors of a high-class boarding school to look after dye wash, and as for novel reading, that was simply rudeness, and she begged her to be silent. Amalia Ivanovna fired up and getting angry observed that she only meant her good, and that she had meant her very good, and that it was long since she had paid her gold for the lodgings. Katerina Ivanovna at once set her down, saying that it was a lie to say she wished her good, because only yesterday when her dead husband was lying on the table, she had worried her about the lodgings. To this Amalia Ivanovna very appropriately observed that she had invited those ladies, but those ladies had not come, because those ladies are ladies and cannot come to a lady who is not a lady. Katerina Ivanovna at once pointed out to her, that as she was a slut, she could not judge what made one really a lady. Amalia Ivanovna at once declared that her father A.U.S. Berlin was a very, very important man, and both hands in pockets went, and always used to say, poof, poof, and she leapt up from the table to represent her father, sticking her hands in her pockets, puffing her cheeks, and uttering vague sounds resembling poof. Poof, amid loud laughter from all the lodgers, who purposely encouraged Amalia Ivanovna, hoping for a fight. But this was too much for Katerina Ivanovna, and she at once declared, so that all could hear, that Amalia Ivanovna probably never had a father, but was simply a drunken Petersburg Finn, and had certainly once been a cook and probably something worse. Amalia Ivanovna turned as red as a lobster and squealed that perhaps Katerina Ivanovna never had a father, but she had a father AUS Berlin and that he wore a long coat and always said poof poof poof. 
Katerina Ivanovna observed contemptuously that all knew what her family was and that on that very certificate of honor it was stated in print that her father was a colonel, while Amalia Ivanovna's father, if she really had one, was probably some Finnish milkman, but that probably she never had a father at all, since it was still uncertain whether her name was Amalia Ivanovna or Amalia Ludwigovna. At this Amalia Ivanovna, lashed to fury, struck the table with her fist, and shrieked that she was Amalia Ivanovna, and not Ludwigovna, that her father was named Johan, and that he was a bukomista, and that Katerina Ivanovna's father was quite never a bukomista. Katerina Ivanovna rose from her chair, and with a stern and apparently calm voice, though she was pale and her chest was heaving, observed that if she dared for one moment to set her contemptible wretch of a father on a level with her papa, she, Katerina Ivanovna, would tear her cap off her head and trample it underfoot. Amalia Ivanovna ran about the room, shouting at the top of her voice that she was mistress of the house and that Katerina Ivanovna should leave the lodgings that minute, then she rushed for some reason to collect the silver spoons from the table. There was a great outcry and uproar, the children began crying. Sonia ran to restrain Katerina Ivanovna, but when Amalia Ivanovna shouted something about the yellow ticket, Katerina Ivanovna pushed Sonia away and rushed at the landlady to carry out her threat. At that minute the door opened and Pyotr Petrovich Luzin appeared on the threshold. He stood scanning the party with severe and vigilant eyes. Katerina Ivanovna rushed to him. Pyotr Petrovich, she cried, protect me, you at least. Make this foolish woman understand that she can't behave like this to a lady in misfortune, that there is a law for such things. I'll go to the governor-general himself. She shall answer for it. Remembering my father's hospitality, protect these orphans. Allow me, madam. Allow me. Pyotr Petrovich waved her off. Your papa, as you are well aware, I had not the honor of knowing, someone laughed aloud, and I do not intend to take part in your everlasting squabbles with Amalia Ivanovna. I have come here to speak of my own affairs, and I want to have a word with your stepdaughter, Sophia. Ivanovna, I think it is? Allow me to pass. Pyotr Petrovich, edging by her, went to the opposite corner where Sonia was. Katerina Ivanovna remained standing where she was, as though thunderstruck. She could not understand how Pyotr Petrovich could deny having enjoyed her father's hospitality. Though she had invented it herself, she believed in it firmly by this time. She was struck too by the businesslike, dry and even contemptuous menacing tone of Pyotr Petrovich. All the clamor gradually died away at his entrance. Not only was this serious business man strikingly incongruous with the rest of the party, but it was evident, too, that he had come upon some matter of consequence, that some exceptional cause must have brought him and that therefore something was going to happen. Raskolnikov, standing beside Sonia, moved aside to let him pass. Pyotr Petrovich did not seem to notice him. A minute later Lebeziatnikov, too, appeared in the doorway, he did not come in, but stood still, listening with marked interest, almost wonder, and seemed for a time perplexed. Excuse me for possibly interrupting you, but it's a matter of some importance, Pyotr Petrovich observed, addressing the company generally. I am glad indeed to find other persons present. Amalia Ivanovna, I humbly beg you as mistress of the house to pay careful attention to what I have to say to Sofia Ivanovna. Sofia Ivanovna, he went on, addressing Sonia, who was very much surprised and already alarmed, immediately after your visit I found. That a hundred-ruble note was missing from my table, in the room of my friend, Mr. Lebeziatnikov. If in any way whatever you know and will tell us where it is now, I assure you on my word of honor and call all present to witness that the matter shall end there. In the opposite case I shall be compelled to have recourse to very serious measures, and then, you must blame yourself. Complete silence reigned in the room. Even the crying children were still. Sonia stood deadly pale, staring at Luzin and unable to say a word. She seemed not to understand. Some seconds passed. Well, how is it to be then? asked Luzin, looking intently at her. I don't know. 
I know nothing about it, Sonia articulated faintly at last. No, you know nothing? Luzin repeated and again he paused for some seconds. Think a moment, mademoiselle, he began severely, but still, as it were, admonishing her. Reflect, I am prepared to give you time for consideration. Kindly observe this, if I were not so entirely convinced I should not, you may be sure, with my experience venture to accuse you so directly. Seeing that, for such direct accusation before witnesses, if false or even mistaken, I should myself in a certain sense be made responsible, I am aware of that. This morning I changed for my own purposes several 5% securities for the sum of approximately 3,000 rubles. The account is noted down in my pocketbook. On my return home I proceeded to count the money, as Mr. Lebeziatnikov will bear witness, and after counting 2,300 rubles I put the rest in my pocketbook in my coat pocket. About 500 rubles remained on the table and among them three notes of 100 rubles each. At that moment you entered, at my invitation, and all the time you were present you were exceedingly embarrassed, so that three times you jumped up in the middle of the conversation and tried to make off. Mr. Lebeziatnikov can bear witness to this. You yourself, mademoiselle, probably will not refuse to confirm my statement that I invited you through Mr. Lebeziatnikov solely in order to discuss with you the hopeless and destitute position of your relative, Katerina Ivanovna whose dinner I was unable to attend, and the advisability of getting up something of the nature of a subscription, lottery, or the like, for her benefit. You thanked me, and even shed tears. I describe all this as it took place, primarily to recall it to your mind, and secondly, to show you that not the slightest detail has escaped my recollection. Then I took a ten-ruble note from the table and handed it to you by way of first installment on my part for the benefit of your relative. Mr. Lebeziatnikov saw all this. Then I accompanied you to the door, you being still in the same state of embarrassment, after which, being left alone with Mr. Lebeziatnikov I talked to him for ten minutes, then Mr. Lebeziatnikov went out and I returned to the table with the money lying on it, intending to count it and to put it aside, as I proposed doing before. To my surprise one hundred ruble note had disappeared. Kindly consider the position. Mr. Lebeziatnikov, I cannot suspect. I am ashamed to allude to such a supposition. I cannot have made a mistake in my reckoning, for the minute before your entrance I had finished my accounts and found the total correct. You will admit that recollecting your embarrassment, your eagerness to get away and the fact that you kept your hands for some time on the table, and taking into consideration your social position and the habits associated with it, I was, so to say, with horror and positively against my will, compelled to entertain a suspicion, a cruel, but justifiable suspicion. I will add further and repeat that in spite of my positive conviction, I realize that I run a certain risk in making this accusation, but as you see, I could not let it pass. I have taken action, and I will tell you why, solely, madam, solely, owing to your black ingratitude. Why? I invite you for the benefit of your destitute relative, I present you with my donation of ten rubles and you, on the spot, repay me for all that with such an action. It is too bad. You need a lesson. Reflect. Moreover, like a true friend I beg you, and you could have no better friend at this moment, think what you are doing, otherwise I shall be immovable. Well, what do you say? I have taken nothing, Sonia whispered in terror, you gave me ten rubles, here it is, take it. Sonia pulled her handkerchief out of her pocket, untied a corner of it, took out the ten ruble note and gave it to Luzin. And the hundred rubles you do not confess to taking? He insisted reproachfully, not taking the note. Sonia looked about her. All were looking at her with such awful, stern, ironical, hostile eyes. She looked at Raskolnikov, he stood against the wall, with his arms crossed, looking at her with glowing eyes. Good God, broke from Sonia. Amalia Ivanovna, we shall have to send word to the police and therefore I humbly beg you meanwhile to send for the house porter, Lizen said softly and even kindly. Got der Barmherzige. I knew she was the thief, 
cried Amalia Ivanovna, throwing up her hands. You knew it? Luzin caught her up. Then I suppose you had some reason before this for thinking so. I beg you, worthy Amalia Ivanovna, to remember your words which have been uttered before witnesses. There was a buzz of loud conversation on all sides. All were in movement. What? cried Katerina Ivanovna, suddenly realizing the position, and she rushed at Lizin. What? You accuse her of stealing? Sonia? Ah, the wretches, the wretches! And running to Sonia, she flung her wasted arms round her and held her as in a vice. Sonia! How dared you take ten rubles from him? Foolish girl! Give it to me! Give me the ten rubles at once, here! And snatching the note from Sonia, Katerina Ivanovna crumpled it up and flung it straight into Luzin's face. It hit him in the eye and fell on the ground. Amalia Ivanovna hastened to pick it up. Pyotr Petrovich lost his temper. Hold that mad woman, he shouted. At that moment, several other persons, besides Lebeziatnikov, appeared in the doorway, among them the two ladies. What? Mad? Am I mad? Idiot, shrieked Katerina Ivanovna. You are an idiot yourself, pettifogging lawyer, base man. Sonia, Sonia, take his money. Sonia, a thief. Why, she'd give away her last penny and Katerina Ivanovna broke into hysterical laughter. Did you ever see such an idiot? She turned from side to side. And you too? She suddenly saw the landlady. And you too, sausage eater? You declare that she is a thief, you trashy Prussian hen's leg in a crinoline. She hasn't been out of this room. She came straight from you, you wretch, and sat down beside me. Everyone saw her. She sat here, by Rodion Romanovich. Search her. Since she's not left the room, the money would have to be on her. Search her, search her. But if you don't find it, then excuse me, my dear fellow, you'll answer for it. I'll go to our sovereign, to our sovereign, to our gracious Tsar himself, and throw myself at his feet, today, this minute. I am alone in the world. They would let me in. Do you think they wouldn't? You're wrong. I will get in. I will get in. You reckoned on her meekness. You relied upon that. But I am not so submissive, let me tell you. You've gone too far yourself. Search her, search her. And Katerina Ivanovna, in a frenzy, shook Lizin and dragged him toward Sonia. I am ready. I'll be responsible. But calm yourself, madam, calm yourself. I see that you are not so submissive. Well, well, but as to that, Luzin. Muttered, that ought to be before the police, though indeed there are witnesses enough as it is. I am ready. But in any case it's difficult for a man, on account of her sex. But with the help of Amalia Ivanovna, though, of course, it's not the way to do things. How is it to be done? As you will. Let anyone who likes search her, cried Katerina Ivanovna. Sonia, turn out your pockets. See. Look, monster, the pocket is empty. Here was her handkerchief. Here is the other pocket. Look. Juicy, juicy. And Katerina Ivanovna turned, or rather snatched, both pockets inside out. But from the right pocket a piece of paper flew out and describing a parabola in the air fell at Lizin's feet. Everyone saw it, several cried out. Pyotr Petrovich stooped down, picked up the paper in two fingers, lifted it where all could see it and opened it. It was a hundred-ruble note folded in eight. Pyotr Petrovich held up the note showing it to everyone. Thief! Out of my lodging! Police, police, yelled Amalia Ivanovna. They must to Siberia be sent. Away! 
Exclamations arose on all sides. Raskolnikov was silent, keeping his eyes fixed on Sonia, except for an occasional rapid glance at Luzin. Sonia stood still, as though unconscious. She was hardly able to feel surprise. Suddenly the color rushed to her cheeks, she uttered a cry and hid her face in her hands. No, it wasn't I. I didn't take it. I know nothing about it, she cried with a heartrending wail, and she ran to Katerina Ivanovna, who clasped her tightly in her arms, as though she would shelter her from all the world. Sonia! Sonia! I don't believe it! You see, I don't believe it, she cried in the face of the obvious fact, swaying her to and fro in her arms like a baby, kissing her face continually, then snatching at her hands and kissing them, too, you took it. How stupid these people are! Oh dear! You are fools, fools, she cried, addressing the whole room, you don't know, you don't know what a heart she has, what a girl she is. She take it, she? She'd sell her last rag, she'd go barefoot to help you if you needed it, that's what she is. She has the yellow passport because my children were starving, she sold herself for us. Ah, husband, husband. Do you see? Do you see? What a memorial dinner for you. Merciful heavens. Defend her, why are you all standing still? Radayan Romanovich, why don't you stand up for her? Do you believe it, too? You are not worth her little finger, all of you together. Good God! Defend her now, at least. The wail of the poor, consumptive, helpless woman seemed to produce a great effect on her audience. The agonized, wasted, consumptive face, the parched blood-stained lips, the hoarse voice, the tears unrestrained as a child's, the trustful, childish and yet despairing prayer for help were so. Piteous that everyone seemed to feel for her. Pyotr Petrovich at any rate was at once moved to compassion. Madam, madam, this incident does not reflect upon you, he cried impressively, no one would take upon himself to accuse you of being an instigator or even an accomplice in it, especially as you have proved her guilt by turning out her pockets, showing that you had no previous idea of it. I am most ready, most ready to show compassion, if poverty, so to speak, drove Sofia Semyonovna to it, but why did you refuse to confess, mademoiselle? Were you afraid of the disgrace? The first step? You lost your head, perhaps? One can quite understand it. But how could you have lowered yourself to such an action? Gentlemen, he addressed the whole company, gentlemen. Compassionate and, so to say, commiserating these people, I am ready to overlook it even now in spite of the personal insult lavished upon me. And may this disgrace be a lesson to you for the future, he said, addressing Sonia, and I will carry the matter no further. Enough! Pyotr Petrovich stole a glance at Raskolnikov. Their eyes met, and the fire in Raskolnikov's seemed ready to reduce him to ashes. Meanwhile, Katerina Ivanovna apparently heard nothing. She was kissing and hugging Sonia like a madwoman. The children, too, were embracing Sonia on all sides, and Polenka, though she did not fully understand what was wrong, was drowned in tears and shaking with sobs, as she hid her pretty little face, swollen with weeping, on Sonia's shoulder. How vile! A loud voice cried suddenly in the doorway. Pyotr Petrovich looked round quickly. What vileness! Lebeziatnikov repeated, staring him straight in the face. Pyotr Petrovich gave a positive start, all noticed it and recalled it afterwards. Lebeziatnikov strode into the room. And you dared to call me as witness, he said, going up to Pyotr Petrovich. What do you mean? What are you talking about, muttered Lucin. I mean that you are a slanderer, that's what my words mean. Lebeziatnikov said hotly, looking sternly at him with his short-sighted eyes. He was extremely angry. Raskolnikov gazed intently at him, as though seizing and weighing each word. 
Again, there was a silence. Pyotr Petrovich indeed seemed almost dumbfounded for the first moment. If you mean that for me, he began, stammering. But what's the matter with you? Are you out of your mind? I'm in my mind, but you are a scoundrel. Ah, how vile! I have heard everything. I kept waiting on purpose to understand it, for I must own even now it is not quite logical. What you have done at all for I can't understand. Why, what have I done then? Give over talking in your nonsensical riddles. Or maybe you are drunk. You may be a drunkard, perhaps, vile man, but I am not. I never touch vodka, for it's against my convictions. Would you believe it, he, he himself, with his own hands gave Sofia Semyonovna that hundred-ruble note, I saw it, I was a witness, I'll take my oath. He did it, he, repeated Lebeziatnikov, addressing all. Are you crazy, milksop, squealed Luzin. She is herself before you, she herself here declared just now, before everyone that I gave her only ten rubles. How could I have given it to her? I saw it, I saw it, Lebeziadnikov repeated, and though it is against my principles, I am ready this very minute to take any oath you like before the court, for I saw how you slipped it in her pocket. Only like a fool, I thought you did it out of kindness. When you were saying goodbye to her at the door, while you held her hand in one hand, with the other, the left, you slipped the note into her pocket. I saw it, I saw it. Luzin turned pale. What lies, he cried impudently, why, how could you, standing by the window, see the note? You fancied it with your short-sighted eyes. You are raving. No, I didn't fancy it. And though I was standing some way off, I saw it all. And though it certainly would be hard to distinguish a note from the window, that's true, I knew for certain that it was a hundred-ruble note, because, when you were going to give Sofia Semyonovna ten rubles, you took up from the table a hundred-ruble note, I saw it because I was standing near then, and an idea struck me at once, so that I did not forget you had it in your hand. You folded it and kept it in your hand all the time. I didn't think of it again until, when you were getting up, you changed it from your right hand to your left and nearly dropped it. I noticed it because the same idea struck me again, that you meant to do her a kindness without my seeing. You can fancy how I watched you and I saw how you succeeded in slipping it into her pocket. I saw it, I saw it, I'll take my oath. Lebeziatnikov was almost breathless. Exclamations arose on all hands chiefly expressive of wonder, but some were menacing in tone. They all crowded round Pyotr Petrovich. Katerina Ivanovna flew to Lebeziatnikov. I was mistaken in you. Protect her. You are the only one to take her part. She is an orphan. God has sent you. Katerina Ivanovna, hardly knowing what she was doing, sank on her knees before him. A pack of nonsense, yelled Luzin, roused to fury, it's all nonsense you've been talking. An idea struck you, you didn't think, you noticed, what does it amount to? So I gave it to her on the sly on purpose? What for? With what object? What have I to do with this? What for? That's what I can't understand, but that what I am telling you is the fact, that's certain. So far from my being mistaken, you infamous criminal man, I remember how, on account of it, a question occurred to me at once, just when I was thanking you and pressing your hand. What made you put it secretly in her pocket? Why you did it secretly, I mean? Could it be simply to conceal it from me, knowing that my convictions are opposed to yours and that I do not approve of private benevolence, which affects no radical cure? Well, I decided that you really were ashamed of giving such a large sum before me. Perhaps, too, I thought, he wants to give her a surprise when she finds a whole hundred-ruble note in her pocket. For I know, some benevolent people are very fond of decking out their charitable actions in that way. Then the idea struck me, too, that you wanted to test her, to see whether, when she found it, 
she would come to thank you. Then, too, that you wanted to avoid thanks and that, as the saying is, your right hand should not know, something of that sort, in fact. I thought of so many possibilities that I put off considering it, but still thought it indelicate to show you that I knew your secret. But another idea struck me again that Sofia Semyonovna might easily lose the money before she noticed it, that was why I decided to come in here to call her out of the room and to tell her that you put a hundred rubles in her pocket. But on my way, I went first to Madame Kobolatnikov's to take them the general treatise on the positive method and especially to recommend Pitteret's article, and also Wagner's, then I come on here and what a state of things I find. Now could I, could I, have all these ideas and reflections if I had not seen you put the hundred-ruble note in her pocket? When Lebeziatnikov finished his long-winded harangue with the logical deduction at the end, he was quite tired, and the perspiration streamed from his face. He could not, alas, even express himself correctly in Russian, though. He knew no other language, so that he was quite exhausted, almost emaciated after this heroic exploit but his speech produced a powerful effect. He had spoken with such vehemence, with such conviction that everyone obviously believed him. Pyotr Petrovich felt that things were going badly with him. What is it to do with me if silly ideas did occur to you? He shouted, that's no evidence. You may have dreamt it, that's all. And I tell you, you are lying, sir. You are lying and slandering from some spite against me, simply from pique, because I did not agree with your free-thinking, godless, social propositions. But this retort did not benefit Pyotr Petrovich. Murmurs of disapproval were heard on all sides. Ah, that's your mind now, is it? cried Lebeziatnikov, that's nonsense. Call the police, and I'll take my oath. There's only one thing I can't understand. What made him risk such a contemptible action? Oh, pitiful, despicable man! I can explain why he risked such an action, and if necessary, I, too, will swear to it, Raskolnikov said at last in a firm voice, and he stepped forward. He appeared to be firm and composed. Everyone felt clearly, from the very look of him, that he really knew about it and that the mystery would be solved. Now I can explain it all to myself, said Raskolnikov, addressing Lebeziatnikov. From the very beginning of the business, I suspected that there was some scoundrelly intrigue at the bottom of it. I began to suspect it from some special circumstances known to me only, which I will explain at once to everyone, they account for everything. Your valuable evidence has finally made everything clear to me. I beg all, all to listen. This gentleman, he pointed to Luzin, was recently engaged to be married to a young lady, my sister, Avdosha Romanovna Raskolnikov. But coming to Petersburg, he quarreled with me, the day before yesterday, at our first meeting, and I drove him out of my room, I have two witnesses to prove it. He is a very spiteful man. The day before yesterday, I did not know that he was staying here, in your room, and that consequently on the very day we quarreled, the day before yesterday, he saw me give Katerina Ivanovna some money for the funeral, as a friend of the late Mr. Marmoladov. He at once wrote a note to my mother and informed her that I had given away all my money, not to Katerina Ivanovna but to Sofia Semyonovna, and referred in a most contemptible way to the character of Sofia Semyonovna, that is, hinted at the character of my attitude to Sofia Semyonovna. All this you understand was with the object of dividing me from my mother and sister, by insinuating that I was squandering on unworthy objects the money which they had sent me, and which was all they had. Yesterday evening, before my mother and sister and in his presence, I declared that I had given the money to Katerina Ivanovna for the funeral and not to Sofia Semyonovna, and that I had no acquaintance with Sofia Semyonovna and had never seen her before, indeed. At the same time I added that he, Pyotr Petrovich Lizin, with all his virtues, was not worth Sofia Semyonovna's little finger, though he spoke so ill of her. To his question, would I let Sofia Semyonovna sit down beside my sister, I answered that I had already done so that day. Irritated that my mother and sister were unwilling to quarrel with me at his insinuations, he gradually began being unpardonably rude to them. A final rupture took place, and he was turned out of the house. 
All this happened yesterday evening. Now I beg your special attention, consider, if he had now succeeded in proving that Sofia Semyonovna was a thief, he would have shown to my mother and sister that he was almost right in his suspicions, that he had reason to be angry at my putting my sister on a level with Sofia Semyonovna, that, in attacking me, he was protecting and preserving the honor of my sister, his betrothed. In fact he might even, through all this, have been able to estrange me from my family, and no doubt he hoped to be restored to favor with them, to say nothing of revenging himself on me personally, for he has grounds for supposing that the honor and happiness of Sofia Semyonovna are very precious to me. That was what he was working for. That's how I understand it. That's the whole reason for it, and there can be no other. It was like this, or somewhat like this, that Raskolnikov wound up his speech which was followed very attentively, though often interrupted by exclamations from his audience. But in spite of interruptions he spoke clearly, calmly, exactly, firmly. His decisive voice, his tone of conviction and his stern face made a great impression on everyone. Yes, yes, that's it, Lebeziadnikov assented gleefully, that must be it, for he asked me, as soon as Sofia Semyonovna came into our room, whether you were here, whether I had seen you among Katerina Ivanovna's guests. He called me aside to the window and asked me in secret. It was essential for him that you should be here. That's it, that's it. Luzin smiled contemptuously and did not speak but he was very pale. He seemed to be deliberating on some means of escape. Perhaps he would have been glad to give up everything and get away, but at the moment this was scarcely possible. It would have implied admitting the truth of the accusations brought against him. Moreover, the company, which had already been excited by drink, was now too much stirred to allow it. The commissariat clerk, though indeed he had not grasped the whole position, was shouting louder than anyone and was making some suggestions very unpleasant to listen. But not all those present were drunk, lodgers came in from all the rooms. The three Poles were tremendously excited and were continually shouting at him, the pan is a latchdack, and muttering threats in Polish. Sonia had been listening with strained attention, though she too seemed unable to grasp it all. She seemed as though she had just returned to consciousness. She did not take her eyes off Raskolnikov, feeling that all her safety lay in him. Katerina Ivanovna breathed hard and painfully and seemed fearfully exhausted. Amalia Ivanovna stood looking more stupid than anyone, with her mouth wide open, unable to make out what had happened. She only saw that Pyotr Petrovich had somehow come to grief. Raskolnikov was attempting to speak again, but they did not let him. Everyone was crowding round Luzin with threats and shouts of abuse. But Pyotr Petrovich was not intimidated. Seeing that his accusation of Sonia had completely failed, he had recourse to insolence. Allow me, gentlemen, allow me. Don't squeeze, let me pass, he said, making his way through the crowd and no threats, if you please. I assure you it will be useless, you will gain nothing by it. On the contrary, you'll have to answer, gentlemen, for violently obstructing the course of justice. The thief has been more than unmasked, and I shall prosecute. Our judges are not so blind and not so drunk, and will not believe the testimony of two notorious infidels, agitators, and atheists, who accuse me from motives of personal revenge which they are foolish enough to admit. Yes, allow me to pass. Don't let me find a trace of you in my room. Kindly leave at once, and everything is at an end between us. When I think of the trouble I've been taking, the way I've been expounding, all this fortnight. I told you myself today that I was going, when you tried to keep me, now I will simply add that you are a fool. I advise you to see a doctor for your brains and your short sight. Let me pass, gentlemen. He forced his way through. But the commissariat clerk was unwilling to let him off so easily, he picked up a glass from the table, brandished it in the air and flung it at Pyotr Petrovich, but the glass flew straight at Amalia Ivanovna. She screamed, and the clerk, overbalancing, fell heavily under the table. 
Pyotr Petrovich made his way to his room and half an hour later had left the house. Sonia, timid by nature, had felt before that day that she could be ill-treated more easily than anyone, and that she could be wronged with impunity. Yet, till that moment she had fancied that she might escape misfortune by care, gentleness and submissiveness before everyone. Her disappointment was too great. She could, of course, bear with patience and almost without murmur anything, even this. But for the first minute, she felt it too bitter. In spite of her triumph and her justification, when her first terror and stupefaction had passed and she could understand it all clearly, the feeling of her helplessness and of the wrong done to her made her heart throb with anguish and she was overcome with hysterical weeping. At last, unable to bear any more, she rushed out of the room and ran home almost immediately after Lizan's departure. When amidst loud laughter the glass flew at Amalia Ivanovna, it was more than the landlady could endure. With a shriek she rushed like a fury at Katerina Ivanovna, considering her to blame for everything. Out of my lodgings! At once! Quick march! And with these words she began snatching up everything she could lay her hands on that belonged to Katerina Ivanovna, and throwing it on the floor. Katerina Ivanovna, pale, almost fainting, and gasping for breath, jumped up from the bed where she had sunk in exhaustion and darted at Amalia Ivanovna. But the battle was too unequal, the landlady waved her away like a feather. What? As though that godless calumny was not enough, this vile creature attacks me. What? On the day of my husband's funeral I am turned out of my lodging. After eating my bread and salt, she turns me into the street, with my orphans. Where am I to go, wailed the poor woman, sobbing and gasping. Good God, she cried with flashing eyes, is there no justice upon earth? Whom should you protect if not us orphans? We shall see. There is law and justice on earth, there is, I will find it. Wait a bit, godless creature. Polenka, stay with the children, I'll come back. Wait for me, if you have to wait in the street. We will see whether there is justice on earth. And throwing over her head that green shawl which Marmeladov had mentioned to Raskolnikov, Katerina Ivanovna squeezed her way through the disorderly and drunken crowd of lodgers who still filled the room, and, wailing and tearful, she ran into the street, with a vague intention of going at once somewhere to find justice. Polenka with the two little ones in her arms crouched, terrified, on the trunk in the corner of the room, where she waited trembling for her mother to come back. Amalia Ivanovna raged about the room, shrieking, lamenting and throwing everything she came across on the floor. The lodgers talked incoherently, some commented to the best of their ability on what had happened, others quarreled and swore at one another, while others struck up a song. Now it's time for me to go, thought Raskolnikov. Well, Sofia Semyonovna, we shall see what you'll say now. And he set off in the direction of Sonia's lodgings. Raskolnikov had been a vigorous and active champion of Sonia against Lucin, although he had such a load of horror and anguish in his own heart. But having gone through so much in the morning, he found a sort of relief and a change of sensations, apart from the strong personal feeling which impelled him to defend Sonia. He was agitated too, especially at some moments, by the thought of his approaching interview with Sonia, he had to tell her who had killed Lizaveta. He knew the terrible suffering it would be to him and, as it were, brushed away the thought of it. So when he cried as he left Katerina Ivanovna's, well, Sofia Semyonovna, we shall see what you'll say now, he was still superficially excited, still vigorous and defiant from his triumph over Luzin. But, strange to say, by the time he reached Sonia's lodging, he felt a sudden impotence and fear. He stood still in hesitation at the door, asking himself the strange question, lest he tell her who killed Lizavida? It was a strange question because he felt at the very time not only that he could not help telling her, but also that he could not put off the telling. He did not yet know why it must be so, he only felt it, and the agonizing sense of his impotence before the inevitable almost crushed him. 
To cut short his hesitation and suffering, he quickly opened the door and looked at Sonia from the doorway. She was sitting with her elbows on the table and her face in her hands, but seeing Raskolnikov she got up at once and came to meet him as though she were expecting him. What would have become of me but for you? She said quickly, meeting him in the middle of the room. Evidently she was in haste to say this to him. It was what she had been waiting for. Raskolnikov went to the table and sat down on the chair from which she had only just risen. She stood facing him, two steps away, just as she had done the day before. Well, Sonia, he said, and felt that his voice was trembling, it was all due to your social position and the habits associated with it. Did you understand that just now? Her face showed her distress. Only don't talk to me as you did yesterday, she interrupted him. Please don't begin it. There is misery enough without that. She made haste to smile, afraid that he might not like the reproach. I was silly to come away from there. What is happening there now? I wanted to go back directly, but I kept thinking that you would come. He told her that Amalia Ivanovna was turning them out of their lodging and that Katerina Ivanovna had run off somewhere to seek justice. My God, cried Sonia, let's go at once. And she snatched up her cape. It's everlastingly the same thing, said Raskolnikov irritably. You've no thought except for them. Stay a little with me. But... Katerina Ivanovna? You won't lose Katerina Ivanovna, you may be sure. She'll come to you herself since she has run out, he added peevishly. If she doesn't find you here, you'll be blamed for it. Sonia sat down in painful suspense. Raskolnikov was silent, gazing at the floor and deliberating. This time Luzin did not want to prosecute you, he began, not looking at Sonia, but if he had wanted to, if it had suited his plans, he would have sent you to prison if it had not been for Lebeziatnikov and me. Ah! Oh. Yes, she assented in a faint voice. Yes, she repeated, preoccupied and distressed. But I might easily not have been there. And it was quite an accident Lubiziatnikov's turning up. Sonia was silent. And if you'd gone to prison, what then? Do you remember what I said yesterday? Again she did not answer. He waited. I thought you would cry out again, don't speak of it, leave off. Raskolnikov gave a laugh, but rather a forced one. What, silence again, he asked a minute later. We must talk about something, you know. It would be interesting for me to know how you would decide a certain problem as Lebeziatnikov would say. He was beginning to lose the thread. No, really, I am serious. Imagine, Sonia, that you had known all Luzin's intentions beforehand. Known, that is, for a fact, that they would be the ruin of Katerina Ivanovna and the children and yourself thrown in, since you don't count yourself for anything, Polenka. Two, for she'll go the same way. Well, if suddenly it all depended on your decision whether he or they should go on living, that is whether Lizin should go on living and doing wicked things, or Katerina Ivanovna should die. How would you decide which of them was to die? I ask you. Sonia looked uneasily at him. There was something peculiar in this hesitating question, which seemed approaching something in a roundabout way. I felt that you were going to ask some question like that, she said, looking inquisitively at him. I dare say you did. But how is it to be answered? Why do you ask about what could not happen, said Sonia reluctantly. Then it would be better for Luzin to go on living and doing wicked things? You haven't dared to decide even that. But I can't know the divine providence. And why do you ask what can't be answered? What's the use of such foolish questions? How could it happen that it should depend on my decision, who has made me a judge to decide who is to live and who is not to live? Oh, if the divine providence is to be mixed up in it, there is no doing anything, Raskolnikov grumbled morosely. 
You'd better say straight out what you want. Sonia cried in distress. You are leading up to something again. Can you have come simply to torture me? She could not control herself and began crying bitterly. He looked at her in gloomy misery. Five minutes passed. Of course you're right, Sonia, he said softly at last. He was suddenly changed. His tone of assumed arrogance and helpless defiance was gone. Even his voice was suddenly weak. I told you yesterday that I was not coming to ask forgiveness and almost the first thing I've said is to ask forgiveness. I said that about Luzin and Providence for my own sake. I was asking forgiveness, Sonia. He tried to smile, but there was something helpless and incomplete in his pale smile. He bowed his head and hid his face in his hands. And suddenly a strange, surprising sensation of a sort of bitter hatred for Sonia passed through his heart. As they were wondering and frightened of this sensation, he raised his head and looked intently at her, but he met her uneasy and painfully anxious eyes fixed on him, there was love in them, his hatred. Vanished like a phantom. It was not the real feeling, he had taken the one feeling for the other. It only meant that that minute had come. He hid his face in his hands again and bowed his head. Suddenly he turned pale, got up from his chair, looked at Sonia, and without uttering a word sat down mechanically on her bed. His sensations that moment were terribly like the moment when he had stood over the old woman with the axe in his hand and felt that he must not lose another minute. What's the matter? asked Sonia, dreadfully frightened. He could not utter a word. This was not at all, not at all the way he had intended to tell, and he did not understand what was happening to him now. She went up to him, softly, sat down on the bed beside him and waited, not taking her eyes off him. Her heart throbbed and sank. It was unendurable, he turned his deadly pale face to her. His lips worked, helplessly struggling to utter something. A pang of terror passed through Sonia's heart. What's the matter? she repeated, drawing a little away from him. Nothing, Sonia, don't be frightened. It's nonsense. It really is nonsense, if you think of it, he muttered, like a man in delirium. Why have I come to torture you? he added suddenly, looking at her. Why, really? I keep asking myself that question, Sonia. He had perhaps been asking himself that question a quarter of an hour before, but now he spoke helplessly, hardly knowing what he said and feeling a continual tremor all over. Oh, how you are suffering, she muttered in distress, looking intently at him. It's all nonsense. Listen, Sonia. He suddenly smiled, a pale helpless smile, for two seconds. You remember what I meant to tell you yesterday? Sonia waited uneasily. I said as I went away that perhaps I was saying goodbye forever, but that if I came today, I would tell you who, who killed Lizavita. She began trembling all over. Well, here I've come to tell you. Then you really meant it yesterday? She whispered with difficulty. How do you know? She asked quickly, as though suddenly regaining her reason. Sonia's face grew paler and paler, and she breathed painfully. I know. She paused a minute. Have they found him? She asked timidly. No. Then how do you know about it? She asked again, hardly audibly, and again after a minute's pause. He turned to her and looked very intently at her. Guess, he said, with the same distorted helpless smile. A shudder passed over her. But you, why do you frighten me like this? She said, smiling like a child. I must be a great friend of his, since I know, Raskolnikov went on, still gazing into her face, as though he could not turn his eyes away. He did not mean to kill that Lizavita, he killed her accidentally. He meant to kill the old woman when she was alone and he went there, and then Lizavita came in, he killed her too. Another awful moment passed. 
both still gazed at one another. You can't guess, then, he asked suddenly, feeling as though he were flinging himself down from a steeple. And no, whispered Sonia. Take a good look. As soon as he had said this again, the same familiar sensation froze his heart. He looked at her and all at once seemed to see in her face the face of Lizavita. He remembered clearly the expression in Lizavita's face when he approached her with the axe and she stepped back to the wall, putting out her hand, with childish terror in her face, looking as little children do when they begin to be frightened of something, looking intently and uneasily at what frightens them, shrinking back and holding out their little hands on the point of crying. Almost the same thing happened now to Sonia. With the same helplessness and the same terror, she looked at him for a while and, suddenly putting out her left hand, pressed her fingers faintly against his breast and slowly began to get up from the bed, moving further from him and keeping her eyes fixed even more immovably on him. Her terror infected him. The same fear showed itself on his face. In the same way he stared at her and almost with the same childish smile. Have you guessed? he whispered at last. Good God, broke in an awful wail from her bosom. She sank helplessly on the bed with her face in the pillows, but a moment later she got up, moved quickly to him, seized both his hands and, gripping them tight in her thin fingers, began looking into his face again with the same intent stare. In this last desperate look she tried to look into him and catch some last hope. But there was no hope, there was no doubt remaining, it was all true. Later on, indeed, when she recalled that moment, she thought it strange and wondered why she had seen at once that there was no doubt. She could not have said, for instance, that she had foreseen something of the sort, and yet now, as soon as he told her, she suddenly fancied that she had really foreseen this very thing. Stop, Sonia, enough! Don't torture me, he begged her miserably. It was not at all, not at all like this, he had thought of telling her, but this is how it happened. She jumped up, seeming not to know what she was doing, and, wringing her hands, walked into the middle of the room, but quickly went back and sat down again beside him, her shoulder almost touching his. All of a sudden she started as though she had been stabbed, uttered a cry and fell on her knees before him, she did not know why. What have you done, what have you done to yourself, she said in despair, and, jumping up, she flung herself on his neck, threw her arms round him, and held him tightly. Raskolnikov drew back and looked at her with a mournful smile. You are a strange girl, Sonia, you kiss me and hug me when I tell you about that. You don't think what you are doing. There is no one, no one in the whole world now so unhappy as you, she cried in a frenzy, not hearing what he said, and she suddenly broke into violent hysterical weeping. A feeling long unfamiliar to him flooded his heart and softened it at once. He did not struggle against it. Two tears started into his eyes and hung on his eyelashes. Then you won't leave me, Sonia, he said, looking at her almost with hope. No, no, never, nowhere, cried Sonia. I will follow you, I will follow you everywhere. Oh, my God! Oh, how miserable I am! Why, why didn't I know you before? Why didn't you come before? Oh, dear! Here I have come. Yes, now. What's to be done now? Together, together, she repeated as it were unconsciously, and she hugged him again. I'll follow you to Siberia. He recoiled at this, and the same hostile, almost haughty smile came to his lips. Perhaps I don't want to go to Siberia yet, Sonia, he said. Sonia looked at him quickly. Again, after her first passionate, agonizing sympathy for the unhappy man, the terrible idea of the murder overwhelmed her. In his changed tone, she seemed to hear the murderer speaking. She looked at him bewildered. She knew nothing as yet, why, how, with what object it had been. Now all these questions rushed at once into her mind. And again she could not believe it. He, he is a murderer. Could it be true? What's the meaning of it? 
Where am I? She said in complete bewilderment, as though still unable to recover herself. How could you, you, a man like you? How could you bring yourself to it? What does it mean? Oh, well, to plunder. Leave off, Sonia, he answered wearily, almost with vexation. Sonia stood as though struck dumb, but suddenly she cried. You were hungry. It was, to help your mother? Yes. No, Sonia, no, he muttered, turning away and hanging his head. I was not so hungry. I certainly did want to help my mother, but that's not the real thing either. Don't torture me, Sonia. Sonia clasped her hands. Could it, could it all be true? Good God, what a truth! Who could believe it? And how could you give away your last farthing and yet rob and murder? Ah, she cried suddenly, that money you gave Katerina Ivanovna, that money. Can that money? No, Sonia, he broke in hurriedly, that money was not it. Don't worry yourself. That money my mother sent me, and it came when I was ill, the day I gave it to you. Razumahin saw it, he received it for me. That money was mine, my own. Sonia listened to him in bewilderment and did her utmost to comprehend. And that money? I don't even know really whether there was any money, he added softly, as though reflecting. I took a purse off her neck, made of chamois leather, a purse stuffed full of something, but I didn't look in it, I suppose I hadn't time. And the things, chains and trinkets, I buried under a stone with the purse next morning in a yard off the V, Prospect. They are all there now. Sonia strained every nerve to listen. Then why, why, you said you did it to rob, but you took nothing? She asked quickly, catching at a straw. I don't know. I haven't yet decided whether to take that money or not, he said, musing again, and, seeming to wake up with a start, he gave a brief ironical smile. ACH, what silly stuff I am talking, eh? The thought flashed through Sonia's mind, wasn't he mad? But she dismissed it at once. No, it was something else. She could make nothing of it, nothing. Do you know, Sonia, he said suddenly with conviction, let me tell you, if I'd simply killed because I was hungry, laying stress on every word and looking enigmatically but sincerely at her, I should be happy now. You must believe that. What would it matter to you, he cried a moment later with a sort of despair, what would it matter to you if I were to confess that I did wrong? What do you gain by such a stupid triumph over me? Ah, Sonia, was it for that I've come to you today? Again Sonia tried to say something, but did not speak. I asked you to go with me yesterday, because you are all I have left. Go where? asked Sonia timidly. Not to steal and not to murder, don't be anxious, he smiled bitterly. We are so different. And you know, Sonia, it's only now, only this moment that I understand where I asked you to go with me yesterday. Yesterday when I said it, I did not know where. I asked you for one thing, I came to you for one thing, not to leave me. You won't leave me, Sonia? She squeezed his hand. And why, why did I tell her? Why did I let her know, he cried a minute later in despair, looking with infinite anguish at her. Here you expect an explanation from me, Sonia, you are sitting and waiting for it, I see that. But what can I tell you? You won't understand and will only suffer misery on my account. Well, you are crying and embracing me again. Why do you do it? Because I couldn't bear my burden and have come to throw it on another, you suffer too, and I shall feel better. And can you love such a mean wretch? But aren't you suffering, too? cried Sonia. Again a wave of the same feeling surged into his heart, and again for an instant softened it. Sonia, I have a bad heart, take note of that. It may explain a great deal. I have come because I am bad. There are men who wouldn't have come. 
but I am a coward and a mean wretch. But, never mind. That's not the point. I must speak now, but I don't know how to begin. He paused and sank into thought. ACH, we are so different, he cried again, we are not alike. And why, why did I come? I shall never forgive myself that. No, no, it was a good thing you came, cried Sonia. It's better I should know, far better. He looked at her with anguish. What if it were really that, he said, as though reaching a conclusion. Yes, that's what it was. I wanted to become a Napoleon, that is why I killed her. Do you understand now? And no, Sonia whispered naively and timidly. Only speak, speak, I shall understand, I shall understand in myself, she kept begging him. You'll understand? Very well, we shall see. He paused and was for some time lost in meditation. It was like this, I asked myself one day this question, what if Napoleon, for instance, had happened to be in my place, and if he had not had Toulon nor Egypt nor the passage of Mont Blanc to begin his career with, but instead of all those picturesque and monumental things, there had simply been some ridiculous old hag, a pawnbroker, who had to be murdered too to get money from her trunk, for his career. You understand. Well, would he have brought himself to that if there had been no other means? Wouldn't he have felt a pang at its being so far from monumental and, and sinful, too? Well, I must tell you that I worried myself fearfully over that question so that I was awfully ashamed when I guessed at last, all of a sudden, somehow, that it would not have given him the least pang, that it would not even have struck him that it was not monumental, that he would not have seen that there was anything in it to pass over, and that, if he had had no other way, he would have strangled her in a minute without thinking about it. Well, I too, left off thinking about it, murdered her, following his example. And that's exactly how it was. Do you think it funny? Yes, Sonia, the funniest thing of all is that perhaps that's just how it was. Sonia did not think it at all funny. You had better tell me straight out, without examples, she begged, still more timidly and scarcely audibly. He turned to her, looked sadly at her, and took her hands. You are right again, Sonia. Of course that's all nonsense, it's almost all talk. You see, you know of course that my mother has scarcely anything, my sister happened to have a good education and was condemned to drudge as a governess. All their hopes were centered on me. I was a student, but I couldn't keep myself at the university and was forced for a time to leave it. Even if I had lingered on like that, in ten or twelve years I might, with luck, hope to be some sort of teacher or clerk with a salary of a thousand rubles, he repeated it as though it were a lesson, and by that time my mother would be worn out with grief and anxiety, and I could not succeed in keeping her in comfort while my sister, well, my sister might well have fared worse. And it's a hard thing to pass everything by all one's life, to turn one's back upon everything, to forget one's mother and decorously accept the insults inflicted on one's sister. Why should one? When one has buried them to burden oneself with others, wife and children, and to leave them again without a farthing? So I resolved to gain possession of the old woman's money and to use it for my first years without worrying my mother, to keep myself at the university and for a little while after leaving it, and to do this all on a broad, thorough scale, so as to build up a completely new career and enter upon a new life of independence. Well, that's all. Well, of course in killing the old woman I did wrong. Well, that's enough. He struggled to the end of his speech in exhaustion and let his head sink. Oh, that's not it, that's not it, Sonia cried in distress. How could one, no, that's not right, not right. You see yourself that it's not right. But I've spoken truly, it's the truth. As though that could be the truth. Good God! I've only killed a louse, Sonia, a useless, loathsome, harmful creature. A human being, a louse. I too know it wasn't a louse, he answered, looking strangely at her. But I am talking nonsense, Sonia, he added. 
I've been talking nonsense a long time. That's not it, you are right there. There were quite, quite other causes for it. I haven't talked to anyone for so long, Sonia. My head aches dreadfully now. His eyes shone with feverish brilliance. He was almost delirious, an uneasy smile strayed on his lips. His terrible exhaustion could be seen through his excitement. Sonia saw how he was suffering. She too was growing dizzy. And he talked so strangely, it seemed somehow comprehensible, but yet. But how, how? Good God! And she wrung her hands in despair. No, Sonia, that's not it. He began again suddenly, raising his head, as though a new and sudden train of thought had struck and as it were roused him, that's not it. Better, imagine, yes, it's certainly better, imagine that I am vain, envious, malicious, base, vindictive and, well, perhaps with a tendency to insanity. Let's have it all out at once. They've talked of madness already, I noticed. I told you just now I could not keep myself at the university. But do you know that perhaps I might have done? My mother would have sent me what I needed for the fees, and I could have earned enough for clothes, boots, and food, no doubt. Lessons had turned up at half a ruble. Resumihin works. But I turned sulky and wouldn't. Yes, sulkiness, that's the right word for it. I sat in my room like a spider. You've been in my den, you've seen it. And do you know, Sonia, that low ceilings and tiny rooms cramp the soul and the mind? Ah, how I hated that garret. And yet I wouldn't go out of it. I wouldn't on purpose. I didn't go out for days together, and I wouldn't work, I wouldn't even eat, I just lay there doing nothing. If Nastasia brought me anything, I ate it, if she didn't, I went all day without, I wouldn't ask, on purpose, from sulkiness. At night I had no light, I lay in the dark and I wouldn't earn money for candles. I ought to have studied, but I sold my books, and the dust lies an inch thick on the notebooks on my table. I preferred lying still and thinking. And I kept thinking. And I had dreams all the time, strange dreams of all sorts, no need to describe. Only then I began to fancy that. No, that's not it. Again, I am telling you wrong. You see, I kept asking myself then, why am I so stupid that if others are stupid, and I know they are, yet I won't be wiser? Then I saw, Sonia, that if one waits for everyone to get wiser, it will take too long. Afterwards I understood that that would never come to pass, that men won't change and that nobody can alter it and that it's not worth wasting effort over it. Yes, that's so. That's the law of their nature, Sonia, that's so. And I know now, Sonia, that whoever is strong in mind and spirit will have power over them. Anyone who is greatly daring is right in their eyes. He who despises most things will be a lawgiver among them and he who dares most of all will be most in the right. So it has been till now and so it will always be. A man must be blind not to see it. The Raskolnikov looked at Sonia as he said this, he no longer cared whether she understood or not. The fever had complete hold of him, he was in a sort of gloomy ecstasy, he certainly had been too long without talking to anyone. Sonia felt that his gloomy creed had become his faith and code. I divine then, Sonia, he went on eagerly, that power is only vouchsafed to the man who dares to stoop and pick it up. There is only one thing, one thing needful, one is only to dare. Then for the first time in my life an idea took shape in my mind which no one had ever thought of before me, no one. I saw clear as daylight how strange it is that not a single person living in this mad world has had the daring to go straight for it all and send it flying to the devil. I... I wanted to have the daring, and I killed her. I only wanted to have the daring, Sonia. That was the whole cause of it. Oh hush, hush, cried Sonia, clasping her hands. You turned away from God and God has smitten you, 
has given you over to the devil. Then Sonia, when I used to lie there in the dark and all this became clear to me, was it a temptation of the devil, eh? Hush, don't laugh, blasphemer. You don't understand, you don't understand. Oh God. He won't understand. Hush, Sonia. I am not laughing. I know myself that it was the devil leading me. Hush, Sonia, hush, he repeated with gloomy insistence. I know it all, I have thought it all over and over and whispered it all over to myself, lying there in the dark. I've argued it all over with myself, every point of it, and I know it all, all. And how sick, how sick I was then of going over it all. I have kept wanting to forget it and make a new beginning, Sonia, and leave off thinking. And you don't suppose that I went into it headlong like a fool? I went into it like a wise man, and that was just my destruction. And you mustn't suppose that I didn't know, for instance, that if I began to question myself whether I had the right to gain power, I certainly hadn't the right, or that if I asked myself whether a human being is a louse it proved that it wasn't so for me, though it might be for a man who would go straight to his goal without asking questions. If I worried myself all those days, wondering whether Napoleon would have done it or not, I felt clearly of course that I wasn't Napoleon. I had to endure all the agony of that battle of ideas, Sonia, and I longed to throw it off, I wanted to murder without casuistry, to murder for my own sake, for myself alone. I didn't want to lie about it even to myself. It wasn't to help my mother I did the murder, that's nonsense, I didn't do the murder to gain wealth and power and to become a benefactor of mankind. Nonsense. I simply did it. I did the murder for myself, for myself alone, and whether I became a benefactor to others, or spent my life like a spider catching men in my web and sucking the life out of men, I couldn't have cared at that moment. And it was not the money I wanted, Sonia, when I did it. It was not so much the money I wanted, but something else. I know it all now. Understand me. Perhaps I should never have committed a murder again. I wanted to find out something else, it was something else led me on. I wanted to find out then and quickly whether I was a louse like everybody else or a man. Whether I can step over barriers or not, whether I dare stoop to pick up or not, whether I am a trembling creature or whether I have the right. To kill? Have the right to kill? Sonia clasped her hands. ACH, Sonia, he cried irritably and seemed about to make some retort, but was contemptuously silent. Don't interrupt me, Sonia. I want to prove one thing only, that the devil led me on then and he has shown me since that I had not the right to take that path, because I am just such a louse as all the rest. He was mocking me, and here I've come to you now. Welcome your guest. If I were not a louse, should I have come to you? Listen, when I went then to the old woman's, I only went to try. You may be sure of that. And you murdered her. But how did I murder her? Is that how men do murders? Do men go to commit a murder as I went then? I will tell you some day how I went. Did I murder the old woman? I murdered myself, not her. I crushed myself once for all, forever. But it was the devil that killed that old woman, not I, enough, enough, Sonia, enough. Let me be, he cried in a sudden spasm of agony, let me be. He leaned his elbows on his knees and squeezed his head in his hands as in a vice. What suffering? A wail of anguish broke from Sonia. Well, what am I to do now? he asked, suddenly raising his head and looking at her with a face hideously distorted by despair. What are you to do? she cried, jumping up, and her eyes that had been full of tears suddenly began to shine. Stand up! She seized him by the shoulder, he got up, looking at her almost bewildered. Go at once, this very minute, stand at the crossroads, bow down, first kiss the earth which you have defiled and then bow down to all the world and say to all men aloud, I am a murderer. Then God will send you life again. 
will you go, will you go? She asked him, trembling all over, snatching his two hands, squeezing them tight in hers and gazing at him with eyes full of fire. He was amazed at her sudden ecstasy. You mean Siberia, Sonia? I must give myself up, he asked gloomily. Suffer and expiate your sin by it, that's what you must do. No. I am not going to them, Sonia. But how will you go on living? What will you live for? cried Sonia. How is it possible now? Why, how can you talk to your mother? Oh, what will become of them now? But what am I saying? You have abandoned your mother and your sister already. He has abandoned them already. Oh, God, she cried. Why, he knows it all himself. How? How can he live by himself? What will become of you now? Don't be a child, Sonia, he said softly. What wrong have I done them? Why should I go to them? What should I say to them? That's only a phantom. They destroy men by millions themselves and look on it as a virtue. They are knaves and scoundrels, Sonia. I am not going to them. And what should I say to them, that I murdered her, but did not dare to take the money and hid it under a stone, he added with a bitter smile. Why, they would laugh at me, and would call me a fool for not getting it. A coward and a fool. They wouldn't understand, and they don't deserve to understand. Why should I go to them? I won't. Don't be a child, Sonia. It will be too much for you to bear, too much, she repeated, holding out her hands in despairing supplication. Perhaps I've been unfair to myself, he observed gloomily, pondering, perhaps after all I am a man and not a louse and I've been in too great a hurry to condemn myself. I'll make another fight for it. A haughty smile appeared on his lips. What a burden to bear! And your whole life, your whole life. I shall get used to it, he said grimly and thoughtfully. Listen, he began a minute later, stop crying, it's time to talk of the facts, I've come to tell you that the police are after me, on my track. A.C.H. Sonia cried in terror. Well, why do you cry out? You want me to go to Siberia and now you are frightened? But let me tell you, I shall not give myself up. I shall make a struggle for it and they won't do anything to me. They've no real evidence. Yesterday I was in great danger and believed I was lost, but today things are going better. All the facts they know can be explained two ways, that's to say I can turn their accusations to my credit, do you understand? And I shall, for I've learned my lesson. But they will certainly arrest me. If it had not been for something that happened, they would have done so today for certain, perhaps even now they will arrest me today. But that's no matter, Sonia, they'll let me out again, for there isn't any real proof against me, and there won't be, I give you my word for it. And they can't convict a man on what they have against me. Enough. I only tell you that you may know. I will try to manage somehow to put it to my mother and sister so that they won't be frightened. My sister's future is secure, however, now, I believe, and my mother's must be too. Well, that's all. Be careful, though. Will you come and see me in prison when I am there? Oh, I will, I will. They sat side by side, both mournful and dejected, as though they had been cast up by the tempest alone on some deserted shore. He looked at Sonia and felt how great was her love for him, and strange to say he felt it suddenly burdensome and painful to be so loved. Yes, it was a strange and awful sensation. On his way to see Sonia he had felt that all his hopes rested on her, he expected to be rid of at least part of his suffering, and now, when all her heart turned towards him, he suddenly felt that he was immeasurably unhappier than before. Sonia, he said, you'd better not come and see me when I am in prison. Sonia did not answer, she was crying. Several minutes passed. Have you a cross on you? she asked, 
as though suddenly thinking of it. He did not at first understand the question. No, of course not. Here, take this one, of cypress wood. I have another, a copper one that belonged to Lizaveta. I changed with Lizaveta, she gave me her cross, and I gave her my little icon. I will wear Lizaveta's now and give you this. Take it, it's mine. It's mine, you know, she begged him. We will go to suffer together, and together we will bear our cross. Give it me, said Raskolnikov. He did not want to hurt her feelings. But immediately he drew back the hand he held out for the cross. Not now, Sonia. Better later, he added to comfort her. Yes, yes, better, she repeated with conviction, when you go to meet your suffering, then put it on. You will come to me, I'll put it on you, we will pray and go together. At that moment, someone knocked three times at the door. Sofia Semyonovna, may I come in? They heard in a very familiar and polite voice. Sonia rushed to the door in a fright. The flaxen head of Mr. Lebeziatnikov appeared at the door. Lebeziatnikov looked perturbed. I've come to you, Sofia Semyonovna, he began. Excuse me. I thought I should find you, he said, addressing Raskolnikov suddenly, that is, I didn't mean anything, of that sort. But I just thought. Katerina Ivanovna has gone out of her mind, he blurted out suddenly, turning from Raskolnikov to Sonia. Sonia screamed. At least it seems so. But, we don't know what to do, you see. She came back, she seems to have been turned out somewhere, perhaps beaten. So it seems at least. She had run to your father's former chief, she didn't find him at home, he was dining at some other generals. Only fancy, she rushed off there, to the other generals, and, imagine, she was so persistent that she managed to get the chief to see her, had him fetched out from dinner, it seems. You can imagine what happened. She was turned out, of course, but, according to her own story, she abused him and threw something at him. One may well believe it. How it is she wasn't taken up, I can't understand. Now she is telling everyone, including Amalia Ivanovna, but it's difficult to understand her, she is screaming and flinging herself about. Oh yes, she shouts that since everyone has abandoned her, she will take the children and go into the street with a barrel organ, and the children will sing and dance, and she too, and collect money, and will go every day under the general's window. To let everyone see well-born children, whose father was an official, begging in the street. She keeps beating the children, and they are all crying. She is teaching Lita to sing my village, the boy to dance, Polenka the same. She is tearing up all the clothes, and making them little caps like actors, she means to carry a tin basin and make it tinkle, instead of music. She won't listen to anything. Imagine the state of things. It's beyond anything. Lebeziatnika would have gone on, but Sonia, who had heard him almost breathless, snatched up her cloak and hat, and ran out of the room, putting on her things as she went. Raskolnikov followed her, and Lebeziatnika came after him. She has certainly gone mad, he said to Raskolnikov, as they went out into the street. I didn't want to frighten Sofia Semyonovna, so I said it seemed like it, but there isn't a doubt of it. They say that in consumption the tubercles sometimes occur in the brain, it's a pity I know nothing of medicine. I did try to persuade her, but she wouldn't listen. Did you talk to her about the tubercles? Not precisely of the tubercles. Besides, she wouldn't have understood. But what I say is, that if you convince a person logically that he has nothing to cry about, he'll stop crying. That's clear. Is it your conviction that he won't? Life would be too easy if it were so, answered Raskolnikov. Excuse me, excuse me, 
Of course it would be rather difficult for Katerina Ivanovna to understand, but do you know that in Paris they have been conducting serious experiments as to the possibility of curing the insane, simply by logical argument? One professor there, a scientific man of standing, lately dead, believed in the possibility of such treatment. His idea was that there's nothing really wrong with the physical organism of the insane, and that insanity is, so to say, a logical mistake, an error of judgment, an incorrect view of things. He gradually showed the madman his error and, would you believe it, they say he was successful? But as he made use of douches too, how far success was due to that treatment remains uncertain. So it seems at least. Raskolnikov had long ceased to listen. Reaching the house where he lived, he nodded to Lebeziatnikov and went in at the gate. Lebeziatnikov woke up with a start, looked about him and hurried on. Raskolnikov went into his little room and stood still in the middle of it. Why had he come back here? He looked at the yellow and tattered paper, at the dust, at his sofa. From the yard came a loud continuous knocking. Someone seemed to be hammering. He went to the window, rose on tiptoe, and looked out into the yard for a long time with an air of absorbed attention. But the yard was empty, and he could not see who was hammering. In the house on the left, he saw some open windows. On the window sills were pots of sickly looking geraniums. Linen was hung out of the windows. He knew it all by heart. He turned away and sat down on the sofa. Never, never had he felt himself so fearfully alone. Yes, he felt once more that he would perhaps come to hate Sonia, now that he had made her more miserable. Why had he gone to her to beg for her tears? What need had he to poison her life? Oh, the meanness of it. I will remain alone, he said resolutely, and she shall not come to the prison. Five minutes later he raised his head with a strange smile. That was a strange thought. Perhaps it really would be better in Siberia, he thought suddenly. He could not have said how long he sat there with vague thoughts surging through his mind. All at once the door opened and Dunia came in. At first she stood still and looked at him from the doorway, just as he had done at Sonia, then she came in and sat down in the same place as yesterday, on the chair facing him. He looked silently and almost vacantly at her. Don't be angry, brother, I've only come for one minute, said Dunia. Her face looked thoughtful, but not stern. Her eyes were bright and soft. He saw that she too had come to him with love. Brother, now I know all, all. Dmitri Prokofitch has explained and told me everything. They are worrying and persecuting you through a stupid and contemptible suspicion. Dmitri Prokofitch told me that there is no danger, and that you are wrong in looking upon it with such horror. I don't think so, and I fully understand how indignant you must be, and that that indignation may have a permanent effect on you. That's what I am afraid of. As for your cutting yourself off from us, I don't judge you, I don't venture to judge you, and forgive me for having blamed you for it. I feel that I too, if I had so great a trouble, should keep away from everyone. I shall tell mother nothing of this, but I shall talk about you continually and shall tell her from you that you will come very soon. Don't worry about her, I will set her mind at rest, but don't you try her too much, come once at least, remember that she is your mother. And now I have come simply to say, Dunia began to get up, that if you should need me or should need, all my life or anything, call me, and I'll come. Goodbye. She turned abruptly and went towards the door. Dunia. Raskolnikov stopped her and went towards her. That Razumihin, Dmitri Prokofitch, is a very good fellow. Dunia flushed slightly. Well, she asked, waiting a moment. He is competent, hardworking, honest and capable of real love. Goodbye, Dunia. Dunia flushed crimson, then suddenly she took alarm. But what does it mean, brother? Are we really parting forever that you give me such a parting message? Never mind. Goodbye. 
He turned away and walked to the window. She stood a moment, looked at him uneasily, and went out troubled. No, he was not cold to her. There was an instant, the very last one, when he had longed to take her in his arms and say goodbye to her, and even to tell her, but he had not dared even to touch her hand. Afterwards she may shudder when she remembers that I embraced her, and will feel that I stole her kiss. And would she stand that test? He went on a few minutes later to himself. No, she wouldn't, girls like that can't stand things. They never do. And he thought of Sonia. There was a breath of fresh air from the window. The daylight was fading. He took up his cap and went out. He could not, of course, and would not consider how ill he was. But all this continual anxiety and agony of mind could not but affect him. And if he were not lying in high fever it was perhaps just because this continual inner strain helped to keep him on his legs and in possession of his faculties. But this artificial excitement could not last long. He wandered aimlessly. The sun was setting. A special form of misery had begun to oppress him of late. There was nothing poignant, nothing acute about it, but there was a feeling of permanence, of eternity about it. It brought a foretaste of hopeless years of this cold leaden misery, a foretaste of an eternity on a square yard of space. Towards evening this sensation usually began to weigh on him more heavily. With this idiotic, purely physical weakness, depending on the sunset or something, one can't help doing something stupid. You'll go to Dunia, as well as to Sonia, he muttered bitterly. He heard his name called. He looked round. Lebeziatnikov rushed up to him. Only fancy, I've been to your room looking for you. Only fancy, she's carried out her plan and taken away the children. Sofia Semyonovna and I have had a job to find them. She is rapping on a frying pan and making the children dance. The children are crying. They keep stopping at the crossroads and in front of shops, there's a crowd of fools running after them. Come along. And Sonia? Raskolnikov asked anxiously, hurrying after Lebeziatnikov. Simply frantic. That is, it's not Sofia Semyonovna's frantic, but Katerina Ivanovna, though Sofia Semyonova's frantic too. But Katerina Ivanovna is absolutely frantic. I tell you she is quite mad. They'll be taken to the police. You can fancy what an effect that will have. They are on the canal bank, near the bridge now, not far from Sofia Semyonovna's, quite close. On the canal bank near the bridge and not two houses away from the one where Sonia lodged, there was a crowd of people, consisting principally of gutter children. The hoarse-broken voice of Katerina Ivanovna could be heard from the bridge, and it certainly was a strange spectacle likely to attract a street crowd. Katerina Ivanovna in her old dress with the green shawl, wearing a torn straw hat, crushed in a hideous way on one side, was really frantic. She was exhausted and breathless. Her wasted consumptive face looked more suffering than ever, and indeed out of doors in the sunshine a consumptive always looks worse than at home. But her excitement did not flag, and every moment her irritation grew more intense. She rushed at the children, shouted at them, coaxed them, told them before the crowd how to dance and what to sing, began explaining to them why it was necessary, and driven to desperation by their not understanding, beat them. Then she would make a rush at the crowd, if she noticed any decently dressed person stopping to look, she immediately appealed to him to see what these children from a genteel, one may say aristocratic, house had been brought to. If she heard laughter or jeering in the crowd, she would rush at once at the scoffers and begin squabbling with them. Some people laughed, others shook their heads, but everyone felt curious at the sight of the madwoman with the frightened children. The frying pan of which Lebeziatnikov had spoken was not there, at least Raskolnikov did not see it. But instead of rapping on the pan, Katerina Ivanovna began clapping her wasted hands when she made Lida and Kolya dance and Polenka sing. She too joined in the singing, 
but broke down at the second note with a fearful cough, which made her curse in despair and even shed tears. What made her most furious was the weeping and terror of Kolia and Lida. Some effort had been made to dress the children up as street singers are dressed. The boy had on a turban made of something red and white to look like a Turk. There had been no costume for Lida, she simply had a red knitted cap, or rather a night cap that had belonged to Marmeladov, decorated with a broken piece of white ostrich feather, which had been Katerina Ivanovna's grandmother's and had been preserved as a family possession. Polenka was in her everyday dress, she looked in timid perplexity at her mother, and kept at her side, hiding her tears. She dimly realized her mother's condition, and looked uneasily about her. She was terribly frightened of the street and the crowd. Sonia followed Katerina. Ivanovna, weeping and beseeching her to return home, but Katerina Ivanovna was not to be persuaded. Leave off, Sonia, leave off, she shouted, speaking fast, panting and coughing. You don't know what you ask, you are like a child. I've told you before that I am not coming back to that drunken German. Let everyone, let all Petersburg see the children begging in the streets, though their father was an honorable man who served all his life in truth and fidelity, and one may say died in the service. Katerina Ivanovna had by now invented this fantastic story and thoroughly believed it. Let that wretch of a general see it. And you are silly, Sonia, what have we to eat? Tell me that. We have worried you enough, I won't go on so. Ah, Radayan Romanovich, is that you? She cried, seeing Raskolnikov and rushing up to him. Explain to this silly girl, please, that nothing better could be done. Even organ grinders earn their living, and everyone will see at once that we are different, that we are an honorable and bereaved family reduced to beggary. And that general will lose his post, you'll see. We shall perform under his windows every day, and if the Tsar drives by, I'll fall on my knees, put the children before me, show them to him, and say, Defend us, Father. He is the Father of the fatherless, he is merciful, he'll protect us, you'll see, and that wretch of a general. Lida, tennis vu droit. Kolia, you'll dance again. Why are you whimpering? Whimpering again. What are you afraid of, stupid? Goodness, what am I to do with them, Radayan Romanovich? If you only knew how stupid they are. What's one to do with such children? And she, almost crying herself, which did not stop her uninterrupted, rapid flow of talk, pointed to the crying children. Raskolnikov tried to persuade her to go home, and even said, hoping to work on her vanity, that it was unseemly for her to be wandering about the streets like an organ grinder, as she was intending to become the principal of a boarding school. A boarding school, ha ha ha! A castle in the air, cried Katerina Ivanovna, her laugh ending in a cough. No, Radayan Romanovich, that dream is over. All have forsaken us. And that general. You know, Radayan Romanovich, I threw an inkpot at him, it happened to be standing in the waiting room by the paper where you sign your name. I wrote my name, threw it at him, and ran away. Oh, the scoundrels, the scoundrels. But enough of them, now I'll provide for the children myself, I won't bow down to anybody. She has had to bear enough for us, she pointed to Sonia. Polenka, how much have you got? Show me. What, only two farthings? Oh, the mean wretches. They give us nothing, only run after us, putting their tongues out. There, what is that? Blockhead laughing at? She pointed to a man in the crowd. It's all because Kolya here is so stupid, I have such a bother with him. What do you want, Polenka? Tell me in French, parlez-moi français. Why, I've taught you, you know some phrases. Else how are you to show that you are a good family, well brought up children, and not at all like other organ grinders? We aren't going to have a Punch and Judy show in the street, but to sing a genteel song. Ah, yes. What are we to sing? 
You keep putting me out, but we, you see, we are standing here, Radion Romanovich, to find something to sing and get money, something Kolya can dance to. For, as you can fancy, our performance is all impromptu. We must talk it over and rehearse it all thoroughly, and then we shall go to Nevsky, where there are far more people of good society, and we shall be noticed at once. Lida knows my village only, nothing but my village, and everyone sings that. We must sing something far more genteel. Well, have you thought of anything, Polenka? If only you'd help your mother. My memory's quite gone, or I should have thought of something. We really can't sing in Hazar. Ah, uh, let us sing in French, sing Sue, I have taught it you, I have taught it you. And as it is in French, people will see at once that you are children of good family, and that will be much more touching. You might sing Marlborough Sen Vatn Gare, for that's quite a child's song and is sung as a lullaby in all the aristocratic houses. Marlborough Sen Vatn Gare Nisait Quand Reviendra, she began singing. But no, better sing Sink Su. Now, Kolia, your hands on your hips, make haste, and you, Lita, keep turning the other way, and Polenka, and I will sing and clap our hands. Sink Su, Sink Su pour Monter Notre Menage. Cough, cough, cough. Set your dress straight, Polenka, it slipped down on your shoulders, she observed, panting from coughing. Now it's particularly necessary to behave nicely and genteelly, that all may see that you are well-born children. I said at the time that the bodice should be cut longer and made of two widths. It was your fault, Sonia, with your advice to make it shorter, and now you see the child is quite deformed by it. Why, you're all crying again. What's the matter, stupids? Come, Kolia, begin. Make haste, make haste. Oh, what an unbearable child. Sink Su, Sink Su. A policeman again. What do you want? A policeman was indeed forcing his way through the crowd. But at that moment a gentleman in civilian uniform and an overcoat, a solid-looking official of about fifty with a decoration on his neck, which delighted Katerina. Ivanovna, and had its effect on the policeman, approached and without a word handed her a green three-ruble note. His face wore a look of genuine sympathy. Katerina Ivanovna took it and gave him a polite, even ceremonious, bow. I thank you, honored sir, she began loftily. The causes that have induced us, take the money, Polenka, you see there are generous and honorable people who are ready to help a poor gentlewoman in distress. You see, honored sir, these orphans of good family, I might even say of aristocratic connections, and that wretch of a general sat eating grouse, and stamped at my disturbing him. Your Excellency, I said, protect the orphans, for you knew my late husband, Semyon Zaharovich, and on the very day of his death the basest of scoundrels slandered his only daughter. That policeman again. Protect me, she cried to the official. Why is that policeman edging up to me? We have only just run away from one of them. What do you want, fool? It's forbidden in the streets. You mustn't make a disturbance. It's your making a disturbance. It's just the same as if I were grinding an organ. What business is it of yours? You have to get a license for an organ, and you haven't got one, and in that way you collect a crowd. Where do you lodge? What, a license? wailed Katerina Ivanovna. I buried my husband today. What need of a license? Calm yourself, madam, calm yourself, began the official. Come along, I will escort you. This is no place for you in the crowd. You are ill. Honored sir, honored sir, you don't know, screamed Katerina Ivanovna. We are going to the Nevsky. Sonia, Sonia. Where is she? She is crying too. What's the matter with you all? Kolia, Lita, where are you going? She cried suddenly in alarm. Oh, silly children. 
Colia, Lita, where are they off to? Colia and Lita, scared out of their wits by the crowd and their mother's mad pranks, suddenly seized each other by the hand and ran off at the sight of the policeman who wanted to take them away somewhere. Weeping and wailing, poor Katerina Ivanovna ran after them. She was a piteous and unseemly spectacle as she ran, weeping and panting for breath. Sonia and Polenka rushed after them. Bring them back, bring them back, Sonia. Oh, stupid, ungrateful children. Polenka. Catch them. It's for your sakes, I. She stumbled as she ran and fell down. She's cut herself, she's bleeding. Oh, dear, cried Sonia, bending over her. All ran up and crowded around. Raskolnikov and Lebeziatnikov were the first at her side, the official too hastened up, and behind him the policeman who muttered, bother, with a gesture of impatience, feeling that the job was going to be a troublesome one. Pass on. Pass on, he said to the crowd that pressed forward. She's dying, someone shouted. She's gone out of her mind, said another. Lord have mercy upon us, said a woman, crossing herself. Have they caught the little girl and the boy? They're being brought back, the elder ones got them. Ah, the naughty imps! When they examined Katerina Ivanovna carefully, they saw that she had not cut herself against a stone, as Sonia thought, but that the blood that stained the pavement red was from her chest. I've seen that before, muttered the official to Raskolnikov and Lebeziatnikov, that's consumption, the blood flows and chokes the patient. I saw the same thing with a relative of my own not long ago, nearly a pint of blood, all in a minute. What's to be done though? She is dying. This way, this way, to my room. Sonia implored. I live here. See, that house, the second from here. Come to me, make haste. She turned from one to the other. Send for the doctor. Oh, dear. Thanks to the officials' efforts, this plan was adopted, the policeman even helping to carry Katerina Ivanovna. She was carried to Sonia's room, almost unconscious, and laid on the bed. The blood was still flowing, but she seemed to be coming to herself. Raskolnikov, Lebeziatnikov, and the official accompanied Sonia into the room and were followed by the policeman, who first drove back the crowd, which followed to the very door. Polenka came in holding Kolya and Lida, who were trembling and weeping. Several persons came in too from the Kapranamov's room, the landlord, a lame one-eyed man of strange appearance with whiskers and hair that stood up like a brush, his wife, a woman with an everlastingly scared expression, and several open-mouthed children with wonderstruck faces. Among these, Svitergalev suddenly made his appearance. Raskolnikov looked at him with surprise, not understanding where he had come from and not having noticed him in the crowd. A doctor and priest were spoken of. The official whispered to Raskolnikov that he thought it was too late now for the doctor, but he ordered him to be sent for. Kapranamov ran himself. Meanwhile, Katerina Ivanovna had regained her breath. The bleeding ceased for a time. She looked with sick but intent and penetrating eyes at Sonia, who stood pale and trembling, wiping the sweat from her brow with a handkerchief. At last she asked to be raised. They sat her up on the bed, supporting her on both sides. Where are the children? she said in a faint voice. You've brought them, Polenka? Oh, the sillies! Why did you run away? Ock! Once more her parched lips were covered with blood. She moved her eyes, looking about her. So that's how you live, Sonia. Never once have I been in your room. She looked at her with a face of suffering. We have been your ruin, Sonia. Polenka, Lida, Kolya, come here. Well, here they are, Sonia, take them all. I hand them over to you. I've had enough. The ball is over. Cough. Lay me down, let me die in peace. 
they laid her back on the pillow. What, the priest? I don't want him. You haven't got a ruble to spare. I have no sins. God must forgive me without that. He knows how I have suffered. And if he won't forgive me, I don't care. She sank more and more into uneasy delirium. At times she shuddered, turned her eyes from side to side, recognized everyone for a minute, but at once sank into delirium again. Her breathing was hoarse and difficult, there was a sort of rattle in her throat. I said to him, Your Excellency, she ejaculated, gasping after each word. That Amalia Lebogovna, ah! Lita, Kolia, hands on your hips, make haste. Glisses, glisses. Pa de Basque. Tap with your heels, be a graceful child. Do hast diamant in und perlen. What next? That's the thing to sing. Do hast die schonst an augen madgen, was willst du mehr? What an idea! Was willst du mehr? What things the fool invents? Ah, yes. In the heat of midday in the Vale of Dagestan. Ah, how I loved it. I loved that song to distraction, Polenka. Your father, you know, used to sing it when we were engaged. Oh, those days. Oh, that's the thing for us to sing. How does it go? I've forgotten. Remind me. How was it? She was violently excited and tried to sit up. At last, in a horribly hoarse, broken voice, she began, shrieking and gasping at every word, with a look of growing terror. In the heat of midday. In the veil. Of Dagestan. With lead in my breast. Your Excellency, she wailed suddenly with a heart-rending scream and a flood of tears, protect the orphans. You have been their father's guest, one may say aristocratic. She started, regaining consciousness, and gazed at all with a sort of terror, but at once recognized Sonia. Sonia, Sonia, she articulated softly and caressingly, as though surprised to find her there. Sonia darling, are you here, too? They lifted her up again. Enough. It's over. Farewell, poor thing. I am done for. I am broken, she cried with vindictive despair, and her head fell heavily back on the pillow. She sank into unconsciousness again, but this time it did not last long. Her pale, yellow, wasted face dropped back, her mouth fell open, her leg moved convulsively, she gave a deep, deep sigh and died. Sonia fell upon her, flung her arms about her, and remained motionless with her head pressed to the dead woman's wasted bosom. Polenka threw herself at her mother's feet, kissing them and weeping violently. Though Kolia and Lita did not understand what had happened, they had a feeling that it was something terrible. They put their hands on each other's little shoulders, stared straight at one another, and both at once opened their mouths and began screaming. They were both still in their fancy dress, one in a turban, the other in the cap with the ostrich feather. And how did the certificate of merit come to be on the bed beside Katerina Ivanovna? It lay there by the pillow, Raskolnikov saw it. He walked away to the window. Lebeziatnikov skipped up to him. She is dead, he said. Radion Romanovich, I must have two words with you, said Svidrigailov, coming up to them. Lebeziatnikov at once made room for him and delicately withdrew. Svidrigailov drew Raskolnikov further away. I will undertake all the arrangements, the funeral and that. You know it's a question of money, and, as I told you, I have plenty to spare. I will put those two little ones and Polenka into some good orphan asylum, and I will settle. Fifteen hundred rubles to be paid to each on coming of age, so that Sofia Semyonovna need have no anxiety about them. And I will pull her out of the mud too, for she is a good girl, isn't she? So tell Adosha Romanovna that that is how I am spending her ten thousand. 
What is your motive for such benevolence? asked Raskolnikov. Ah! You skeptical person, laughed Svidrigailov. I told you I had no need of that money. Won't you admit that it's simply done from humanity? She wasn't a louse, you know, he pointed to the corner where the dead woman lay, was she, like some old pawnbroker woman? Come, you'll agree, is Lizen to go on living, and doing wicked things, or is she to die? And if I didn't help them, Polenka would go the same way. He said this with an air of a sort of gay winking slyness, keeping his eyes fixed on Raskolnikov, who turned white and cold, hearing his own phrases, spoken to Sonia. He quickly stepped back and looked wildly at Svidrigailov. How do you know? he whispered, hardly able to breathe. Why, I lodge here at Madame Reslich's, the other side of the wall. Here is Kapernamov, and there lives Madame Reslich, an old and devoted friend of mine. I am a neighbor. You? Yes, continued Svidrigailov, shaking with laughter. I assure you on my honor, dear Radion Romanovich, that you have interested me enormously. I told you we should become friends, I foretold it. Well, here we have. And you will see what an accommodating person I am. You'll see that you can get on with me. A strange period began for Raskolnikov, it was as though a fog had fallen upon him and wrapped him in a dreary solitude from which there was no escape. Recalling that period long after, he believed that his mind had been clouded at times, and that it had continued so, with intervals, till the final catastrophe. He was convinced that he had been mistaken about many things at that time, for instance as to the date of certain events. Anyway, when he tried later on to piece his recollections together, he learned a great deal about himself from what other people told him. He had mixed up incidents and had explained events as due to circumstances which existed only in his imagination. At times he was a prey to agonies of morbid uneasiness, amounting sometimes to panic. But he remembered two moments, hours, perhaps whole days, of complete apathy, which came upon him as a reaction from his previous terror and might be compared with the abnormal insensibility, sometimes seen in the dying. He seemed to be trying in that latter stage to escape from a full and clear understanding of his position. Certain essential facts, which required immediate consideration, were particularly irksome to him. How glad he would have been to be free from some cares, the neglect of which would have threatened him with complete, inevitable ruin. He was particularly worried about Svidrigailov, he might be said to be permanently thinking of Svidrigailov. From the time of Svidrigailov's two menacing and unmistakable words in Sonia's room at the moment of Katerina Ivanovna's death, the normal working of his mind seemed to break down. But although this new fact caused him extreme uneasiness, Raskolnikov was in no hurry for an explanation of it. At times, finding himself in a solitary and remote part of the town, in some wretched eating house, sitting alone lost in thought, hardly knowing how he had come there, he suddenly thought of Svidrigailov. He recognized suddenly, clearly, and with dismay that he ought at once to come to an understanding with that man and to make what terms he could. Walking outside the city gates one day, he positively fancied that. They had fixed a meeting there, that he was waiting for Svidrigailov. Another time he woke up before daybreak lying on the ground under some bushes and could not at first understand how he had come there. But during the two or three days after Katerina Ivanovna's death, he had two or three times met Svidrigailov at Sonia's lodging, where he had gone aimlessly for a moment. They exchanged a few words and made no reference to the vital subject, as though they were tacitly agreed not to speak of it for a time. Katerina Ivanovna's body was still lying in the coffin, Svidrigailov was busy making arrangements for the funeral. Sonia too was very busy. At their last meeting Svidrigailov informed Raskolnikov that he had made an arrangement, and a very satisfactory one, for Katerina Ivanovna's children, that he had, through certain connections, succeeded in getting hold of certain personages by whose help the three orphans could be at once placed in very suitable institutions, that the money he had settled on them had been of great assistance, as it is much easier to place orphans with some property than destitute ones. 
he said something too about Sonia and promised to come himself in a day or two to see Raskolnikov, mentioning that he would like to consult with him, that there were things they must talk over. This conversation took place in the passage on the stairs. Svidrigailov looked intently at Raskolnikov and suddenly, after a brief pause, dropping his voice, asked, But how is it, Radion Romanovich, you don't seem yourself? You look and you listen, but you don't seem to understand. Cheer up. We'll talk things over, I am only sorry, I've so much to do of my own business and other people's. Ah, Radion Romanovich, he added suddenly, what all men need is fresh air, fresh air, more than anything. He moved to one side to make way for the priest and server, who were coming up the stairs. They had come for the requiem service. By Svidrigailov's orders it was sung twice a day punctually. Svidrigailov went his way. Raskolnikov stood still a moment, thought, and followed the priest into Sonia's room. He stood at the door. They began quietly, slowly, and mournfully singing the service. From his childhood the thought of death and the presence of death had something oppressive and mysteriously awful, and it was long since he had heard the requiem service. And there was something else here as well, too awful and disturbing. He looked at the children, they were all kneeling by the coffin, Polenka was weeping. Behind them Sonia prayed, softly and, as it were, timidly weeping. These last two days she hasn't said a word to me, she hasn't glanced at me, Raskolnikov thought suddenly. The sunlight was bright in the room, the incense rose in clouds, the priest read, Give rest, O Lord. Raskolnikov stayed all through the service. As he blessed them and took his leave, the priest looked round strangely. After the service, Raskolnikov went up to Sonia. She took both his hands and let her head sink on his shoulder. This slight friendly gesture bewildered Raskolnikov. It seemed strange to him that there was no trace of repugnance, no trace of disgust, no tremor in her hand. It was the furthest limit of self-abnegation, at least so he interpreted it. Sonia said nothing. Raskolnikov pressed her hand and went out. He felt very miserable. If it had been possible to escape to some solitude, he would have thought himself lucky, even if he had to spend his whole life there. But although he had almost always been by himself of late, he had never been able to feel alone. Sometimes he walked out of the town onto the high road, once he had even reached a little wood, but the lonelier the place was, the more he seemed to be aware of an uneasy presence near him. It did not frighten him, but greatly annoyed him, so that he made haste to return to the town, to mingle with the crowd, to enter restaurants and taverns, to walk in busy thoroughfares. There he felt easier and even more solitary. One day at dusk he sat for an hour listening to songs in a tavern and he remembered that he positively enjoyed it. But at last he had suddenly felt the same uneasiness again, as though his conscience smote him. Here I sit listening to singing, is that what I ought to be doing, he thought. Yet he felt at once that that was not the only cause of his uneasiness, there was something requiring immediate decision, but it was something he could not clearly understand or put into words. It was a hopeless tangle. No, better this struggle again. Better Porphyry again, or Svidrigailov. Better some challenge again, some attack. Yes, yes, he thought. He went out of the tavern and rushed away almost at a run. The thought of Dunia and his mother suddenly reduced him almost to a panic. That night he woke up before morning among some bushes in Krestovsky Island, trembling all over with fever, he walked home, and it was early morning when he arrived. After some hours sleep the fever left him, but he woke up late, two o'clock in the afternoon. He remembered that Katerina Ivanovna's funeral had been fixed for that day, and was glad that he was not present at it. Nastasia brought him some food, he ate and drank with appetite, almost with greediness. His head was fresher and he was calmer than he had been for the last three days. He even felt a passing wonder at his previous attacks of panic. The door opened and Razumihin came in. 
Ah, uh, he's eating, then he's not ill, said Razumihin. He took a chair and sat down at the table opposite Raskolnikov. He was troubled and did not attempt to conceal it. He spoke with evident annoyance, but without hurry or raising his voice. He looked as though he had some special fixed determination. Listen, he began resolutely. As far as I am concerned, you may all go to hell, but from what I see, it's clear to me that I can't make head or tail of it. Please don't think I've come to ask you questions. I don't want to know, hang it. If you begin telling me your secrets, I dare say I shouldn't stay to listen, I should go away cursing. I have only come to find out once for all whether it's a fact that you are mad. There is a conviction in the air that you are mad or very nearly so. I admit I've been disposed to that opinion myself, judging from your stupid, repulsive and quite inexplicable actions, and from your recent behavior to your mother and sister. Only a monster or a madman could treat them as you have, so you must be mad. When did you see them last? Just now. Haven't you seen them since then? What have you been doing with yourself? Tell me, please. I've been to you three times already. Your mother has been seriously ill since yesterday. She had made up her mind to come to you, Abdosha Romanovna tried to prevent her, she wouldn't hear a word. If he is ill, if his mind is giving way, who can look after him like his mother, she said. We all came here together, we couldn't let her come alone all the way. We kept begging her to be calm. We came in, you weren't here, she sat down and stayed ten minutes, while we stood waiting in silence. She got up and said, if he's gone out, that is, if he is well, and has forgotten his mother, it's humiliating and unseemly for his mother to stand at his door begging for kindness. She returned home and took to her bed, now she is in a fever. I see, she said, that he has time for his girl. She means by your girl, Sofia Semyonovna, your betrothed or your mistress, I don't know. I went at once to Sofia Semyonovna's, for I wanted to know what was going on. I looked round, I saw the coffin, the children crying, and Sofia Semyonovna trying them on morning dresses. No sign of you. I apologized, came away, and reported to Abdosha Romanovna. So that's all nonsense, and you haven't got a girl, the most likely thing is that you are mad. But here you sit, guzzling boiled beef as though you'd not had a bite for three days. Though as far as that goes, mad Monique too, but though you have not said a word to me yet, you are not mad. That I'd swear. Above all, you are not mad. So you may go to hell, all of. You, for there's some mystery, some secret about it, and I don't intend to worry my brains over your secrets. So I've simply come to swear at you, he finished, getting up, to relieve my mind. And I know what to do now. What do you mean to do now? What business is it of yours what I mean to do? You are going in for a drinking bout. How, how did you know? Why, it's pretty plain. Razumihin paused for a minute. You always have been a very rational person and you've never been mad, never, he observed suddenly with warmth. You're right, I shall drink. Goodbye. And he moved to go out. I was talking with my sister the day before yesterday, I think it was about you, Razumihin. About me. But, where can you have seen her the day before yesterday? Razumihin stopped short and even turned a little pale. One could see that his heart was throbbing slowly and violently. She came here by herself, sat there and talked to me. She did. Yes. What did you say to her? I mean, about me? I told her you were a very good, honest, and industrious man. I didn't tell her you love her because she knows that herself. She knows that herself? Well, it's pretty plain. Wherever I might go, whatever happened to me, you would remain to look after them. I, so to speak, 
give them into your keeping, Razumahin. I say this, because I know quite well how you love her, and am convinced of the purity of your heart. I know that she too may love you, and perhaps does love you already. Now decide for yourself, as you know best, whether you need go in for a drinking bout or not. Rodia! You see, well. ACH, damn it! But where do you mean to go? Of course, if it's all a secret, never mind. But I... I shall find out the secret, and I am sure that it must be some ridiculous nonsense and that you've made it all up. Anyway, you are a capital fellow, a capital fellow. That was just what I wanted to add, only you interrupted, that that was a very good decision of yours not to find out these secrets. Leave it to time, don't worry about it. You'll know it all in time when it must be. Yesterday a man said to me that what a man needs is fresh air, fresh air, fresh air. I mean to go to him directly to find out what he meant by that. Razumahin stood lost in thought and excitement, making a silent conclusion. He's a political conspirator. He must be. And he's on the eve of some desperate step, that's certain. It can only be that. And, and Dunia knows, he thought suddenly. So if Dosha Romanovna comes to see you, he said, weighing each syllable, and you're going to see a man who says we need more air, and so of course that letter, that too must have something to do with it, he concluded to himself. What letter? She got a letter today. It upset her very much, very much indeed. Too much so. I began speaking of you, she begged me not to. Then, then she said that perhaps we should very soon have to part, then she began warmly thanking me for something, then she went to her room and locked herself in. She got a letter? Raskolnikov asked, thoughtfully. Yes, and you didn't know? H.M. They were both silent. Goodbye, Radion. There was a time, brother, when I... Never mind, goodbye. You see, there was a time. Well, goodbye. I must be off too. I am not going to drink. There's no need now. That's all stuff. He hurried out, but when he had almost closed the door behind him, he suddenly opened it again and said, looking away. Oh, by the way, do you remember that murder, you know Porphyry's, that old woman? Do you know the murderer has been found, he has confessed and given the proofs? It's one of those very workmen, the painter, only fancy. Do you remember I defended them here? Would you believe it, all that scene of fighting and laughing with his companions on the stairs while the porter and the two witnesses were going up, he got up on purpose to disarm suspicion. The cunning, the presence of mind of the young dog. One can hardly credit it, but it's his own explanation, he has confessed it all. And what a fool I was about it. Well, he's simply a genius of hypocrisy and resourcefulness in disarming the suspicions of the lawyers, so there's nothing much to wonder at, I suppose. Of course people like that are always possible. And the fact that... He couldn't keep up the character, but confessed, makes him easier to believe in. But what a fool I was. I was frantic on their side. Tell me, please, from whom did you hear that, and why does it interest you so? Raskolnikov asked with unmistakable agitation. What next? You ask me why it interests me. Well, I heard it from Porphyry, among others. It was from him I heard almost all about it. From Porphyry? From Porphyry. What, what did he say? Raskolnikov asked in dismay. He gave me a capital explanation of it. Psychologically, after his fashion. He explained it? Explained it himself? Yes, yes, goodbye. I'll tell you all about it another time, but now I'm busy. There was a time when I fancied. But no matter, another time. 
What need is there for me to drink now? You have made me drunk without wine. I am drunk, Rhodia. Goodbye, I'm going. I'll come again very soon. He went out. He's a political conspirator, there's not a doubt about it, Razumahan decided, as he slowly descended the stairs. And he's drawn his sister in, that's quite, quite in keeping with Avdosha Romanovna's character. There are interviews between them. She hinted at it too. So many of her words. And hints, bear that meaning. And how else can all this tangle be explained? H.M. And I was almost thinking. Good heavens, what I thought. Yes, I took leave of my senses, and I wronged him. It was his doing, under the lamp in the corridor that day. Fool! What a crude, nasty, well idea on my part. Nikolai is a brick, for confessing. And how clear it all is now. His illness then, all his strange actions, before this, in the university, how morose he used to be, how gloomy. But what's the meaning now of that letter? There's something in that, too, perhaps. Whom was it from? I suspect. No, I must find out. He thought of Dunia, realizing all he had heard and his heart throbbed, and he suddenly broke into a run. As soon as Razumihin went out, Raskolnikov got up, turned to the window, walked into one corner and then into another, as though forgetting the smallness of his room, and sat down again on the sofa. He felt, so to speak, renewed, again the struggle, so a means of escape had come. Yes, a means of escape had come. It had been too stifling, too cramping, the burden had been too agonizing. A lethargy had come upon him at times. From the moment of the scene with Nikolai at Porphyry's, he had been suffocating, penned in without hope of escape. After Nikolai's confession, on that very day had come the scene with Sonia, his behavior and his last words had been utterly unlike anything he could have imagined beforehand, he had grown feebler, instantly and fundamentally. And he had agreed at the time with Sonia, he had agreed in his heart he could not go on living alone with such a thing on his mind. And Svidrigailov was a riddle. He worried him, that was true, but somehow not on the same point. He might still have a struggle to come with Svidrigailov. Svidrigailov, too, might be a means of escape, but Porphyry was a different matter. And so Porphyry himself had explained it to Razumihin, had explained it psychologically. He had begun bringing in his damn psychology again. Porphyry? But to think that Porphyry should for one moment believe that Nikolai was guilty, after what had passed between them before Nikolai's appearance, after that Ted a Ted interview, which could have only one explanation? During those days Raskolnikov had often recalled passages in that scene with Porphyry, he could not bear to let his mind rest on it. Such words, such gestures had passed between them, they had exchanged such glances, things had been said in such a tone and had reached such a pass, that Nikolai, whom Porphyry had seen through at the first word, at the first gesture, could not have shaken his conviction. And to think that even Razumihin had begun to suspect. The scene in the corridor under the lamp had produced its effect then. He had rushed to Porphyry. But what had induced the latter to receive him like that? What had been his object in putting Razumihin off with Nikolai? He must have some plan, there was some design, but what was it? It was true that a long time had passed since that morning, too long a time, and no sight nor sound of Porphyry. Well, that was a bad sign. Raskolnikov took his cap and went out of the room, still pondering. It was the first time for a long while that he had felt clear in his mind, at least. I must settle Svidrigailov, he thought, and as soon as possible, he, too, seems to be waiting for me to come to him of my own accord. And at that moment there was such a rush of hate in his weary heart that he might have killed either of those two, Porphyry or Svidrigailov. At least he felt that he would be capable of doing it later, if not now. We shall see, we shall see, he repeated to himself. 
But no sooner had he opened the door than he stumbled upon Porphyry himself in the passage. He was coming in to see him. Raskolnikov was dumbfounded for a minute, but only for one minute. Strange to say, he was not very much astonished at seeing Porphyry and scarcely afraid of him. He was simply startled, but was quickly, instantly, on his guard. Perhaps this will mean the end? But how could Porphyry have approached so quietly, like a cat, so that he had heard nothing? Could he have been listening at the door? You didn't expect a visitor, Radion Romanovich, Porphyry explained, laughing. I'd been meaning to look in a long time, I was passing by and thought why not go in for five minutes. Are you going out? I won't keep you long. Just let me have one cigarette. Sit down, Porfiry Petrovich, sit down. Raskolnikov gave his visitor a seat with so pleased and friendly an expression that he would have marveled at himself if he could have seen it. The last moment had come, the last drops had to be drained. So a man will sometimes go through half an hour of mortal terror with a brigand, yet when the knife is at his throat at last, he feels no fear. Raskolnikov seated himself, directly facing Porfiry, and looked at him without flinching. Porfiry screwed up his eyes and began lighting a cigarette. Speak, speak, seemed as though it would burst from Raskolnikov's heart. Come, why don't you speak? Ah, these cigarettes. Porfiry Petrovich ejaculated at last, having lighted one. They are pernicious, positively pernicious, and yet I can't give them up. I cough, I begin to have tickling in my throat and a difficulty in breathing. You know I am a coward, I went lately to Dr. B. N., he always gives at least half an hour to each patient. He positively laughed looking at me, he sounded me, tobacco's bad for you, he said, your lungs are affected. But how am I to give it up? What is there to take its place? I don't drink, that's the mischief, he he he, that I don't. Everything is relative, Radion Romanovich, everything is relative. Why, he's playing his professional tricks again, Raskolnikov thought with disgust. All the circumstances of their last interview suddenly came back to him, and he felt a rush of the feeling that had come upon him then. I came to see you the day before yesterday, in the evening, you didn't know? Porfiry Petrovich went on, looking round the room. I came into this very room. I was passing by, just as I did today, and I thought I'd return your call. I walked in as your door was wide open, I looked round, waited and went out without leaving my name with your servant. Don't you lock your door? Raskolnikov's face grew more and more gloomy. Porfiry seemed to guess his state of mind. I've come to have it out with you, Radion Romanovich, my dear fellow. I owe you an explanation and must give it to you, he continued with a slight smile, just patting Raskolnikov's knee. But almost at the same instant a serious and careworn look came into his face, to his surprise Raskolnikov saw a touch of sadness in it. He had never seen and never suspected such an expression in his face. A strange scene passed between us last time we met, Radion Romanovich. Our first interview, too, was a strange one, but then, and one thing after another. This is the point, I have perhaps acted unfairly to you, I feel it. Do you remember how we parted? Your nerves were unhinged and your knees were shaking and so were mine. And, you know, our behavior was unseemly, even ungentlemanly. And yet we are gentlemen, above all, in any case, gentlemen, that must be understood. Do you remember what we came to? And it was quite indecorous. What is he up to, what does he take me for? Raskolnikov asked himself in amazement, raising his head and looking with open eyes on Porfiry. I've decided openness is better between us, Porfiry Petrovich went on, turning his head away and dropping his eyes as though unwilling to disconcert his former victim and as though disdaining his former wiles. Yes, such suspicions and such scenes cannot continue for long. Nikolai put a stop to it, or I don't know what we might not have come to. That damned workman was sitting at the time in the next room, 
Can you realize that? You know that, of course, and I am aware that he came to you afterwards. But what you supposed then was not true, I had not sent for anyone, I had made no kind of arrangements. You ask why I hadn't? What shall I say to you? It had all come upon me so suddenly. I had scarcely sent for the porters, you noticed them as you went out, I dare say. An idea flashed upon me, I was firmly convinced at the time, you see, Radion Romanovich. Come, I thought, even if I let one thing slip for a time, I shall get hold of something else, I shan't lose what I want, anyway. You are nervously irritable, Radion Romanovich, by temperament, it's out of proportion with other qualities of your heart and character, which I flatter myself I have to some extent divined. Of course I did reflect even then that it does not always happen that a man gets up and blurts out his whole story. It does happen sometimes, if you make a man lose all patience, though even then it's rare. I was capable of realizing that. If I only had a fact, I thought, the least little fact to go upon, something I could lay hold of, something tangible, not merely psychological. For if a man is guilty, you must be able to get something substantial out of him, one may wreck it upon most surprising results indeed. I was reckoning on your temperament, Radion Romanovich, on your temperament above all things. I had great hopes of you at that time. But what are you driving at now? Raskolnikov muttered at last, asking the question without thinking. What is he talking about? He wondered distractedly. Does he really take me to be innocent? What am I driving at? I've come to explain myself, I consider it my duty, so to speak. I want to make clear to you how the whole business, the whole misunderstanding arose. I've caused you a great deal of suffering, Radion Romanovich. I am not a monster. I understand what it must mean for a man who has been unfortunate, but who is proud, imperious, and above all, impatient, to have to bear such treatment. I regard you in any case as a man of noble character and not without elements of magnanimity, though I don't agree with all your convictions. I wanted to tell you this first, frankly and quite sincerely, for above all I don't want to deceive you. When I made your acquaintance, I felt attracted by you. Perhaps you will laugh at my saying so. You have a right to. I know you disliked me from the first, and indeed, you've no reason to like me. You may think what you like, but I desire now to do all I can to efface that impression and to show that I am a man of heart and conscience. I speak sincerely. Porfiry Petrovich made a dignified pause. Raskolnikov felt a rush of renewed alarm. The thought that Porfiry believed him to be innocent began to make him uneasy. It's scarcely necessary to go over everything in detail, Porfiry Petrovich went on. Indeed, I could scarcely attempt it. To begin with there were rumors. Through whom, how, and when those rumors came to me, and how they affected you, I need not go into. My suspicions were aroused by a complete accident, which might just as easily not have happened. What was it? H.M. I believe there is no need to go into that either. Those rumors and that accident led to one idea in my mind. I admit it openly, for one may as well make a clean breast of it, I was the first to pitch on you. The old woman's notes on the pledges and the rest of it, that all came to nothing. Yours was one of a hundred. I happened, too, to hear of the scene at the office, from a man who described it capitally, unconsciously reproducing the scene with great vividness. It was just one thing after another, Radion Romanovich, my dear fellow. How could I avoid being brought to certain ideas? From a hundred rabbits you can't make a horse, a hundred suspicions don't make a proof, as the English proverb says but that's only from the rational point of view, you can't help being partial, for after all a lawyer is only human. I thought, too, of your article in that journal, do you remember, on your first visit we talked of it? I jeered at you at the time, but that was only to lead you on. I repeat, Radion Romanovich, you are ill and impatient. 
that you were bold, headstrong, in earnest and had felt a great deal I recognized long before. I, too, have felt the same, so that your article seemed familiar to me. It was conceived on sleepless nights, with a throbbing heart, in ecstasy and suppressed enthusiasm. And that proud suppressed enthusiasm in young people is dangerous. I jeered at you then, but let me tell you that, as a literary amateur, I am awfully fond of such first essays, full of the heat of youth. There is a mistiness and a chord vibrating in the mist. Your article is absurd and fantastic, but there's a transparent sincerity, a youthful incorruptible pride and the daring of despair in it. It's a gloomy article, but that's what's fine in it. I read your article and put it aside, thinking as I did so that man won't go the common way. Well, I ask you, after that as a preliminary, how can I help being carried away by what followed? Oh, dear, I am not saying anything, I am not making any statement now. I simply noted it at the time. What is there in it? I reflected. There's nothing in it, that is really nothing and perhaps absolutely nothing. And it's not at all the thing for the prosecutor to let himself be carried away by notions. Here I have Nikolai on my hands with actual evidence against him, you may think what you like of it, but it's evidence. He brings in his psychology, too, one has to consider him, too, for it's a matter of life and death. Why am I explaining this to you? That you may understand, and not blame my malicious behavior on that occasion. It was not malicious, I assure you, he he. Do you suppose I didn't come to search your room at the time? I did, I did, he he. I was here when you were lying ill in bed, not officially, not in my own person, but I was here. Your room was searched to the last thread at the first suspicion, but umsensed. I thought to myself, now that man will come, will come of himself and quickly, too, if he's guilty, he's sure to come. Another man wouldn't, but he will. And you remember how Mr. Razumahin began discussing the subject with you? We arranged that to excite you, so we purposely spread rumors that he might discuss the case with you, and Razumahin is not a man to restrain his indignation. Mr. Zaimtov was tremendously struck by your anger and your open daring. Think of blurting out in a restaurant, I killed her. It was too daring, too reckless. I thought so myself, if he is guilty, he will be a formidable opponent. That was what I thought at the time. I was expecting you. But you simply bowled Zaimtov over and, well, you see, it all lies in this, that this damnable psychology can be taken two ways. Well, I kept expecting you, and so it was, you came. My heart was fairly throbbing. A-C-H. Now, why need you have come? Your laughter, too, as you came in, do you remember? I saw it all plain as daylight, but if I hadn't expected you so specially, I should not have noticed anything in your laughter. You see what influence a mood has. Mr. Razumahin then, ah, that stone, that stone under which the things were hidden. I seem to see it somewhere in a kitchen garden. It was in a kitchen garden, you told Zaimtov and afterwards you repeated that in my office? And when we began picking your article to pieces, how you explained it? One could take every word of yours in two senses, as though there were another meaning hidden. So in this way, Radion Romanovich, I reached the furthest limit, and knocking my head against a post, I pulled myself up, asking myself what I was. About. After all, I said, you can take it all in another sense if you like, and it's more natural so, indeed. I couldn't help admitting it was more natural. I was bothered. No, I'd better get hold of some little fact, I said. So when I heard of the bell ringing, I held my breath and was all on a tremor. Here is my little fact, thought I, and I didn't think it over, I simply wouldn't. I would have given a thousand rubles at that minute to have seen you with my own eyes, when you walked a hundred paces beside that workman, after he had called you murderer to your face, and you did not dare to ask him a question all the way. And then what about your trembling, 
what about your bell ringing in your illness, in semi-delirium? And so, Radayan Romanovich, can you wonder that I played such pranks on you? And what made you come at that very minute? Someone seemed to have sent you, by Jove. And if Nikolai had not parted us, and do you remember Nikolai at the time? Do you remember him clearly? It was a thunderbolt, a regular thunderbolt. And how I met him. I didn't believe in the thunderbolt, not for a minute. You could see it for yourself, and how could I? Even afterwards, when you had gone and he began making very, very plausible answers on certain points, so that I was surprised at him myself, even then I didn't believe his story. You see what it is to be as firm as a rock. No, thought I, Morganfrew. What has Nikolai got to do with it? Razumihin told me just now that you think Nikolai guilty and had yourself assured him of it. His voice failed him, and he broke off. He had been listening in indescribable agitation, as this man who had seen through and through him, went back upon himself. He was afraid of believing it and did not believe it. In those still ambiguous words, he kept eagerly looking for something more definite and conclusive. Mr. Razumihin, cried Porfiry Petrovich, seeming glad of a question for Raskolnikov, who had till then been silent. He he he! But I had to put Mr. Razumihin off, two is company, three is none. Mr. Razumihin is not the right man, besides he is an outsider. He came running to me with a pale face. But never mind him, why bring him in? To return to Nikolai, would you like to know what sort of a type he is, how I understand him, that is? To begin with, he is still a child and not exactly a coward, but something by way of an artist. Really, don't laugh at my describing him so. He is innocent and responsive to influence. He has a heart and is a fantastic fellow. He sings and dances, he tells stories, they say, so that people come from other villages to hear him. He attends school too, and laughs till he cries if you hold up a finger to him, he will drink himself senseless, not as a regular vice, but at times when people treat him like a child. And he stole, too, then, without knowing it himself, for how can it be stealing if one picks it up? And do you know he is an old believer? or rather a dissenter. There had been wanderers in his family, and he was for two years in his village under the spiritual guidance of a certain elder. I learned all this from Nikolai and from his fellow villagers. And what's more, he wanted to run into the wilderness. He was full of fervor, prayed at night, read the old books, the true ones, and read himself crazy. Petersburg had a great effect upon him, especially the women and the wine. He responds to everything and he forgot the elder and all that. I learned that an artist here took a fancy to him and used to go and see him, and now this business came upon him. Well, he was frightened, he tried to hang himself. He ran away. How can one get over the idea the people have of Russian legal proceedings? The very word trial frightened some of them. Whose fault is it? We shall see what the new juries will do. God grant they do good. Well, in prison, it seems, he remembered the venerable elder, the Bible, too, made its appearance again. Do you know, Radayan Romanovich, the force of the word suffering among some of these people? It's not a question of suffering for someone's benefit, but simply, one must suffer. If they suffer at the hands of the authorities, so much the better. In my time there was a very meek and mild prisoner who spent a whole year in prison always reading his Bible on the stove at night, and he read himself crazy, and so crazy, do you know, that one day, apropos of nothing, he seized a brick and flung it at the governor, though he had done him no harm. And the way he threw it too, aimed at a yard on one side on purpose, for fear of hurting him. Well, we know what happens to a prisoner who assaults an officer with a weapon. So he took his suffering. So I suspect now that Nikolai wants to take his suffering or something of the sort. I know it for certain from facts, indeed. 
only he doesn't know that I know. What, you don't admit that there are such fantastic people among the peasants? Lots of them. The elder now has begun influencing him, especially since he tried to hang himself. But he'll come and tell me all himself. You think he'll hold out? Wait a bit, he'll take his words back. I am waiting from hour to hour for him to come and abjure his evidence. I have come to like that Nikolai and am studying him in detail. And what do you think? He he. He answered me very plausibly on some points, he obviously had collected some evidence and prepared himself cleverly. But on other points he is simply at sea, knows nothing and doesn't even suspect that he doesn't know. No, Radeon Romanovich, Nikolai doesn't come in. This is a fantastic, gloomy business, a modern case, an incident of today when the heart of man is troubled, when the phrase is quoted that blood renews, when comfort is preached as the aim of life. Here we have bookish dreams, a heart unhinged by theories. Here we see resolution in the first stage, but resolution of a special kind, he resolved to do it like jumping over a precipice or from a bell tower and his legs shook as he went to the crime. He forgot to shut the door after him and murdered two people for a theory. He committed the murder and couldn't take the money, and what he did manage to snatch up he hid under a stone. It wasn't enough for him to suffer agony behind the door while they battered at the door and rung the bell, no, he had to go to the empty lodging, half delirious, to recall the bell ringing, he wanted to feel the cold shiver over again. Well, that we grant, was through illness, but consider this, he is a murderer, but looks upon himself as an honest man, despises others, poses as injured innocence. No, that's not the work of a Nikolai, my dear Radion Romanovich. All that had been said before had sounded so like a recantation that these words were too great a shock. Raskolnikov shuddered as though he had been stabbed. Then, who then, is the murderer? he asked in a breathless voice, unable to restrain himself. Porfiry Petrovich sank back in his chair, as though he were amazed at the question. Who is the murderer? he repeated, as though unable to believe his ears. Why, you, Radion Romanovich? You are the murderer, he added, almost in a whisper, in a voice of genuine conviction. Raskolnikov leapt from the sofa, stood up for a few seconds, and sat down again without uttering a word. His face twitched convulsively. Your lip is twitching just as it did before, Porfiry Petrovich observed almost sympathetically. You've been misunderstanding me, I think, Radion Romanovich, he added after a brief pause, that's why you are so surprised. I came on purpose to tell you everything and deal openly with you. It was not I murdered her, Raskolnikov whispered like a frightened child caught in the act. No, it was you, you Radion Romanovich, and no one else, Porfiry whispered sternly, with conviction. They were both silent and the silence lasted strangely long, about ten minutes. Raskolnikov put his elbow on the table and passed his fingers through his hair. Porfiry Petrovich sat quietly waiting. Suddenly Raskolnikov looked scornfully at Porfiry. You are at your old tricks again, Porfiry Petrovich. Your old method again. I wonder you don't get sick of it. Oh, stop that, what does that matter now? It would be a different matter if there were witnesses present, but we are whispering alone. You see yourself that I have not come to chase and capture you like a hare. Whether you confess it or not is nothing to me now, for myself, I am convinced without it. If so, what did you come for? Raskolnikov asked irritably. I ask you the same question again, if you consider me guilty, why don't you take me to prison? Oh, that's your question. I will answer you, point for point. In the first place, to arrest you so directly is not to my interest. How so? If you are convinced you ought. ACH, what if I am convinced? That's only my dream for the time. Why should I put you in safety? You know that's it, since you ask me to do it. 
If I confront you with that workman, for instance, and you say to him, were you drunk or not? Who saw me with you? I simply took you to be drunk, and you were drunk, too. Well, what could I answer, especially as your story is a more likely one than his? For there's nothing but psychology to support his evidence, that's almost unseemly with his ugly mug, well you hit the mark exactly, for the rascal is an inveterate drunkard and notoriously so. And I have myself admitted candidly several times already that that psychology can be taken in two ways, and that the second way is stronger and looks far more probable, and that apart from that I have as yet nothing against you. And though I shall put you in prison and indeed have come, quite contrary to etiquette, to inform you of it beforehand, yet I tell you frankly, also contrary to etiquette, that it won't be to my advantage. Well, secondly, I've come to you because... Yes, yes, secondly? Raskolnikov was listening breathless. Because, as I told you just now, I consider I owe you an explanation. I don't want you to look upon me as a monster, as I have a genuine liking for you, you may believe me or not. And in the third place I've come to you with a direct and open proposition that you should surrender and confess. It will be infinitely more to your advantage and to my advantage too, for my task will be done. Well, is this open on my part or not? Raskolnikov thought a minute. Listen, Porfiry Petrovich. You said just now you have nothing but psychology to go on, yet now you've gone on mathematics. Well, what if you are mistaken yourself, now? No, Radion Romanovich, I am not mistaken. I have a little fact even then, Providence sent it me. What little fact? I won't tell you what, Radion Romanovich. And in any case, I haven't the right to put it off any longer, I must arrest you. So think it over, it makes no difference to me now, and so I speak only for your sake. Believe me, it will be better, Radion Romanovich. Raskolnikov smiled malignantly. That's not simply ridiculous, it's positively shameless. Why, even if I were guilty, which I don't admit, what reason should I have to confess, when you tell me yourself that I shall be in greater safety in prison? Ah, Radion Romanovich, don't put too much faith in words, perhaps prison will not be altogether a restful place. That's only theory and my theory, and what authority am I for you? Perhaps, too, even now I am hiding something from you? I can't lay bare everything, he <laughs> he. And how can you ask what advantage? Don't you know how it would lessen your sentence? You would be confessing at a moment when another man has taken the crime on himself and so has muddled the whole case. Consider that. I swear before God that I will so arrange that your confession shall come as a complete surprise. We will make a clean sweep of all these psychological points, of a suspicion against you, so that your crime will appear to have been something like an aberration, for in truth it was an aberration. I am an honest man, Radion Romanovich, and will keep my word. Raskolnikov maintained a mournful silence and let his head sink dejectedly. He pondered a long while and at last smiled again, but his smile was sad and gentle. No, he said, apparently abandoning all attempt to keep up appearances with Porphyry, it's not worth it, I don't care about lessening the sentence. That's just what I was afraid of. Porphyry cried warmly and, as it seemed, involuntarily. That's just what I feared, that you wouldn't care about the mitigation of sentence. Raskolnikov looked sadly and expressively at him. Ah, don't disdain life. Porphyry went on. You have a great deal of it still before you. How can you say you don't want a mitigation of sentence? You are an impatient fellow. A great deal of what lies before me. Of life. What sort of prophet are you? Do you know much about it? Seek and ye shall find. This may be God's means for bringing you to him. And it's not forever, the bondage. The time will be shortened, laughed Raskolnikov. Why, is it the bourgeois disgrace you are afraid of? 
it may be that you are afraid of it without knowing it because you are young. But anyway, you shouldn't be afraid of giving yourself up and confessing. ACH, hang it! Raskolnikov whispered with loathing and contempt, as though he did not want to speak aloud. He got up again as though he meant to go away, but sat down again in evident despair. Hang it, if you like. You've lost faith and you think that I am grossly flattering you, but how long has your life been? How much do you understand? You made up a theory and then were ashamed that it broke down and turned out to be not at all original. It turned out something base, that's true, but you are not hopelessly base. By no means so base. At least you didn't deceive yourself for long, you went straight to the furthest point at one bound. How do I regard you? I regard you as one of those men who would stand and smile at their torturer while he cuts their entrails out, if only they have found faith or God. Find it, and you will live. You have long needed a change of air. Suffering, too, is a good thing. Suffer. Maybe Nikolai is right in wanting to suffer. I know you don't believe in it, but don't be overwise, fling yourself straight into life, without deliberation, don't be afraid, the flood will bear you to the bank and set you safe on your feet again. What bank? How can I tell? I only believe that you have long life before you. I know that you take all my words now for a set speech prepared beforehand, but maybe you will remember them after. They may be of use some time. That's why I speak. It's as well that you only killed the old woman. If you'd invented another theory, you might perhaps have done something a thousand times more hideous. You ought to thank God, perhaps. How do you know? Perhaps God is saving you for something. But keep a good heart and have less fear. Are you afraid of the great expiation before you? No, it would be shameful to be afraid of it. Since you have taken such a step, you must harden your heart. There is justice in it. You must fulfill the demands of justice. I know that you don't believe it, but indeed, life will bring you through. You will live it down in time. What you need now is fresh air, fresh air, fresh air. Raskolnikov positively started. But who are you? What prophet are you? From the height of what majestic calm do you proclaim these words of wisdom? Who am I? I am a man with nothing to hope for, that's all. A man perhaps of feeling and sympathy, maybe of some knowledge too, but my day is over. But you are a different matter, there is life waiting for you. Though, who knows? Maybe your life, too, will pass off in smoke and come to nothing. Come, what does it matter, that you will pass into another class of men? It's not comfort you regret, with your heart. What of it that perhaps no one will see you for so long? It's not time, but yourself that will decide that. Be the sun and all will see you. The sun has before all to be the sun. Why are you smiling again? At my being such a shiller? I bet you're imagining that I am trying to get round you by flattery. Well, perhaps I am, he he he. Perhaps you'd better not believe my word, perhaps you'd better never believe it altogether, I'm made that way, I confess it. But let me add, you can judge for yourself, I think, how far I am a base sort of man and how far I am honest. When do you mean to arrest me? Well, I can let you walk about another day or two. Think it over, my dear fellow, and pray to God. It's more in your interest, believe me. And what if I run away? asked Raskolnikov with a strange smile. No, you won't run away. A peasant would run away, a fashionable dissenter would run away, the flunky of another man's thought, for you've only to show him the end of your little finger and he'll be ready to believe in anything for the rest of his life. But you've ceased to believe in your theory already, what will you run away with? And what would you do in hiding? It would be hateful and difficult for you, 
and what you need more than anything in life is a definite position, an atmosphere to suit you. And what sort of atmosphere would you have? If you ran away, you'd come back to yourself. You can't get on without us. And if I put you in prison, say you've been there a month, or two, or three, remember my word, you'll confess of yourself and perhaps to your own surprise. You won't know an hour beforehand that you are coming with a confession. I am convinced that you will decide to take your suffering. You don't believe my words now, but you'll come to it of yourself. For suffering, Radion Romanovich, is a great thing. Never mind my. Having grown fat, I know all the same. Don't laugh at it, there's an idea in suffering, Nikolai is right. No, you won't run away, Radion Romanovich. Raskolnikov got up and took his cap. Porfiry Petrovich also rose. Are you going for a walk? The evening will be fine, if only we don't have a storm. Though it would be a good thing to freshen the air. He, too, took his cap. Porfiry Petrovich, please don't take up the notion that I have confessed to you today, Raskolnikov pronounced with sullen insistence. You're a strange man and I have listened to you from simple curiosity. But I have admitted nothing, remember that. Oh, I know that, I'll remember. Look at him, he's trembling. Don't be uneasy, my dear fellow, have it your own way. Walk about a bit, you won't be able to walk too far. If anything happens, I have one request to make of you, he added, dropping his voice. It's an awkward one, but important. If anything were to happen, though indeed I don't believe in it and think you quite incapable of it, yet in case you were taken during these forty or fifty hours with the notion of putting an end to the business in some other way, in some fantastic fashion, laying hands on yourself, it's an absurd proposition, but you must forgive me for it, do leave a brief but precise note, only two lines, and mention the stone. It will be more generous. Come, till we meet. Good thoughts and sound decisions to you. Porfiry went out, stooping and avoiding looking at Raskolnikov. The latter went to the window and waited with irritable impatience till he calculated that Porfiry had reached the street and moved away. Then he too went hurriedly out of the room. He hurried to Svidrigailov's. What he had to hope from that man he did not know. But that man had some hidden power over him. Having once recognized this, he could not rest, and now the time had come. On the way, one question particularly worried him, had Svidrigailov been to Porphyry's? As far as he could judge, he would swear to it, that he had not. He pondered again and again, went over Porphyry's visit. No, he hadn't been, of course he hadn't. But if he had not been yet, would he go? Meanwhile, for the present he fancied he couldn't. Why? He could not have explained, but if he could, he would not have wasted much thought over it at the moment. It all worried him and at the same time he could not attend to it. Strange to say, none would have believed it perhaps, but he only felt a faint vague anxiety about his immediate future. Another, much more important anxiety tormented him, it concerned himself but in a different, more vital way. Moreover, he was conscious of immense moral fatigue, though his mind was working better that morning than it had done of late. And was it worthwhile, after all that had happened, to contend with these new trivial difficulties? Was it worthwhile, for instance, to maneuver that Svidrigailov should not go to Porphyry's? Was it worthwhile to investigate, to ascertain the facts, to waste time over anyone like Svidrigailov? Oh, how sick he was of it all! And yet he was hastening to Svidrigailov, could he be expecting something new from him, information, or means of escape? Men will catch at straws. Was it destiny or some instinct bringing them together? Perhaps it was only fatigue, despair, perhaps it was not Svidrigailov, but some other whom he needed, and Svidrigailov had simply presented himself by chance. Sonia? But what should he go to Sonia for now? To beg her tears again? He was afraid of Sonia, too. 
Sonia stood before him as an irrevocable sentence. He must go his own way or hers. At that moment especially he did not feel equal to seeing her. No, would it not be better to try Svidrigailov? And he could not help inwardly owning that he had long felt that he must see him for some reason. But what could they have in common? Their very evil doing could not be of the same kind. The man, moreover, was very unpleasant, evidently depraved, undoubtedly cunning and deceitful, possibly malignant. Such stories were told about him. It is true he was befriending Katerina Ivanovna's children, but who could tell with what motive and what it meant? The man always had some design, some project. There was another thought which had been continually hovering of late about Raskolnikov's mind and causing him great uneasiness. It was so painful that he made distinct efforts to get rid of it. He sometimes thought that Svidrigailov was dogging his footsteps. Svidrigailov had found out his secret and had had designs on Dunia. What if he had them still? Wasn't it practically certain that he had? And what if, having learned his secret and so having gained power over him, he were to use it as a weapon against Dunia? This idea sometimes even tormented his dreams, but it had never presented itself so vividly to him as on his way to Svidrigailov. The very thought moved him to gloomy rage. To begin with, this would transform everything, even his own position, he would have at once to confess his secret to Dunia. Would he have to give himself up perhaps to prevent Dunia from taking some rash step? The letter? This morning Dunia had received a letter. From whom could she get letters in Petersburg? Luzin, perhaps? It's true Razumihin was there to protect her, but Razumihin knew nothing of the position. Perhaps it was his duty to tell Razumihin? He thought of it with repugnance. In any case, he must see Svidrigailov as soon as possible, he decided finally. Thank God, the details of the interview were of little consequence, if only he could get at the root of the matter, but if Svidrigailov were capable, if he were intriguing against Dunia, then... Raskolnikov was so exhausted by what he had passed through that month that he could only decide such questions in one way, then I shall kill him, he thought in cold despair. A sudden anguish oppressed his heart, he stood still in the middle of the street and began looking about to see where he was and which way he was going. He found himself in X, Prospect, thirty or forty paces from the hay market, through which he had come. The whole second story of the house on the left was used as a tavern. All the windows were wide open, judging from the figures moving at the windows, the rooms were full to overflowing. There were sounds of singing, of clarionet and violin, and the boom of a Turkish drum. He could hear women shrieking. He was about to turn back wondering why he had come to the X prospect, when suddenly at one of the end. Windows he saw Svidrigailov, sitting at a tea table right in the open window with a pipe in his mouth. Raskolnikov was dreadfully taken aback, almost terrified. Svidrigailov was silently watching and scrutinizing him and, what struck Raskolnikov at once, seemed to be meaning to get up and slip away unobserved. Raskolnikov at once pretended not to have seen him, but to be looking absent-mindedly away, while he watched him out of the corner of his eye. His heart was beating violently. Yet, it was evident that Svidrigailov did not want to be seen. He took the pipe out of his mouth and was on the point of concealing himself, but as he got up and moved back his chair, he seemed to have become suddenly aware that Raskolnikov had seen him and was watching him. What had passed between them was much the same as what happened at their first meeting in Raskolnikov's room. A sly smile came into Svidrigailov's face and grew broader and broader. Each knew that he was seen and watched by the other. At last Svidrigailov broke into a loud laugh. Well, well, come in if you want me, I am here, he shouted from the window. Raskolnikov went up into the tavern. He found Svidrigailov in a tiny back room, adjoining the saloon in which merchants, clerks and numbers of people of all sorts were drinking tea at twenty little tables to the desperate bawling of a chorus of singers. The click of billiard balls could be heard in the distance. 
On the table before Svitergalev stood an open bottle and a glass half full of champagne. In the room, he found also a boy with a little hand organ, a healthy-looking red-cheeked girl of 18, wearing a tucked-up striped skirt, and a Tyrolese hat with ribbons. In spite of the chorus in the other room, she was singing some servant's hall song in a rather husky contralto, to the accompaniment of the organ. Come, that's enough, Svitergalev stopped her at Raskolnikov's entrance. The girl at once broke off and stood waiting respectfully. She had sung her guttural rhymes, too, with a serious and respectful expression in her face. Hey, Philip, a glass, shouted Svidrigalev. I won't drink anything, said Raskolnikov. As you like, I didn't mean it for you. Drink, Katya. I don't want anything more today, you can go. He poured her out a full glass and laid down a yellow note. Katya drank off her glass of wine, as women do, without putting it down, in twenty gulps, took the note and kissed Svitergalev's hand, which he allowed quite seriously. She went out of the room and the boy trailed after her with the organ. Both had been brought in from the street. Svitergalev had not been. A week in Petersburg, but everything about him was already, so to speak, on a patriarchal footing, the waiter, Philip, was by now an old friend and very obsequious. The door leading to the saloon had a lock on it. Svitergalev was at home in this room and perhaps spent whole days in it. The tavern was dirty and wretched, not even second-rate. I was going to see you and looking for you, Raskolnikov began, but I don't know what made me turn from the hay market into the X prospect just now. I never take this turning. I turn to the right from the hay market. And this isn't the way to you. I simply turned and here you are. It is strange. Why don't you say at once it's a miracle? Because it may be only chance. Oh, that's the way with all you folk, laughed Svitergalev. You won't admit it, even if you do inwardly believe it a miracle. Here you say that it may be only chance. And what cowards they all are here, about having an opinion of their own, you can't fancy, Radion Romanovich. I don't mean you, you have an opinion of your own and are not afraid to have it. That's how it was you attracted my curiosity. Nothing else? Well, that's enough, you know, Svitergalev was obviously exhilarated, but only slightly so, he had not had more than half a glass of wine. I fancy you came to see me before you knew that I was capable of having what you call an opinion of my own, observed Raskolnikov. Oh, well, it was a different matter. Everyone has his own plans. And apropos of the miracle, let me tell you that I think you have been asleep for the last two or three days. I told you of this tavern myself, there is no miracle in your coming straight here. I explained the way myself, told you where it was, and the hours you could find me here. Do you remember? I don't remember, answered Raskolnikov with surprise. I believe you. I told you twice. The address has been stamped mechanically on your memory. You turn this way mechanically and yet precisely according to the direction, though you are not aware of it. When I told you then, I hardly hoped you understood me. You give yourself away too much, Radion Romanovich. And another thing, I'm convinced there are lots of people in Petersburg who talk to themselves as they walk. This is a town of crazy people. If only we had scientific men, doctors, lawyers, and philosophers might make most valuable investigations in Petersburg each in his own line. There are few places where there are so many gloomy, strong, and queer influences on the soul of man as in Petersburg. The mere influences of climate mean so much. And it's the administrative center of all Russia, and its character must be reflected on the whole country. But that is neither here nor there now. The point is that I have several times watched you. You walk out of your house, holding your head high, twenty paces from home you let it sink, and fold your hands behind your back. You look and evidently see nothing before nor beside you. At last you begin moving your lips and talking to yourself, 
and sometimes you wave one hand and declaim and at last stand still in the middle of the road. That's not at all the thing. Someone may be watching you besides me, and it won't do you any good. It's nothing really to do with me, and I can't cure you, but, of course, you understand me. Do you know that I am being followed? asked Raskolnikov, looking inquisitively at him. No, I know nothing about it, said Svidrigailov, seeming surprised. Well, then, let us leave me alone, Raskolnikov muttered, frowning. Very good, let us leave you alone. You had better tell me, if you come here to drink, and directed me twice to come here to you, why did you hide, and try to get away just now when I looked at the window from the street? I saw it. He he. And why was it you lay on your sofa with closed eyes, and pretended to be asleep, though you were wide awake while I stood in your doorway? I saw it. I may have had reasons. You know that yourself. And I may have had my reasons, though you don't know them. Raskolnikov dropped his right elbow on the table, leaned his chin in the fingers of his right hand, and stared intently at Svidrigailov. For a full minute, he scrutinized his face, which had impressed him before. It was a strange face, like a mask, white and red, with bright red lips, with a flaxen beard, and still thick flaxen hair. His eyes were somehow too blue and their expression somehow too heavy and fixed. There was something awfully unpleasant in that handsome face, which looked so wonderfully young for his age. Svitergalev was smartly dressed in light summer clothes and was particularly dainty in his linen. He wore a huge ring with a precious stone in it. Have I got to bother myself about you, too, now? said Raskolnikov suddenly, coming with nervous impatience straight to the point. Even though perhaps you are the most dangerous man if you care to injure me, I don't want to put myself out any more. I will show you at once that I don't prize myself as you probably think I do. I've come to tell you at once that if you keep to your former intentions with regard to my sister and if you think to derive any benefit in that direction from what has been discovered of late, I will kill you before you get me locked up. You can reckon on my word. You know that I can keep it. And in the second place if you want to tell me anything, for I keep fancying all this time that you have something to tell me, make haste and tell it, for time is precious and very likely it will soon be too late. Why in such haste? asked Svitergalov, looking at him curiously. Everyone has his plans, Raskolnikov answered gloomily and impatiently. You urged me yourself to frankness just now and at the first question you refused to answer, Svitergalev observed with a smile. You keep fancying that I have aims of my own, and so you look at me with suspicion. Of course it's perfectly natural in your position. But though I should like to be friends with you, I shan't trouble myself to convince you of the contrary. The game isn't worth a candle, and I wasn't intending to talk to you about anything special. What did you want me, for, then? It was you who came hanging about me. Why, simply as an interesting subject for observation. I like the fantastic nature of your position, that's what it was. Besides you are the brother of a person who greatly interested me, and from that person I had in the past heard a very great deal about you, from which I gathered that you had a great influence over her, isn't that enough? Ha ha ha. Still, I must admit that your question is rather complex and is difficult for me to answer. Here, you, for instance, have come to me not only for a definite object, but for the sake of hearing something new. Isn't that so? Isn't that so? persisted Svitergalev with a sly smile. Well, can't you fancy then that I, too, on my way here in the train was reckoning on you, on your telling me something new, and on my making some profit out of you? You see what rich men we are. What profit could you make? How can I tell you? How do I know? You see in what a tavern I spend all my time and it's my enjoyment, that's to say it's no great enjoyment, but one must sit somewhere, that poor Katia now, you saw her? If only I had been a glutton now, a club gourmand, but you see I can eat this. He pointed to a little table in the corner where the remnants of a terrible-looking beefsteak and potatoes lay on a tin dish. 
Have you dined, by the way? I've had something and want nothing more. I don't drink, for instance, at all. Except for champagne, I never touch anything. And not more than a glass of that all the evening, and even that is enough to make my head ache. I ordered it just now to wind myself up, for I am just going off somewhere and you see me in a peculiar state of mind. That was why I hid myself, just now like a schoolboy, for I was afraid you would hinder me. But I believe, he pulled out his watch, I can spend an hour with you. It's half past four now. If only I'd been something, a landowner, a father, a cavalry officer, a photographer, a journalist. I am nothing, no specialty, and sometimes I am positively bored. I really thought you would tell me something new. But what are you, and why have you come here? What am I? You know, a gentleman, I served for two years in the cavalry, then I knocked about here in Petersburg, then I married Marfa Petrovna and lived in the country. There you have my biography. You are a gambler, I believe? No, a poor sort of gambler. A card sharper, not a gambler. You have been a card sharper then? Yes, I've been a card sharper too. Didn't you get thrashed sometimes? It did happen. Why? Why, you might have challenged them, altogether it must have been lively. I won't contradict you, and besides, I am no hand at philosophy. I confess that I hastened here for the sake of the women. As soon as you buried Marfa Petrovna? Quite so, Svidrigailov smiled with engaging candor. What of it? You seem to find something wrong in my speaking like that about women? You ask whether I find anything wrong in vice? Vice? Oh, that's what you are after. But I'll answer you in order, first about women in general, you know I am fond of talking. Tell me, what should I restrain myself for? Why should I give up women, since I have a passion for them? It's an occupation, anyway. So you hope for nothing here but vice? Oh, very well, for vice then. You insist on its being vice. But anyway, I like a direct question. In this vice at least there is something permanent, founded indeed upon nature and not dependent on fantasy, something present in the blood like an ever-burning ember, for ever setting one on fire and, maybe, not. To be quickly extinguished, even with years. You'll agree it's an occupation of a sort. That's nothing to rejoice at, it's a disease and a dangerous one. Oh, that's what you think, is it? I agree that it is a disease like everything that exceeds moderation. And, of course, in this one must exceed moderation. But in the first place, everybody does so in one way or another, and in the second place, of course, one ought to be moderate and prudent, however mean it may be, but what am I to do? If I hadn't this, I might have to shoot myself. I am ready to admit that a decent man ought to put up with being bored, but yet. And could you shoot yourself? Oh, come! Svitergalev parried with disgust. Please don't speak of it, he added hurriedly and with none of the bragging tone he had shown at all the previous conversation. His face quite changed. I admit it's an unpardonable weakness, but I can't help it. I am afraid of death and I dislike its being talked of. Do you know that I am to a certain extent a mystic? Ah, the apparitions of Marfa Petrovna. Do they still go on visiting you? Oh, don't talk of them, there have been no more in Petersburg, confound them, he cried with an air of irritation. Let's rather talk of that, though. Hum. I have not much time, and can't stay long with you, it's a pity. I should have found plenty to tell you. What's your engagement, a woman? Yes, a woman, a casual incident. No, that's not what I want to talk of. And the hideousness, the filthiness of all your surroundings, doesn't that affect you? Have you lost the strength to stop yourself? 
And do you pretend to strength, too? He he he. You surprised me just now, Radion Romanovich, though I knew beforehand it would be so. You preached to me about vice and aesthetics. You, a Schiller, you, an idealist. Of course that's all as it should be, and it would be surprising if it were not so, yet it is strange in reality. Ah, what a pity I have no time, for you're a most interesting type. And, by the way, are you fond of Schiller? I am awfully fond of him. But what a braggart you are, Raskolnikov said with some disgust. Upon my word, I am not, answered Svidrigailov laughing. However, I won't dispute it. Let me be a braggart. Why not brag, if it hurts no one? I spent seven years in the country with Marfa Petrovna, so now when I come across an intelligent person like you, intelligent and highly interesting, I am simply glad to talk and, besides, I've drunk that half glass of champagne and it's gone to my head a little. And besides, there's a certain fact that has wound me up tremendously, but about that I will keep quiet. Where are you off to? he asked in alarm. Raskolnikov had begun getting up. He felt oppressed and stifled and, as it were, ill at ease at having come here. He felt convinced that Svidrigailov was the most worthless scoundrel on the face of the earth. A-A-C-H. Sit down, stay a little. Svidrigailov begged. Let them bring you some tea, anyway. Stay a little, I won't talk nonsense, about myself, I mean. I'll tell you something. If you like, I'll tell you how a woman tried to save me, as you would call it? It will be an answer to your first question indeed, for the woman was your sister. May I tell you? It will help to spend the time. Tell me, but I trust that you. Oh, don't be uneasy. Besides, even in a worthless low fellow like me, Adosha Romanovna can only excite the deepest respect. You know perhaps, yes, I told you myself, began Svidrigailov, that I was in the debtor's prison here, for an immense sum, and had not any expectation of being able to pay it. There's no need to go into particulars how Marfa Petrovna bought me out. Do you know to what a point of insanity a woman can sometimes love? She was an honest woman, and very sensible, although completely uneducated. Would you believe that this honest and jealous woman, after many scenes of hysterics and reproaches, condescended to enter into a kind of contract with me which she kept throughout our married life? She was considerably older than I, and besides, she always kept a clove or something in her mouth. There was so much swinishness in my soul and honesty too, of a sort, as to tell her straight out that I couldn't be absolutely faithful to her. This confession drove her to frenzy, but yet she seems in a way to have liked my brutal frankness. She thought it showed I was unwilling to deceive her if I warned her like this beforehand and for a jealous woman, you know, that's the first consideration. After many tears an unwritten contract was drawn up between us, first, that I would never leave Marfa Petrovna and would always be her husband, secondly, that I would never absent myself without her permission, thirdly, that I would never set up a permanent mistress, fourthly, in return for this, Marfa Petrovna gave me a free hand with the maidservants, but only with her secret knowledge, fifthly, God forbid my falling in love with a woman of our class, sixthly, in case I, which God forbid, should be visited by a great serious passion I was bound to reveal it to Marfa Petrovna. On this last score, however, Marfa Petrovna was fairly at ease. She was a sensible woman, and so she could not help looking upon me as a dissolute profligate incapable of real love. But a sensible woman and a jealous woman are two very different things, and that's where the trouble came in. But to judge some people impartially we must renounce certain preconceived opinions and our habitual attitude to the ordinary people about us. I have reason to have faith in your judgment rather than in anyone's. Perhaps you have already heard a great deal that was ridiculous and absurd about Marfa Petrovna. She certainly had some very ridiculous ways, but I tell you frankly that I feel really sorry for the innumerable woes of which I was the cause. Well, and that's enough, I think, by way of a decorous or ice in funebra, for the most tender wife of a most tender husband. When we quarreled, I usually 
held my tongue and did not irritate her and that gentlemanly conduct rarely failed to attain its object, it influenced her, it pleased her, indeed. These were times when she was positively proud of me. But your sister she couldn't put up with, anyway. And however she came to risk taking such a beautiful creature into her house as a governess. My explanation is that Marfa Petrovna was an ardent and impressionable woman and simply fell in love herself, literally fell in love, with your sister. Well, little wonder, look at Adosha Romanovna. I saw the danger at the first glance, and what do you think, I resolved not to look at her even. But Adosha Romanovna herself made the first step, would you believe it? Would you believe it too that Marfa Petrovna was positively angry with me at first for my persistent silence about your sister, for my careless reception of her continual adoring praises of Abdosha Romanovna? I don't know what it was she wanted. Well, of course, Marfa Petrovna told Abdosha Romanovna every detail about me. She had the unfortunate habit of telling literally everyone all our family secrets and continually complaining of me. How could she fail to confide in such a delightful new friend? I expect they talked of nothing else but me and no doubt Abdosha Romanovna heard all those dark mysterious rumors that were current about me. I don't mind betting that you two have heard something of the sort already? I have. Luzin charged you with having caused the death of a child. Is that true? Don't refer to those vulgar tales, I beg, said Svidrigailov with disgust and annoyance. If you insist on wanting to know about all that idiocy, I will tell you one day, but now. I was told too about some footman of yours in the country whom you treated badly. I beg you to drop the subject, Svidrigailov interrupted again with obvious impatience. Was that the footman who came to you after death to fill your pipe? You told me about it yourself. Raskolnikov felt more and more irritated. Svitergilov looked at him attentively and Raskolnikov fancied he caught a flash of spiteful mockery in that look. But Svitergilov restrained himself and answered very civilly. Yes, it was. I see that you, too, are extremely interested and shall feel it my duty to satisfy your curiosity at the first opportunity. Upon my soul. I see that I really might pass for a romantic figure with some people. Judge how grateful I must be to Marfa Petrovna for having repeated to Abdosha Romanovna such mysterious and interesting gossip about me. I dare not guess what impression it made on her, but in any case it worked in my interests. With all Abdosha Romanovna's natural aversion and in spite of my invariably gloomy and repellent aspect, she did at least feel pity for me, pity for a lost soul. And if once a girl's heart is moved to pity, it's more dangerous than anything. She is bound to want to save him, to bring him to his senses, and lift him up and draw him to nobler aims, and restore him to new life and usefulness, well, we all know how far such dreams can go. I saw at once that the bird was flying into the cage of herself. And I too made ready. I think you are frowning, Radion Romanovich. There's no need. As you know, it all ended in smoke. Hang it all, what a lot I am drinking. Do you know, I always, from the very beginning, regretted that it wasn't your sister's fate to be born in the second or third century AD, as the daughter of a reigning prince or some governor or proconsul in Asia Minor. She would undoubtedly have been one of those who would endure martyrdom and would have smiled when they branded her bosom with hot pincers. And she would have gone to it of herself. And in the 4th or 5th century she would have walked away into the Egyptian desert and would have stayed there thirty years living on roots and ecstasies and visions. She is simply thirsting to face some torture for someone, and if she can't get her torture, she'll throw herself out of a window. I've heard something of a Mr. Razumihin, he's said to be a sensible fellow, his surname suggests it, indeed. He's probably a divinity student. Well, he'd better look after your sister. I believe I understand her, and I am proud of it. But at the beginning of an acquaintance, as you know, one is apt to be more heedless and stupid. One doesn't see clearly. Hang it all, why is she so handsome? 
it's not my fault. In fact, it began on my side with a most irresistible physical desire. Abdosha Romanovna is awfully chaste, incredibly and phenomenally so. Take note, I tell you this about your sister as a fact. She is almost morbidly chaste, in spite of her broad intelligence, and it will stand in her way. There happened to be a girl in the house then, Parasha, a black-eyed wench, whom I had never seen before, she had just come from another village, very pretty, but incredibly stupid, she burst into tears, wailed so that she could be heard all over the place and caused scandal. One day after dinner Abdosha Romanovna followed me into an avenue in the garden and with flashing eyes insisted on my leaving poor Parasha alone. It was almost our first conversation by ourselves. I, of course, was only too pleased to obey her wishes, tried to appear disconcerted, embarrassed, in fact played my part not badly. Then came interviews, mysterious conversations, exhortations, entreaties, supplications, even tears, would you believe it, even tears? Think what the passion for propaganda will bring some girls to. I, of course, threw it all on my destiny, posed as hungering and thirsting for light, and finally resorted to the most powerful weapon in the subjection of the female heart, a weapon which never fails one. It's the well-known resource, flattery. Nothing in the world is harder than speaking the truth and nothing easier than flattery. If there's the hundredth part of a false note in speaking the truth, it leads to a discord, and that leads to trouble. But if all, to the last note, is false and flattery, it is just as agreeable, and is heard not without satisfaction. It may be a coarse satisfaction, but still a satisfaction. And however coarse the flattery, at least half will be sure to seem true. That's so for all stages of development and classes of society. A vestal virgin might be seduced by flattery. I can never remember without laughter how I once seduced a lady who was devoted to her husband, her children, and her principles. What fun it was, and how little trouble! And the lady really had principles, of her own, anyway. All my tactics lay in simply being utterly annihilated and prostrate before her purity. I flattered her shamelessly, and as soon as I succeeded in getting a pressure of the hand, even a glance from her, I would reproach myself for having snatched it by force, and would declare that she had resisted, so that I could never have gained anything but for my being so unprincipled. I maintained that she was so innocent that she could not foresee my treachery, and yielded to me unconsciously, unawares, and so on. In fact, I triumphed, while my lady remained firmly convinced that she was innocent, chaste, and faithful to all her duties and obligations and had succumbed quite by accident. And how angry she was with me when I explained to her at last that it was my sincere conviction that she was just as eager as I, poor Marfa Petrovna was awfully weak on the side of flattery, and if I had only cared to, I might have had all her property settled on me during her lifetime. I am drinking an awful lot of wine now and talking too much. I hope you won't be angry if I mention now that I was beginning to produce the same effect on Abdosha Romanovna. But I was stupid and impatient and spoiled it all. Abdosha Romanovna had several times, and one time in particular, been greatly displeased by the expression of my eyes, would you believe it? There was sometimes a light in them which frightened her and grew stronger and stronger and more unguarded till it was hateful to her. No need to go into detail, but we parted. There I acted stupidly again. I felt a jeering in the coarsest way at all such propaganda and efforts to convert me. Parasha came onto the scene again, and not she alone, in fact there was a tremendous to-do. Ah, Radayan Romanovich, if you could only see how your sister's eyes can flash sometimes. Never mind my being drunk at this moment and having had a whole glass of wine. I am speaking the truth. I assure you that this glance has haunted my dreams, the very rustle of her dress was more than I could stand at last. I really began to think that I might become epileptic. I could never have believed that I could be moved to such a frenzy. It was essential, indeed, to be reconciled, but by then it was impossible. And imagine what I did then. To what a pitch of stupidity a man can be brought by frenzy. 
Never undertake anything in a frenzy, Radion Romanovich. I reflected that Avdosha Romanovna was after all a beggar, ACH, excuse me, that's not the word, but does it matter if it expresses the meaning, that she lived by her work, that she had her mother and you to keep, ACH, hang it, you are frowning again, and I resolved to offer her all my money, 30,000 rubles I could have realized then, if she would run away with me here, to Petersburg. Of course I should have vowed eternal love, rapture, and so on. Do you know, I was so wild about her at that time that if she had told me to poison Marfa Petrovna or to cut her throat and to marry herself, it would have been done at once. But it ended in the catastrophe of which you know already. You can fancy how frantic I was when I heard that Marfa Petrovna had got hold of that scoundrelly attorney, Lizin, and had almost made a match between them, which would really have been just the same thing as I was proposing. Wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? I noticed that you've begun to be very attentive, you interesting young man. Svitergilov struck the table with his fist impatiently. He was flushed. Raskolnikov saw clearly that the glass or glass and a half of champagne that he had sipped almost unconsciously was affecting him, and he resolved to take advantage of the opportunity. He felt very suspicious of Svitergalov. Well, after what you have said, I am fully convinced that you have come to Petersburg with designs on my sister, he said directly to Svitergalov, in order to irritate him further. Oh, nonsense, said Svitergalov, seeming to rouse himself. Why, I told you, besides your sister can't endure me. Yes, I am certain that she can't, but that's not the point. Are you so sure that she can't? Svitergalov screwed up his eyes and smiled mockingly. You are right, she doesn't love me, but you can never be sure of what has passed between husband and wife or lover and mistress. There's always a little corner which remains a secret to the world and is only known to those two. Will you answer for it that Avdosha Romanovna regarded me with aversion? From some words you've dropped, I notice that you still have designs, and of course evil ones, on Dunya and mean to carry them out promptly. What, have I dropped words like that? Svitergalov asked in naive dismay, taking not the slightest notice of the epithet bestowed on his designs. Why, you are dropping them even now. Why are you so frightened? What are you so afraid of now? Me, afraid? Afraid of you? You have rather to be afraid of me, Cher Ami. But what nonsense. I've drunk too much though, I see that. I was almost saying too much again. Damn the wine! Hi! There, water! He snatched up the champagne bottle and flung it without ceremony out of the window. Philip brought the water. That's all nonsense, said Svidrigalov, wetting a towel and putting it to his head. But I can answer you in one word and annihilate all your suspicions. Do you know that I am going to get married? You told me so before. Did I? I've forgotten. But I couldn't have told you so for certain for I had not even seen my betrothed, I only meant to. But now I really have a betrothed and it's a settled thing, and if it weren't that I have business that can't be put off, I would have taken you to see them at once, for I should like to ask your advice. ACH, hang it, only ten minutes left. See, look at the watch. But I must tell you, for it's an interesting story, my marriage, in its own way. Where are you off to? Going again? No, I'm not going away now. Not at all? We shall see. I'll take you there, I'll show you my betrothed, only not now. For you'll soon have to be off. You have to go to the right and I to the left. Do you know that Madame Reslich, the woman I am lodging with now, eh? I know what you're thinking, that she's the woman whose girl they say drowned herself in the winter. Come, are you listening? She arranged it all for me. You're bored, she said, you want something to fill up your time. For, you know, I am a gloomy, depressed person. Do you think I'm light-hearted? No. 
I'm gloomy. I do no harm, but sit in a corner without speaking a word for three days at a time. And that wrestlage is a sly hussy, I tell you. I know what she has got in her mind, she thinks I shall get sick of it, abandon my wife and depart, and she'll get hold of her and make a profit out of her, in our class, of course, or higher. She told me the father was a broken-down retired official, who has been sitting in a chair for the last three years with his legs paralyzed. The mama, she said, was a sensible woman. There is a son serving in the provinces, but he doesn't help. There is a daughter, who is married, but she doesn't visit them. And they've two little nephews on their hands, as though. Their own children were not enough, and they've taken from school their youngest daughter, a girl who'll be sixteen in another month, so that then she can be married. She was for me. We went there. How funny it was. I present myself, a landowner, a widower, of a well-known name, with connections, with a fortune. What if I am fifty and she is not sixteen? Who thinks of that? But it's fascinating, isn't it? It is fascinating, ha ha. You should have seen how I talked to the papa and mama. It was worth paying to have seen me at that moment. She comes in, curtsies, you can fancy, still in a short frock, an unopened bud. Flushing like a sunset, she had been told, no doubt. I don't know how you feel about female faces, but to my mind these sixteen years, these childish eyes, shyness and tears of bashfulness are better than beauty, and she is a perfect little picture, too. Fair hair and little curls, like a lamb's, full little rosy lips, tiny feet, a charmer. Well, we made friends. I told them I was in a hurry owing to domestic circumstances, and the next day, that is the day before yesterday, we were betrothed. When I go now, I take her on my knee at once and keep her there. Well, she flushes like a sunset and I kiss her every minute. Her mama of course impresses on her that this is her husband and that this must be so. It's simply delicious. The present betrothed condition is perhaps better than marriage. Here you have what is called la nature et la verite, ha ha. I've talked to her twice, she is far from a fool. Sometimes she steals a look at me that positively scorches me. Her face is like Raphael's Madonna. You know, the Sistine Madonna's face has something fantastic in it, the face of mournful religious ecstasy. Haven't you noticed it? Well, she's something in that line. The day after we'd been betrothed, I bought her presents to the value of 1,500 rubles, a set of diamonds and another of pearls and a silver dressing case as large as this, with all sorts of things in it, so that even my Madonna's face glowed. I sat her on my knee yesterday, and I suppose rather too unceremoniously, she flushed crimson and the tears started, but she didn't want to show it. We were left alone, she suddenly flung herself on my neck, for the first time of her own accord, put her little arms round me, kissed me, and vowed that she would be an obedient, faithful, and good wife, would make me happy, would devote all her life, every minute of her life, would sacrifice everything, everything, and that all she asks in return is my respect, and that she wants nothing, nothing more from me, no presents. You'll admit that to hear such a confession, alone, from an angel of sixteen in a muslin frock, with little curls, with a flush of maiden shyness in her cheeks and tears of enthusiasm in her eyes is rather fascinating. Isn't it fascinating? It's worth paying for, isn't it? Well, listen, we'll go to see my betrothed, only not just now. The fact is this monstrous difference in age and development excites your sensuality. Will you really make such a marriage? Why, of course. Everyone thinks of himself, and he lives most gaily who knows best how to deceive himself. Ha ha. But why are you so keen about virtue? Have mercy on me, my good friend. I am a sinful man. Ha ha ha. But you have provided for the children of Katerina Ivanovna. Though, though you had your own reasons. I understand it all now. I am always fond of children, very fond of them, laughed Svidrigailov. 
I can tell you one curious instance of it. The first day I came here, I visited various haunts. After seven years, I simply rushed at them. You probably noticed that I am not in a hurry to renew acquaintance with my old friends. I shall do without them as long as I can. Do you know, when I was with Marfa Petrovna in the country, I was haunted by the thought of these places where anyone who knows his way about can find a great deal. Yes, upon my soul. The peasants have vodka, the educated young people, shut out from activity, waste themselves in impossible dreams and visions, and are crippled by theories, Jews have sprung up and are amassing money, and all the rest give themselves up to debauchery. From the first hour, the town reeked of its familiar odors. I chanced to be in a frightful den, I like my dens dirty, it was a dance, so called, and there was a can-can such as I never saw in my day. Yes, there you have progress. All of a sudden I saw a little girl of thirteen, nicely dressed, dancing with a specialist in that line, with another one this a this. Her mother was sitting on a chair by the wall. You can't fancy what a can-can that was. The girl was ashamed, blushed, at last felt insulted, and began to cry. Her partner seized her and began whirling her round and performing before her, everyone laughed and, I like your public, even the can-can public, they laughed and shouted, serves her right, serves her right. Shouldn't bring children. Well, it's not my business whether that consoling reflection was logical or not. I at once fixed on my plan, sat down by the mother, and began by saying that I too was a stranger and that people here were ill-bred and that they couldn't distinguish decent folks and treat them with respect, gave her to understand that I had plenty of money, offered to take them home in my carriage. I took them home and got to know them. They were lodging in a miserable little hole and had only just arrived from the country. She told me that she and her daughter could only regard my acquaintance as an honor. I found out that they had nothing of their own and had come to town upon some legal business. I proffered my services and money. I learned that they had gone to the dancing saloon by mistake, believing that it was a genuine dancing class. I offered to assist in the young girl's education in French and dancing. My offer was accepted with enthusiasm as an honor, and we are still friendly. If you like, we'll go and see them, only not just now. Stop! Enough of your vile, nasty anecdotes, depraved vile, sensual man. Schiller, you are a regular Schiller. Oh, lover to VATLSE Nitcher? But you know I shall tell you these things on purpose, for the pleasure of hearing your outcries. I dare say. I can see I am ridiculous myself, muttered Raskolnikov angrily. Svidrigailov laughed heartily, finally he called Philip, paid his bill, and began getting up. I say, but I am drunk, says Kaz, he said. It's been a pleasure. I should rather think it must be a pleasure, cried Raskolnikov, getting up. No doubt it is a pleasure for a worn-out profligate to describe such adventures with a monstrous project of the same sort in his mind, especially under such circumstances and to such a man as me. It's stimulating. Well, if you come to that, Svidrigailov answered, scrutinizing Raskolnikov with some surprise, if you come to that, you are a thorough cynic yourself. You've plenty to make you so, anyway. You can understand a great deal and you can do a great deal too. But enough. I sincerely regret not having had more talk with you, but I shan't lose sight of you. Only wait a bit. Svidrigailov walked out of the restaurant. Raskolnikov walked out after him. Svidrigailov was not however very drunk, the wine had affected him for a moment, but it was passing off every minute. He was preoccupied with something of importance and was frowning. He was apparently excited and uneasy in anticipation of something. His manner to Raskolnikov had changed during the last few minutes, and he was ruder and more sneering every moment. Raskolnikov noticed all this, and he too was uneasy. He became very suspicious of Svidrigailov and resolved to follow him. They came out onto the pavement. You go to the right, 
and I to the left, or if you like, the other way. Only adieu, mon plaisir, may we meet again. And he walked to the right towards the hay market. Raskolnikov walked after him. What's this? cried Svidrigilov turning round. I thought I said. It means that I am not going to lose sight of you now. What? Both stood still and gazed at one another, as though measuring their strength. From all your half-tipsy stories, Raskolnikov observed harshly, I am positive that you have not given up your designs on my sister, but are pursuing them more actively than ever. I have learned that my sister received a letter this morning. You have hardly been able to sit still all this time. You may have unearthed a wife on the way, but that means nothing. I should like to make certain myself. Raskolnikov could hardly have said himself what he wanted and of what he wished to make certain. Upon my word. I'll call the police. Call away. Again they stood for a minute facing each other. At last Svidrigailov's face changed. Having satisfied himself that Raskolnikov was not frightened at his threat, he assumed a mirthful and friendly air. What a fellow! I purposely refrain from referring to your affair, though I am devoured by curiosity. It's a fantastic affair. I've put it off till another time, but you're enough to rouse the dead. Well, let us go, only I warn you beforehand I am only going home for a moment, to get some money, then I shall lock up the flat, take a cab and go to spend the evening at the islands. Now, now are you going to follow me? I'm coming to your lodgings, not to see you, but Sofia Semyonovna, to say I'm sorry not to have been at the funeral. That's as you like, but Sofia Semyonovna is not at home. She has taken the three children to an old lady of high rank, the patroness of some orphan asylums, whom I used to know years ago. I charmed the old lady by depositing a sum of money with her to provide for the three children of Katerina Ivanovna and subscribing to the institution as well. I told her too the story of Sofia Semyonovna in full detail, suppressing nothing. It produced an indescribable effect on her. That's why Sofia Semyonovna has been invited to call today at the X Hotel where the lady is staying for the time. No matter, I'll come all the same. As you like, it's nothing to me, but I won't come with you, here we are at home. By the way, I am convinced that you regard me with suspicion just because I have shown such delicacy and have not so far troubled you with questions, you understand? It struck you as extraordinary, I don't mind betting it's that. Well, it teaches one to show delicacy. And to listen at doors. Ah, that's it, is it? laughed Svidrigailov. Yes, I should have been surprised if you had let that pass after all that has happened. Ha ha! Though I did understand something of the pranks you had been up to and were telling Sofia Semyonovna about, what was the meaning of it? Perhaps I am quite behind the times and can't understand. For goodness sake, explain it, my dear boy. Expound the latest theories. You couldn't have heard anything. You're making it all up. But I'm not talking about that, though I did hear something. No, I'm talking of the way you keep sighing and groaning now. The Schiller in you is in revolt every moment, and now you tell me not to listen at doors. If that's how you feel, go and inform the police that you had this mischance, you made a little mistake in your theory. But if you are convinced that one mustn't listen at doors, but one may murder old women at one's pleasure, you'd better be off to America and make haste. Run, young man. There may still be time. I'm speaking sincerely. Haven't you the money? I'll give you the fare. I'm not thinking of that at all, Raskolnikov interrupted with disgust. I understand, but don't put yourself out, don't discuss it if you don't want to. I understand the questions you are worrying over, moral ones, aren't they? Duties of citizen and man? Lay them all aside. They are nothing to you now, ha ha. You'll say you are still a man and a citizen. 
If so, you ought not to have got into this coil. It's no use taking up a job you are not fit for. Well, you'd better shoot yourself, or don't you want to? You seem trying to enrage me, to make me leave you. What a queer fellow. But here we are. Welcome to the staircase. You see, that's the way to Sofia Semyonovna. Look, there is no one at home. Don't you believe me? Asked Kapernamov. She leaves the key with him. Here is Madame de Kapernamov herself. Hey, what? She is rather deaf. Has she gone out? Where? Did you hear? She is not in and won't be till late in the evening, probably. Well, come to my room. You wanted to come and see me, didn't you? Here we are. Madame Reslich is not at home. She is a woman who is always busy, an excellent woman, I assure you. She might have been of use to you if you had been a little more sensible. Now, see. I take this 5% bond out of the bureau, see what a lot I've got of them still, this one will be turned into cash today. I mustn't waste any more time. The bureau is locked, the flat is locked, and here we are again on the stairs. Shall we take a cab? I'm going to the islands. Would you like a lift? I'll take this carriage. Ah, you refuse? You are tired of it. Come for a drive. I believe it will come on to rain. Never mind, we'll put down the hood. Svidrigailov was already in the carriage. Raskolnikov decided that his suspicions were at least for that moment unjust. Without answering a word he turned and walked back towards the hay market. If he had only turned round on his way he might have seen Svidrigailov get out not a hundred paces off dismiss the cab and walk along the pavement. But he had turned the corner and could see nothing. Intense disgust drew him away from Svidrigailov. To think that I could for one instant have looked for help from that coarse brute, that depraved sensualist and blackguard, he cried. Raskolnikov's judgment was uttered too lightly and hastily, there was something about Svidrigailov which gave him a certain original, even a mysterious character. As concerned his sister, Raskolnikov was convinced that Svidrigailov would not leave her in peace. But it was too tiresome and unbearable to go on thinking and thinking about this. When he was alone, he had not gone twenty paces before he sank, as usual, into deep thought. On the bridge he stood by the railing and began gazing at the water. And his sister was standing close by him. He met her at the entrance to the bridge but passed by without seeing her. Dunia had never met him like this in the street before and was struck with dismay. She stood still and did not know whether to call to him or not. Suddenly she saw Svidrigailov coming quickly from the direction of the hay market. He seemed to be approaching cautiously. He did not go onto the bridge, but stood aside on the pavement, doing all he could to avoid Raskolnikov seeing him. He had observed Dunia for some time and had been making signs to her. She fancied he was signaling to beg her not to speak to her brother, but to come to him. That was what Dunia did. She stole by her brother and went up to Svidrigailov. Let us make haste away, Svidrigailov whispered to her, I don't want Radion Romanovich to know of our meeting. I must tell you I've been sitting with him in the restaurant close by, where he looked me up and I had great difficulty in getting rid of him. He has somehow heard of my letter to you and suspects something. It wasn't you who told him, of course, but if not you, who then? Well, we've turned the corner now, Dunia interrupted, and my brother won't see us. I have to tell you that I am going no further with you. Speak to me here. You can tell it all in the street. In the first place, I can't say it in the street. Secondly, you must hear Sofia Semyonovna too. And, thirdly, I will show you some papers. Oh well, if you won't agree to come with me, I shall refuse to give any explanation and go away at once. 
but I beg you not to forget that a very curious secret of your beloved brothers is entirely in my keeping. Dunia stood still, hesitating, and looked at Svitergalev with searching eyes. What are you afraid of? he observed quietly. The town is not the country. And even in the country you did me more harm than I did you. Have you prepared Sofia Semyonovna? No, I have not said a word to her and am not quite certain whether she is at home now. But most likely she is. She has buried her stepmother today, she is not likely to go visiting on such a day. For the time I don't want to speak to anyone about it and I half regret having spoken to you. The slightest indiscretion is as bad as betrayal in a thing like this. I live there in that house, we are coming to it. That's the porter of our house, he knows me very well, you see, he's bowing, he sees I'm coming with a lady, and no doubt he has noticed your face already, and you will be glad of that if you are afraid of me and suspicious. Excuse my putting things so coarsely. I haven't a flat to myself, Sofia Semyonovna's room is next to mine, she lodges in the next flat. The whole floor is let out in lodgings. Why are you frightened like a child? Am I really so terrible? Svitergilov's lips were twisted in a condescending smile, but he was in no smiling mood. His heart was throbbing and he could scarcely breathe. He spoke rather loud to cover his growing excitement. But Dunia did not notice. This peculiar excitement, she was so irritated by his remark that she was frightened of him like a child and that he was so terrible to her. Though I know that you are not a man, of honor, I am not in the least afraid of you. Lead the way, she said with apparent composure, but her face was very pale. Svitergalev stopped at Sonia's room. Allow me to inquire whether she is at home. She is not. How unfortunate. But I know she may come quite soon. If she's gone out, it can only be to see a lady about the orphans. Their mother is dead. I've been meddling and making arrangements for them. If Sofia Semyonovna does not come back in ten minutes, I will send her to you, today if you like. This is my flat. These are my two rooms. Madame Reslich, my landlady, has the next room. Now, look this way. I will show you my chief piece of evidence. This door from my bedroom leads into two perfectly empty rooms, which are to let. Here they are. You must look into them with some attention. Svitergalev occupied two fairly large furnished rooms. Dunia was looking about her mistrustfully but saw nothing special in the furniture or position of the rooms. Yet there was something to observe, for instance, that Svitergalev's flat was exactly between two sets of almost uninhabited apartments. His rooms were not entered directly from the passage, but through the landlady's two almost empty rooms. Unlocking a door leading out of his bedroom, Svitergalev showed Dunia the two empty rooms that were to let. Dunia stopped in the doorway, not knowing what she was called to look upon, but Svitergalev hastened to explain. Look here, at this second large room. Notice that door, it's locked. By the door stands a chair, the only one in the two rooms. I brought it from my rooms so as to listen more conveniently. Just the other side of the door is Sofia Semyonovna's table. She sat there talking to Radion Romanovich. And I sat here listening on two successive evenings, for two hours each time, and of course I was able to learn something, what do you think? You listened? Yes, I did. Now come back to my room, we can't sit down here. He brought Avdosha Romanovna back into his sitting room and offered her a chair. He sat down at the opposite side of the table, at least seven feet from her, but probably there was the same glow in his eyes which had once frightened Dunia so much. She shuddered and once more looked about her distrustfully. It was an involuntary gesture, she evidently did not wish to betray her uneasiness. But the secluded position of Svitergalev's lodging had suddenly struck her. She wanted to ask whether his landlady at least were at home, 
but pride kept her from asking. Moreover, she had another trouble in her heart incomparably greater than fear for herself. She was in great distress. Here is your letter, she said, laying it on the table. Can it be true what you write? You hint at a crime committed, you say, by my brother. You hint at it too clearly, you daren't deny it now. I must tell you that I'd heard of this stupid story before you wrote and don't believe a word of it. It's a disgusting and ridiculous suspicion. I know the story and why and how it was invented. You can have no proofs. You promise to prove it. Speak. But let me warn you that I don't believe you. I don't believe you. Dunia said this, speaking hurriedly, and for an instant the color rushed to her face. If you didn't believe it, how could you risk coming alone to my rooms? Why have you come? Simply from curiosity? Don't torment me. Speak, speak. There's no denying that you are a brave girl. Upon my word, I thought you would have asked Mr. Razumahin to escort you here. But he was not with you nor anywhere near. I was on the lookout. It's spirited of you, it proves you wanted to spare Radion Romanovich. But everything is divine in you. About your brother, what am I to say to you? You've just seen him yourself. What did you think of him? Surely that's not the only thing you are building on? No, not on that, but on his own words. He came here on two successive evenings to see Sofia Semyonovna. I've shown you where they sat. He made a full confession to her. He is a murderer. He killed an old woman, a pawnbroker, with whom he had pawned things himself. He killed her sister too, a peddler woman called Lizavita, who happened to come in while he was murdering her sister. He killed them with an axe he brought with him. He murdered them to rob them and he did rob them. He took money and various things. He told all this, word for word, to Sofia Semyonovna, the only person who knows his secret. But she has had no share by word or deed in the murder, she was as horrified at it as you are now. Don't be anxious, she won't betray him. It cannot be, muttered Dunya, with white lips. She gasped for breath. It cannot be. There was not the slightest cause, no sort of ground. It's a lie, a lie. He robbed her, that was the cause, he took money and things. It's true that by his own admission he made no use of the money or things, but hid them under a stone where they are now. But that was because he dared not make use of them. But how could he steal, rob? How could he dream of it, cried Dunia, and she jumped up from the chair. Why, you know him, and you've seen him, can he be a thief? She seemed to be imploring Svitergalev, she had entirely forgotten her fear. There are thousands and millions of combinations and possibilities of Dosha Romanovna. A thief steals and knows he is a scoundrel, but I've heard of a gentleman who broke open the mail. Who knows, very likely he thought he was doing a gentlemanly thing. Of course I should not have believed it myself if I'd been told of it as you have, but I believe my own ears. He explained all the causes of it to Sofia Semyonovna too, but she did not believe her ears at first yet she believed her own eyes at last. What were the causes? It's a long story, Adosha Romanovna. Here's, how shall I tell you, a theory of a sort, the same one by which I for instance consider that a single misdeed is permissible if the principal aim is right, a solitary wrongdoing and hundreds of good deeds. It's galling too, of course, for a young man of gifts and overweening pride to know that if he had, for instance, a paltry three thousand, his whole career, his whole future would be differently shaped and yet not to have that three thousand. Add to that, nervous irritability from hunger, from lodging in a hole, from rags, from a vivid sense of the charm of his social position and his sister's and mother's position too. Above all, vanity, pride and vanity, though goodness knows he may have good qualities too. 
I am not blaming him, please don't think it, besides, it's not my business. A special little theory came in too, a theory of a sort, dividing mankind, you see, into material and superior persons, that is persons to whom the law does not apply owing to their superiority, who make laws for the rest of mankind, the material, that is. It's all right as a theory, un theory come un outra. Napoleon attracted him tremendously, that is, what affected him was that a great many men of genius have not hesitated at wrongdoing, but have overstepped the law without thinking about it. He seems to have fancied that he was a genius too, that is, he was convinced of it for a time. He has suffered a great deal and is still suffering from the idea that he could make a theory, but was incapable of boldly overstepping the law, and so he is not a man of genius. And that's humiliating for a young man of any pride, in our day especially. But remorse? You deny him any moral feeling then? Is he like that? Ah, uh, Adosha Romanovna, everything is in a muddle now, not that it was ever in very good order. Russians in general are broad in their ideas, Adosha Romanovna, broad like their land and exceedingly disposed to the fantastic, the chaotic. But it's a misfortune to be broad without a special genius. Do you remember what a lot of talk we had together on this subject, sitting in the evenings on the terrace after supper? Why, you used to reproach me with breadth. Who knows, perhaps we were talking at the very time when he was lying here thinking over his plan. There are no sacred traditions amongst us, especially in the educated class, Adosha Romanovna. At the best, someone will make them up somehow for himself out of books or from some old chronicle. But those are for the most part the learned and all old fogies, so that it would be almost ill-bred in a man of society. You know my opinions in general, though. I never blame anyone. I do nothing at all, I persevere in that. But we've talked of this more than once before. I was so happy indeed as to interest you in my opinions. You are very pale, Adosha Romanovna. I know his theory. I read that article of his about men to whom all is permitted. Razumihin brought it to me. Mr. Razumihin? Your brother's article? In a magazine? Is there such an article? I didn't know. It must be interesting. But where are you going, Adosha Romanovna? I want to see Sofia Semyonovna, Dunia articulated faintly. How do I go to her? She has come in, perhaps. I must see her at once. Perhaps she, Adosha Romanovna, could not finish. Her breath literally failed her. Sofia Semyonovna will not be back till night, at least I believe not. She was to have been back at once, but if not, then she will not be until quite late. Ah, then you are lying. I see, you are lying, lying all the time. I don't believe you. I don't believe you, cried Dunia, completely losing her head. Almost fainting, she sank onto a chair which Svitergalev made haste to give her. Avdosha Romanovna, what is it? Control yourself. Here is some water. Drink a little. He sprinkled some water over her. Dunia shuddered and came to herself. It has acted violently, Svitergalev muttered to himself, frowning. Avdosha Romanovna, calm yourself. Believe me, he has friends. We will save him. Would you like me to take him abroad? I have money, I can get a ticket in three days. And as for the murder, he will do all sorts of good deeds yet, to atone for it. Calm yourself. He may become a great man yet. Well, how are you? How do you feel? Cruel man. To be able to jeer at it. Let me go. Where are you going? To him. Where is he? Do you know? Why is this door locked? We came in at that door and now it is locked. 
When did you manage to lock it? We couldn't be shouting all over the flat on such a subject. I am far from jeering, it's simply that I'm sick of talking like this. But how can you go in such a state? Do you want to betray him? You will drive him to fury, and he will give himself up. Let me tell you, he is already being watched, they are already on his track. You will simply be giving him away. Wait a little, I saw him and was talking to him just now. He can still be saved. Wait a bit, sit down, let us think it over together. I asked you to come in order to discuss it alone with you and to consider it thoroughly. But do sit down. How can you save him? Can he really be saved? Dunia sat down. Svitergala sat down beside her. It all depends on you, on you, on you alone, he began with glowing eyes, almost in a whisper and hardly able to utter the words for emotion. Dunia drew back from him in alarm. He too was trembling all over. You, one word from you, and he is saved. I... I'll save him. I have money and friends. I'll send him away at once. I'll get a passport, two passports, one for him and one for me. I have friends, capable people. If you like, I'll take a passport for you, for your mother. What do you want with Razumahin? I love you too. I love you beyond everything. Let me kiss the hem of your dress, let me, let me. The very rustle of it is too much for me. Tell me, do that, and I'll do it. I'll do everything. I will do the impossible. What you believe, I will believe. I'll do anything, anything. Don't, don't look at me like that. Do you know that you are killing me? He was almost beginning to rave. Something seemed suddenly to go to his head. Dunia jumped up and rushed to the door. Open it. Open it, she called, shaking the door. Open it. Is there no one there? Svitergalev got up and came to himself. His still trembling lips slowly broke into an angry mocking smile. There is no one at home, he said quietly and emphatically. The landlady has gone out, and it's waste of time to shout like that. You are only exciting yourself uselessly. Where is the key? Open the door at once, at once, base man. I have lost the key and cannot find it. This is an outrage, cried Dunya, turning pale as death. She rushed to the furthest corner, where she made haste to barricade herself with a little table. She did not scream, but she fixed her eyes on her tormentor and watched every movement he made. Svidrigalev remained standing at the other end of the room, facing her. He was positively composed, at least in appearance, but his face was pale as before. The mocking smile did not leave his face. You spoke of outrage just now, Adosha Romanovna. In that case, you may be sure I've taken measures. Sofia Semyonovna is not at home. The Kapernamovs are far away, there are five locked rooms between. I am at least twice as strong as you are, and I have nothing to fear, besides. For you could not complain afterwards. You surely would not be willing actually to betray your brother? Besides, no one would believe you. How should a girl have come alone to visit a solitary man in his lodgings? so that even if you do sacrifice your brother, you could prove nothing. It is very difficult to prove an assault, Avdosha Romanovna. Scoundrel, whispered Dunia indignantly. As you like, but observe I was only speaking by way of a general proposition. It's my personal conviction that you are perfectly right, violence is hateful. I only spoke to show you that you need have no remorse even if you are willing to save your brother of your own accord, as I suggest to you. You would be simply submitting to circumstances, to violence, in fact, if we must use that word. Think about it. 
Your brother's and your mother's fate are in your hands. I will be your slave all my life. I will wait here. Svitrgalev sat down on the sofa about eight steps from Dunia. She had not the slightest doubt now of his unbending determination. Besides, she knew him. Suddenly she pulled out of her pocket a revolver, cocked it and laid it in her hand on the table. Svitrgalev jumped up. Aha! So that's it, is it? He cried, surprised but smiling maliciously. Well, that completely alters the aspect of affairs. You've made things wonderfully. Easier for me, Avdosha Romanovna. But where did you get the revolver? Was it Mr. Razumihin? Why, it's my revolver, an old friend. And how I've hunted for it. The shooting lessons I've given you in the country have not been thrown away. It's not your revolver, it belonged to Marfa Petrovna, whom you killed, wretch. There was nothing of yours in her house. I took it when I began to suspect what you were capable of. If you dare to advance one step, I swear I'll kill you. She was frantic. But your brother? I ask from curiosity, said Svidrigailov, still standing where he was. Inform, if you want to. Don't stir. Don't come nearer. I'll shoot. You poisoned your wife, I know, you are a murderer yourself. She held the revolver ready. Are you so positive I poisoned Marfa Petrovna? You did. You hinted it yourself, you talked to me of poison. I know you went to get it, you had it in readiness. It was your doing. It must have been your doing. Scoundrel! Even if that were true, it would have been for your sake, you would have been the cause. You are lying. I hated you always, always. Oh ho, Adosha Romanovna! You seem to have forgotten how you softened to me in the heat of propaganda. I saw it in your eyes. Do you remember that moonlight night, when the nightingale was singing? That's a lie, there was a flash of fury in Dunya's eyes, that's a lie and a libel. A lie? Well, if you like, it's a lie. I made it up. Women ought not to be reminded of such things, he smiled. I know you will shoot, you pretty wild creature. Well, shoot away. Dunia raised the revolver, and deadly pale, gazed at him, measuring the distance and awaiting the first movement on his part. Her lower lip was white and quivering and her big black eyes flashed like fire. He had never seen her so handsome. The fire glowing in her eyes at the moment she raised the revolver seemed to kindle him and there was a pang of anguish in his heart. He took a step forward and a shot rang out. The bullet grazed his hair and flew into the wall behind. He stood still and laughed softly. The wasp has stung me. She aimed straight at my head. What's this? Blood? He pulled out his handkerchief to wipe the blood, which flowed in a thin stream down his right temple. The bullet seemed to have just grazed the skin. Dunia lowered the revolver and looked at Svitrgalev not so much in terror as in a sort of wild amazement. She seemed not to understand what she was doing and what was going on. Well, you missed. Fire again, I'll wait, said Svidrigailov softly, still smiling, but gloomily. If you go on like that, I shall have time to seize you before you cock again. Dunia started, quickly cocked the pistol and again raised it. Let me be, she cried in despair. I swear I'll shoot again. I... I'll kill you. Well, at three paces, you can hardly help it. But if you don't, then... His eyes flashed and he took two steps forward. Dunia shot again, it missed fire. You haven't loaded it properly. Never mind, you have another charge there. Get it ready, I'll wait. He stood facing her, 
two paces away, waiting and gazing at her with wild determination, with feverishly passionate, stubborn, set eyes. Dunia saw that he would sooner die than let her go. And, now, of course she would kill him, at two paces. Suddenly she flung away the revolver. She's dropped it, said Svidrigaila with surprise, and he drew a deep breath. A weight seemed to have rolled from his heart, perhaps not only the fear of death, indeed he may scarcely have felt it at that moment. It was the deliverance from another feeling, darker and more bitter, which he could not himself have defined. He went to Dunia and gently put his arm round her waist. She did not resist, but, trembling like a leaf, looked at him with suppliant eyes. He tried to say something, but his lips moved without being able to utter a sound. Let me go, Dunia implored. Svidrigailov shuddered. Her voice now was quite different. Then you don't love me? he asked softly. Dunia shook her head. And, and you can't? Never, he whispered in despair. Never. There followed a moment of terrible, dumb struggle in the heart of Svidrigailov. He looked at her with an indescribable gaze. Suddenly he withdrew his arm, turned quickly to the window, and stood facing it. Another moment passed. Here's the key. He took it out of the left pocket of his coat and laid it on the table behind him, without turning or looking at Dunia. Take it. Make haste. He looked stubbornly out of the window. Dunia went up to the table to take the key. Make haste. Make haste, repeated Svidrigailov, still without turning or moving. But there seemed a terrible significance in the tone of that make haste. Dunia understood it, snatched up the key, flew to the door, unlocked it quickly, and rushed out of the room. A minute later, beside herself, she ran out onto the canal bank in the direction of X Bridge. Svidrigailov remained three minutes standing at the window. At last he slowly turned, looked about him, and passed his hand over his forehead. A strange smile contorted his face, a pitiful, sad, weak smile, a smile of despair. The blood, which was already getting dry, smeared his hand. He looked angrily at it, then wetted a towel and washed his temple. The revolver which Dunia had flung away lay near the door and suddenly caught his eye. He picked it up and examined it. It was a little pocket three-barrel revolver of old-fashioned construction. There were still two charges and one capsule left in it. It could be fired again. He thought a little, put the revolver in his pocket, took his hat and went out. He spent that evening till ten o'clock, going from one low haunt to another. Katia too turned up and sang another gutter song, How a Certain Villain and Tyrant began kissing Katia. Svidrigailov treated Katia and the organ grinder and some singers and the waiters and two little clerks. He was particularly drawn to these clerks by the fact that they both had crooked noses, one bent to the left and the other to the right. They took him finally to a pleasure garden where he paid for their entrance. There was one lanky three-year-old pine tree and three bushes in the garden, besides a box hall, which was in reality a drinking bar where tea too was served, and there were a few green tables and chairs standing round it. A chorus of wretched singers and a drunken but exceedingly depressed German clown from Munich with a red nose entertained the public. The clerks quarreled with some other clerks, and a fight seemed imminent. Svidrigailov was chosen to decide the dispute. He listened to them for a quarter of an hour, but they shouted so loud that there was no possibility of understanding them. The only fact that seemed certain was that one of them had stolen something and had even succeeded in selling it on the spot to a Jew, but would not share the spoil with his companion. Finally, it appeared that the stolen object was a teaspoon belonging to the box hall. It was missed and the affair began to seem troublesome. Svidrigailov paid for the spoon, got up, and walked out of the garden. It was about six o'clock. 
He had not drunk a drop of wine all this time and had ordered tea more for the sake of appearances than anything. It was a dark and stifling evening. Threatening storm clouds came over the sky about ten o'clock. There was a clap of thunder, and the rain came down like a waterfall. The water fell not in drops, but beat on the earth in streams. There were flashes of lightning every minute and each flash lasted while one could count five. Drenched to the skin, he went home, locked himself in, opened the bureau, took out all his money, and tore up two or three papers. Then, putting the money in his pocket, he was about to change his clothes, but, looking out of the window and listening to the thunder and the rain, he gave up the idea. Took up his hat and went out of the room without locking the door. He went straight to Sonia. She was at home. She was not alone, the four Capernaum of children were with her. She was giving them tea. She received Svitergalev in respectful silence, looking wonderingly at his soaking clothes. The children all ran away at once in indescribable terror. Svitergalev sat down at the table and asked Sonia to sit beside him. She timidly prepared to listen. I may be going to America, Sofia Semyonovna, said Svidrigalev, and as I am probably seeing you for the last time, I have come to make some arrangements. Well, did you see the lady today? I know what she said to you, you need not tell me. Sonia made a movement and blushed. Those people have their own way of doing things. As to your sisters and your brother, they are really provided for and the money assigned to them I put into safekeeping and have received acknowledgments. You had better take charge of the receipts, in case anything happens. Here, take them. Well now, that's settled. Here are three five percent bonds to the value of three thousand rubles. Take those for yourself, entirely for yourself, and let that be strictly between ourselves so that no one knows of it, whatever you hear. You will need the money, for to go on living in the old way, Sofia Semyonovna, is bad, and besides there is no need for it now. I am so much indebted to you, and so are the children and my stepmother, said Sonia hurriedly, and if I've said so little, please don't consider. That's enough. That's enough. But as for the money, Arkady Ivanovich, I am very grateful to you, but I don't need it now. I can always earn my own living. Don't think me ungrateful. If you are so charitable, that money. It's for you, for you, Sofia Semyonovna, and please don't waste words over it. I haven't time for it. You will want it. Radion Romanovich has two alternatives, a bullet in the brain or Siberia. Sonia looked wildly at him and started. Don't be uneasy, I know all about it from himself and I am not a gossip, I won't tell anyone. It was good advice when you told him to give himself up and confess. It would be much better for him. Well, if it turns out to be Siberia, he will go and you will follow him. That's so, isn't it? And if so, you'll need money. You'll need it for him, do you understand? Giving it to you is the same as my giving it to him. Besides, you promised Amalia Ivanovna to pay what's owing. I heard you. How can you undertake such obligations so heedlessly, Sofia Semyonovna? It was Katerina Ivanovna's debt and not yours so you ought not to have taken any notice of the German woman. You can't get through the world like that. If you are ever questioned about me, tomorrow or the day after you will be asked, don't say anything about my coming to see you now and don't show the money to anyone or say a word about it. Well, now goodbye. He got up. My greetings to Radion Romanovich. By the way, you'd better put the money for the present in Mr. Razumihin's keeping. You know Mr. Razumihin? Of course you do. He's not a bad fellow. Take it to him tomorrow or when the time comes. Until then, hide it carefully. Sonia too jumped up from her chair and looked in dismay at Svitergalev. 
She longed to speak, to ask a question, but for the first moment she did not dare and did not know how to begin. How can you, how can you be going now, in such rain? Why, be starting for America, and be stopped by rain? Ha, ha. Goodbye, Sofia Semyonovna, my dear. Live and live long, you will be of use to others. By the way, tell Mr. Razumihin I send my greetings to him. Tell him Arkady Ivanovich Svidrigailov sends his greetings. Be sure to. He went out, leaving Sonia in a state of wondering anxiety and vague apprehension. It appeared afterwards that on the same evening, at twenty past eleven, he made another very eccentric and unexpected visit. The rain still persisted. Drenched to the skin, he walked into the little flat where the parents of his betrothed lived, in Third Street, in Vasilyevsky Island. He knocked some time before he was admitted, and his visit at first caused great perturbation, but Svidrigailov could be very fascinating when he liked, so that the first, and indeed very intelligent surmise of the sensible parents that Svidrigailov had probably had so much to drink that he did not know what he was doing vanished immediately. The decrepit father was wheeled in to see Svidrigailov by the tender and sensible mother, who as usual began the conversation with various irrelevant questions. She never asked a direct question, but began by smiling and rubbing her hands and then, if she were obliged to ascertain something, for instance, when Svidrigailov would like to have the wedding, she would begin by interested and almost eager questions about Paris and the court life there, and only by degrees brought the conversation round to Third Street. On other occasions this had of course been very impressive, but this time Arkady Ivanovich seemed particularly impatient and insisted on seeing his betrothed at once, though he had been informed, to begin with, that she had already gone to bed. The girl of course appeared. Svidrigailov informed her at once that he was obliged by very important affairs to leave Petersburg for a time, and therefore brought her fifteen thousand rubles and begged her accept them as a present from him, as he had long been intending to make her this trifling present before their wedding. The logical connection of the present with his immediate departure and the absolute necessity of visiting them for that purpose in pouring rain at midnight was not made clear. But it all went off very well, even the inevitable ejaculations of wonder and regret, the inevitable questions were extraordinarily few and restrained. On the other hand, the gratitude expressed was most glowing and was reinforced by tears from the most sensible of mothers. Svitergalev got up, laughed, kissed his betrothed, patted her cheek, declared he would soon come back, and noticing in her eyes, together with childish curiosity, a sort of earnest dumb inquiry, reflected and kissed her again, though he felt sincere anger inwardly at the thought that his present would be immediately locked up in the keeping of the most sensible of mothers. He went away, leaving them all in a state of extraordinary excitement, but the tender mama, speaking quietly in a half-whisper, settled some of the most important of their doubts, concluding that Svidrigailov was a great man, a man of great affairs and connections and of great wealth, there was no knowing what he had in his mind. He would start off on a journey and give away money just as the fancy took him, so that there was nothing surprising about it. Of course it was strange that he was wet through, but Englishmen, for instance, are even more eccentric, and all these people of high society didn't think of what was said of them and didn't stand on ceremony. Possibly, indeed, he came like that on purpose to show that he was not afraid of anyone. Above all, not a word should be said about it, for God knows what might come of it, and the money must be locked up, and it was most fortunate that Fedosia, the cook, had not left the kitchen. And above all not a word must be said to that old cat, Madame Reslich, and so on and so on. They sat up whispering till two o'clock but the girl went to bed much earlier, amazed and rather sorrowful. Svitergalev, meanwhile, exactly at midnight, crossed the bridge on the way back to the mainland. The rain had ceased and there was a roaring wind. He began shivering, and for one moment he gazed at the black waters of the little Neva with a look of special interest, even inquiry. But he soon felt it very cold, standing by the water, he turned and went towards Y, Prospect. He walked along that endless street for a long time, almost half an hour, more than once stumbling in the dark on the wooden pavement, but continually looking for something on the right side of the street. 
he had noticed passing through this street lately that there was a hotel somewhere towards the end, built of wood, but fairly large, and its name he remembered was something like Adrianople. He was not mistaken, the hotel was so conspicuous in that godforsaken place that he could not fail to see it even in the dark. It was a long, black and wooden building, and in spite of the late hour, there were lights in the windows and signs of life within. He went in and asked a ragged fellow who met him in the corridor for a room. The latter, scanning Svitergalev, pulled himself together and led him at once to a close and tiny room in the distance, at the end of the corridor, under the stairs. There was no other, all were occupied. The ragged fellow looked inquiringly. Is there tea? asked Svitergalev. Yes, sir. What else is there? Veal, vodka, savories. Bring me tea and veal. And you want nothing else? he asked with apparent surprise. Nothing, nothing. The ragged man went away, completely disillusioned. It must be a nice place, thought Svitergalev. How was it I didn't know it? I expect I look as if I came from a café chantan and have had some adventure on the way. It would be interesting to know who stayed here? He lighted the candle and looked at the room more carefully. It was a room so low-pitched that Svitergalev could only just stand up in it. It had one window, the bed, which was very dirty, and the plain stained chair and table almost filled it up. The walls looked as though they were made of planks, covered with shabby paper, so torn and dusty that the pattern was indistinguishable, though the general color, yellow, could still be made out. One of the walls was cut short by the sloping ceiling, though the room was not an attic, but just under the stairs. Svitergalev set down the candle, sat down on the bed, and sank into thought. But a strange persistent murmur, which sometimes rose to a shout in the next room, attracted his attention. The murmur had not ceased from the moment he entered the room. He listened, someone was upbraiding and almost tearfully scolding, but he heard only one voice. Svitergalev got up, shaded the light with his hand, and at once he saw light through a crack in the wall. He went up and peeped through. The room, which was somewhat larger than his, had two occupants. One of them, a very curly, headed man with a red inflamed face, was standing in the pose of an order, without his coat, with his legs wide apart to preserve his balance, and smiting himself on the breast. He reproached the other with being a beggar, with having no standing whatever. He declared that he had taken the other out of the gutter and he could turn him out when he liked, and that only the finger of providence sees it all. The object of his reproaches was sitting in a chair, and had the air of a man who wants dreadfully to sneeze, but can't. He sometimes turned sheepish and befogged eyes on the speaker, but obviously had not the slightest idea what he was talking about and scarcely heard it. A candle was burning down on the table, there were wine glasses, a nearly empty bottle of vodka, bread and cucumber, and glasses with the dregs of stale tea. After gazing attentively at this, Svitergalev turned away indifferently and sat down on the bed. The ragged attendant, returning with the tea, could not resist asking him again whether he didn't want anything more, and again receiving a negative reply, finally withdrew. Svitergalev made haste to drink a glass of tea to warm himself, but could not eat anything. He began to feel feverish. He took off his coat and, wrapping himself in the blanket, lay down on the bed. He was annoyed. It would have been better to be well for the occasion, he thought with a smile. The room was close, the candle burned dimly, the wind was roaring outside, he heard a mouse scratching in the corner, and the room smelled of mice and of leather. He lay in a sort of reverie, one thought followed another. He felt a longing to fix his imagination on something. It must be a garden under the window, he thought. There's a sound of trees. How I dislike the sound of trees on a stormy night, in the dark. They give one a horrid feeling. He remembered how he had disliked it when he passed Petrovsky Park just now. This reminded him of the bridge over the Little Neva, and he felt cold again as he had when standing there. 
I never have liked water, he thought, even in a landscape, and he suddenly smiled again at a strange idea, surely now all these questions of taste and comfort ought not to matter, but I'd become more particular, like an animal that picks out a special place, for such an occasion. I ought to have gone into the Petrovsky Park. I suppose it seemed dark, cold, haha, -ha, as though I were seeking pleasant sensations. By the way, why haven't I put out the candle? He blew it out. They've gone to bed next door, he thought, not seeing the light at the crack. Well, now, Marfa Petrovna, now is the time for you to turn up. It's dark, and the very time and place for you. But now you won't come. He suddenly recalled how, an hour before carrying out his design on Dunia, he had recommended Raskolnikov to trust her to Razumihin's keeping. I suppose I really did say it, as Raskolnikov guessed, to tease myself. But what a rogue that Raskolnikov is. He's gone through a good deal. He may be a successful rogue in time when he's got over his nonsense. But now he's too eager for life. These young men are contemptible on that point. But, hang the fellow! Let him please himself, it's nothing to do with me. He could not get to sleep. By degrees Dunia's image rose before him, and a shudder ran over him. No, I must give up all that now, he thought, rousing himself. I must think of something else. It's queer and funny. I never had a great hatred for anyone, I never particularly desired to avenge myself even, and that's a bad sign, a bad sign, a bad sign. I never liked quarreling either, and never lost my temper, that's a bad sign too. And the promises I made her just now, too, damnation. But, who knows, perhaps she would have made a new man of me somehow. He ground his teeth and sank into silence again. Again Dunia's image rose before him, just as she was when, after shooting the first time, she had lowered the revolver in terror and gazed blankly at him, so that he might have seized her twice over and she would not have lifted a hand to defend herself if he had not reminded her. He recalled how at that instant he felt almost sorry for her, how he had felt a pang at his heart. A.I.E. Damnation, these thoughts again. I must put it away. He was dozing off, the feverish shiver had ceased, when suddenly something seemed to run over his arm and leg under the bedclothes. He started. Ugh! Hang it! I believe it's a mouse, he thought, that's the veal I left on the table. He felt fearfully disinclined to pull off the blanket, get up, get cold, but all at once something unpleasant ran over his leg again. He pulled off the blanket and lighted the candle. Shaking with feverish chill, he bent down to examine the bed, there was nothing. He shook the blanket and suddenly a mouse jumped out on the sheet. He tried to catch it, but the mouse ran to and fro in zigzags without leaving the bed, slipped between his fingers, ran over his hand and suddenly darted under the pillow. He threw down the pillow, but in one instant felt something leap on his chest and dart over his body and down his back under his shirt. He trembled nervously and woke up. The room was dark. He was lying on the bed and wrapped up in the blanket as before. The wind was howling under the window. How disgusting, he thought with annoyance. He got up and sat on the edge of the bedstead with his back to the window. It's better not to sleep at all, he decided. There was a cold damp draft from the window, however, without getting up he drew the blanket over him and wrapped himself in it. He was not thinking of anything and did not want to think. But one image rose after another, incoherent scraps of thought without beginning or end passed through his mind. He sank into drowsiness. Perhaps the cold, or the dampness, or the dark, or the wind that held under the window and tossed the trees roused a sort of persistent craving for the fantastic. He kept dwelling on images of flowers, he fancied a charming flower garden, a bright, warm, almost hot day, a holiday, Trinity Day. A fine, sumptuous country cottage in the English taste overgrown with fragrant flowers, with flower beds going round the house, 
the porch, wreathed in climbers, was surrounded with beds of roses. A light, cool staircase, carpeted with rich rugs, was decorated with rare plants and china pots. He noticed particularly in the window's nosegays of tender, white, heavily fragrant narcissus bending over their bright, green, thick long stalks. He was reluctant to move away from them, but he went up the stairs and came into a large, high drawing room and again everywhere, at the windows, the doors onto the balcony, and on the balcony itself, were flowers. The floors were strewn with freshly cut fragrant hay, the windows were open, a fresh, cool, light air came into the room. The birds were chirping under the window, and in the middle of the room, on a table covered with a white satin shroud, stood a coffin. The coffin was covered with white silk and edged with a thick white frill, wreaths of flowers surrounded it on all sides. Among the flowers lay a girl in a white muslin dress with her arms crossed and pressed on her bosom, as though carved out of marble. But her loose fair hair was wet, there was a wreath of roses on her head. The stern and already rigid profile of her face looked as though chiseled of marble too, and the smile on her pale lips was full of an immense unchildish misery and sorrowful appeal. Svidrigilov knew that girl, there was no holy image, no burning candle beside the coffin, no sound of prayers, the girl had drowned herself. She was only fourteen, but her heart was broken. And she had destroyed herself, crushed by an insult that had appalled and amazed that childish soul, had smirched that angel purity with unmerited disgrace and torn from her a last scream of despair, unheeded and brutally disregarded, on a dark night in the cold and wet while the wind held. Svidrigailov came to himself, got up from the bed and went to the window. He felt for the latch and opened it. The wind lashed furiously into the little room and stung his face and his chest, only covered with his shirt, as though. With frost. Under the window, there must have been something like a garden, and apparently a pleasure garden. There, too, probably there were tea tables, and singing in the daytime. Now drops of rain flew in at the window from the trees and bushes, it was dark as in a cellar, so that he could only just make out some dark blurs of objects. Svidrigailov, bending down with elbows on the window sill, gazed for five minutes into the darkness, the boom of a cannon, followed by a second one, resounded in the darkness of the night. Ah, the signal! The river is overflowing, he thought. By morning it will be swirling down the street in the lower parts, flooding the basements and cellars. The cellar rats will swim out and men will curse in the rain and wind as they drag their rubbish to their upper stories. What time is it now? And he had hardly thought it when, somewhere near, a clock on the wall, ticking away hurriedly, struck three. Aha! It will be light in an hour. Why wait? I'll go out at once straight to the park. I'll choose a great bush there drenched with rain, so that as soon as one's shoulder touches it, millions of drops drip on one's head. He moved away from the window, shut it, lighted the candle, put on his waistcoat, his overcoat and his hat and went out, carrying the candle, into the passage, to look for the ragged attendant who would be asleep somewhere in the midst of candle ends and all sorts of rubbish, to pay him for the room and leave the hotel. It's the best minute, I couldn't choose a better. He walked for some time through a long narrow corridor without finding anyone and was just going to call out, when suddenly in a dark corner between an old cupboard and the door he caught sight of a strange object which seemed to be alive. He bent down with the candle and saw a little girl, not more than five years old, shivering and crying, with her clothes as wet as a soaking house flannel. She did not seem afraid of Svidrigailov, but looked at him with blank amazement out of her big black eyes. Now and then she sobbed as children do when they have been crying a long time, but are beginning to be comforted. The child's face was pale and tired, she was numb with cold. How can she have come here? She must have hidden here and not slept all night. He began questioning her. The child suddenly becoming animated, chattered away in her baby language, something about Mammy and that Mammy would beat her, and about some cup that she had woken. The child chattered on without stopping. He could only guess from what she said that she was a neglected child, whose mother, probably a drunken cook, 
in the service of the hotel, whipped and frightened her, that the child had broken a cup of her mother's and was so frightened that she had run away the evening before, had hidden for a long while somewhere outside in the rain, at last had made her way in here, hidden behind the cupboard and spent the night there, crying and trembling from the damp, the darkness, and the fear that she would be badly beaten for it. He took her in his arms, went back to his room, sat her on the bed, and began undressing her. The torn shoes which she had on her stockingless feet were as wet as if they had been standing in a puddle all night. When he had undressed her, he put her on the bed, covered her up and wrapped her in the blanket from her head downwards. She fell asleep at once. Then he sank into dreary musing again. What folly to trouble myself, he decided suddenly with an oppressive feeling of annoyance. What idiocy! In vexation, he took up the candle to go and look for the ragged attendant again and make haste to go away. Damn the child, he thought as he opened the door, but he turned again to see whether the child was asleep. He raised the blanket carefully. The child was sleeping soundly, she had got warm under the blanket, and her pale cheeks were flushed. But strange to say that flush seemed brighter and coarser than the rosy cheeks of childhood. It's a flush of fever, thought Svidrigailov. It was like the flush from drinking, as though she had been given a full glass to drink. Her crimson lips were hot and glowing, but what was this? He suddenly fancied that her long black eyelashes were quivering, as though the lids were opening and a sly crafty eye peeped out with an unchildlike wink, as though the little girl were not asleep, but pretending. Yes, it was so. Her lips parted in a smile. The corners of her mouth quivered, as though she were trying to control them. But now she quite gave up all effort, now it was a grin, a broad grin, there was something shameless, provocative in that quite unchildish face, it was depravity, it was the face of a harlot, the shameless face of a French harlot. Now both eyes opened wide, they turned a glowing, shameless glance upon him, they laughed, invited him. There was something infinitely hideous and shocking in that laugh, in those eyes, in such nastiness in the face of a child. What, at five years old? Svidrigailov muttered in genuine horror. What does it mean? And now she turned to him, her little face all aglow, holding out her arms. A cursed child! Svidrigailov cried, raising his hand to strike her, but at that moment he woke up. He was in the same bed, still wrapped in the blanket. The candle had not been lighted, and daylight was streaming in at the windows. I've had nightmare all night. He got up angrily, feeling utterly shattered, his bones ached. There was a thick mist outside, and he could see nothing. It was nearly five. He had overslept himself. He got up, put on his still damp jacket and overcoat. Feeling the revolver in his pocket, he took it out and then he sat down, took a notebook out of his pocket and in the most conspicuous place on the title page wrote a few lines in large letters. Reading them over, he sank into thought with his elbows on the table. The revolver and the notebook lay beside him. Some flies woke up and settled on the untouched veal, which was still on the table. He stared at them and at last, with his free right hand, began trying to catch one. He tried till he was tired, but could not catch it. At last, realizing that he was engaged in this interesting pursuit, he started, got up and walked resolutely out of the room. A minute later he was in the street. A thick milky mist hung over the town. Svitergalev walked along the slippery dirty wooden pavement towards the little Neva. He was picturing the waters of the little Neva swollen in the night, Petrovsky Island, the wet paths, the wet grass, the wet trees and bushes, and at last the bush. He began ill-humoredly staring at the houses, trying to think of something else. There was not a cabman or a passerby in the street. The bright yellow, wooden, little houses looked dirty and dejected with their closed shutters. The cold and damp penetrated his whole body, and he began to shiver. From time to time he came across shop signs and read each carefully. 
At last he reached the end of the wooden pavement and came to a big stone house. A dirty, shivering dog crossed his path with its tail between its legs. A man in a gray coat lay face downwards, dead drunk, across the pavement. He looked at him and went on. A high tower stood up on the left. Bah, he shouted, here is a place. Why should it be Petrovsky? It will be in the presence of an official witness anyway. He almost smiled at this new thought and turned into the street where there was the big house with the tower. At the great closed gates of the house, a little man stood with his shoulder leaning against them, wrapped in a gray soldier's coat, with a copper Achilles helmet on his head. He cast a drowsy and indifferent glance at Svidrigailov. His face wore that perpetual look of peevish dejection, which is so sourly printed on all faces of Jewish race without exception. They both, Svidrigailov and Achilles, stared at each other for a few minutes without speaking. At last it struck Achilles as irregular for a man not drunk to be standing three steps from him, staring and not saying a word. What do you want here, he said, without moving or changing his position. Nothing, brother, good morning, answered Svidrigailov. This isn't the place. I am going to foreign parts, brother. To foreign parts? To America. America. Svidrigailov took out the revolver and cocked it. Achilles raised his eyebrows. I say, this is not the place for such jokes. Why shouldn't it be the place? Because it isn't. Well, brother, I don't mind that. It's a good place. When you are asked, you just say he was going, he said, to America. He put the revolver to his right temple. You can't do it here, it's not the place, cried Achilles, rousing himself, his eyes growing bigger and bigger. Svidrigailov pulled the trigger. The same day, about seven o'clock in the evening, Raskolnikov was on his way to his mother's and sister's lodging, the lodging in Bakliev's house, which Razumihin had found for them. The stairs went up from the street. Raskolnikov walked with lagging steps, as though still hesitating whether to go or not. But nothing would have turned him back, his decision was taken. Besides, it doesn't matter, they still know nothing, he thought, and they are used to thinking of me as eccentric. He was appallingly dressed, his clothes torn and dirty, soaked with a night's rain. His face was almost distorted from fatigue, exposure, the inward conflict that had lasted for twenty-four hours. He had spent all the previous night alone, God knows where. But anyway he had reached a decision. He knocked at the door, which was opened by his mother. Dunia was not at home. Even the servant happened to be out. At first Pulcheria Alexandrovna was speechless with joy and surprise, then she took him by the hand and drew him into the room. Here you are, she began, faltering with joy. Don't be angry with me, Rodia, for welcoming you so foolishly with tears. I am laughing, not crying. Did you think I was crying? No, I am delighted, but I've got into such a stupid habit of shedding tears. I've been like that ever since your father's death. I cry for anything. Sit down, dear boy, you must be tired, I see you are. Ah, how muddy you are. I was in the rain yesterday, mother. Raskolnikov began. No, no, Pulcheria Alexandrovna hurriedly interrupted, you thought I was going to cross-question you in the womanish way I used to, don't be anxious, I understand, I understand it all, now I've learned the ways here and truly, I see for myself that they are better. I've made up my mind once for all, how can I understand your plans and expect you to give an account of them? God knows what concerns and plans you may have, or what ideas you are hatching, so it's not for me to keep nudging your elbow asking you what you are thinking about. But, my goodness! Why am I running to and fro as though I were crazy? I am reading your article in the magazine for the third time, Rodia. Dmitri Prokofitch brought it to me. Directly I saw it I cried out to myself, there, 
foolish one, I thought, that's what he is busy about, that's the solution. Of the mystery. Learned people are always like that. He may have some new ideas in his head just now, he is thinking them over, and I worry him and upset him. I read it, my dear, and of course there was a great deal I did not understand, but that's only natural, how should I? Show me, mother. Raskolnikov took the magazine and glanced at his article. Incongruous as it was with his mood and his circumstances, he felt that strange and bittersweet sensation that every author experiences the first time he sees himself in print, besides, he was only twenty-three. It lasted only a moment. After reading a few lines he frowned and his heart throbbed with anguish. He recalled all the inward conflict of the preceding months. He flung the article on the table with disgust and anger. But, however foolish I may be, Rodia, I can see for myself that you will very soon be one of the leading, if not the leading man, in the world of Russian thought. And they dared to think you were mad. You don't know, but they really thought that. Ah, the despicable creatures, how could they understand genius? And Dunia, Dunia was all but believing it, what do you say to that? Your father sent twice to magazines, the first time poems, I've got the manuscript and will show you, and the second time a whole novel, I begged him to let me copy it out, and how we prayed that they should be taken, they weren't. I was breaking my heart, Rodia, six or seven days ago over your food and your clothes and the way you were living. But now I see again how foolish I was, for you can attain any position you like by your intellect and talent. No doubt you don't care about that for the present and you are occupied with much more important matters. Dunia's not at home, mother? No, Rodia. I often don't see her, she leaves me alone. Dmitri Prokofitch comes to see me, it's so good of him, and he always talks about you. He loves you and respects you, my dear. I don't say that Dunia is very wanting in consideration. I am not complaining. She has her ways and I have mine. She seems to have got some secrets of late and I never have any secrets from you too. Of course, I am sure that Dunia has far too much sense and besides she loves you and me, but I don't know what it will all lead to. You've made me so happy by coming now, Rodia, but she has missed you by going out. When she comes and I'll tell her, your brother came in while you were out. Where have you been all this time? You mustn't spoil me, Rodia, you know, come when you can, but if you can't, it doesn't matter, I can wait. I shall know, anyway, that you are fond of me, that will be enough for me. I shall read what you write, I shall hear about you from everyone, and sometimes you'll come yourself to see me. What could be better? Here you've come now to comfort your mother, I see that. Here Pulcheria Alexandrovna began to cry. Here I am again. Don't mind my foolishness. My goodness, why am I sitting here? She cried, jumping up. There is coffee and I don't offer you any. Ah, that's the selfishness of old age. I'll get it at once. Mother, don't trouble, I am going at once. I haven't come for that. Please listen to me. Pulcheria Alexandrovna went up to him timidly. Mother, whatever happens, whatever you hear about me, whatever you are told about me, will you always love me as you do now? He asked suddenly from the fullness of his heart, as though not thinking of his words and not weighing them. Rodia, Rodia, what is the matter? How can you ask me such a question? Why, who will tell me anything about you? Besides, I shouldn't believe anyone, I should refuse to listen. I've come to assure you that I've always loved you, and I am glad that we are alone, even glad Dunya is out, he went on with the same impulse. I have come to tell you that though you will be unhappy, you must believe that your son loves you now more than himself, and that all you thought about me, that I was cruel and didn't care about you, was all a mistake. I shall never cease to love you. Well, that's enough. I thought I must do this and begin with this. Pulcheria Alexandrovna embraced him in silence, pressing him to her bosom and weeping gently. 
I don't know what is wrong with you, Rodia, she said at last. I've been thinking all this time that we were simply boring you, and now I see that there is a great sorrow in store for you, and that's why you are miserable. I've foreseen it a long time, Rodia. Forgive me for speaking about it. I keep thinking about it and lie awake at nights. Your sister lay talking in her sleep all last night, talking of nothing but you. I caught something, but I couldn't make it out. I felt all the morning as though I were going to be hanged, waiting for something, expecting something, and now it has come. Rodia, Rodia, where are you going? You are going away somewhere? Yes. That's what I thought. I can come with you, you know, if you need me. And Dunia, too, she loves you, she loves you dearly, and Sofia Semyonovna may. Come with us if you like. You see, I am glad to look upon her as a daughter even. Dmitri Prokofitch will help us to go together. But, where, are you going? Goodbye, mother. What, today, she cried, as though losing him forever. I can't stay, I must go now. And can't I come with you? No, but kneel down and pray to God for me. Your prayer perhaps will reach him. Let me bless you and sign you with the cross. That's right, that's right. Oh, God, what are we doing? Yes, he was glad, he was very glad that there was no one there, that he was alone with his mother. For the first time after all those awful months his heart was softened. He fell down before her, he kissed her feet and both wept, embracing. And she was not surprised and did not question him this time. For some days she had realized that something awful was happening to her son and that now some terrible minute had come for him. Rodia, my darling, my firstborn, she said sobbing, now you are just as when you were little. You would run like this to me and hug me and kiss me. When your father was living and we were poor, you comforted us simply by being with us, and when I buried your father, how often we wept together at his grave and embraced, as now. And if I've been crying lately, it's that my mother's heart had a foreboding of trouble. The first time I saw you, that evening, you remember, as soon as we arrived here, I guess simply from your eyes. My heart sank at once, and today when I opened the door and looked at you, I thought the fatal hour had come. Rodia, Rodia, you are not going away today? No. You'll come again? Yes. I'll come. Rodia, don't be angry, I don't dare to question you. I know I mustn't. Only say two words to me, is it far where you are going? Very far. What is awaiting you there? Some post or career for you. What God sends, only pray for me. Raskolnikov went to the door, but she clutched him and gazed despairingly into his eyes. Her face worked with terror. Enough, mother, said Raskolnikov, deeply regretting that he had come. Not forever, it's not yet forever? You'll come, you'll come tomorrow? I will, I will, goodbye. He tore himself away at last. It was a warm, fresh, bright evening, it had cleared up in the morning. Raskolnikov went to his lodgings, he made haste. He wanted to finish all before sunset. He did not want to meet anyone till then. Going up the stairs, he noticed that Nastasia rushed from the samovar to watch him intently. Can anyone have come to see me? He wondered. He had a disgusted vision of Porphyry. But opening his door he saw Dunia. She was sitting alone, plunged in deep thought, and looked as though she had been waiting a long time. He stopped short in the doorway. She rose from the sofa in dismay and stood up facing him. Her eyes, fixed upon him, betrayed horror and infinite grief. And from those eyes alone he saw at once that she knew. Am I to come in or go away? he asked uncertainly. I've been all day with Sofia Semyonovna. We were both waiting for you. 
We thought that you would be sure to come there. Raskolnikov went into the room and sank exhausted on a chair. I feel weak, Dunya, I am very tired, and I should have liked at this moment to be able to control myself. He glanced at her mistrustfully. Where were you all night? I don't remember clearly. You see, sister, I wanted to make up my mind once for all, and several times I walked by the Neva, I remember that I wanted to end it all there, but... I couldn't make up my mind, he whispered, looking at her mistrustfully again. Thank God! That was just what we were afraid of, Sofia Semyonovna and I. Then you still have faith in life? Thank God, thank God! Raskolnikov smiled bitterly. I haven't faith, but I have just been weeping in mother's arms. I haven't faith, but I have just asked her to pray for me. I don't know how it is, Dunia, I don't understand it. Have you been at mother's? Have you told her? cried Dunia, horror-stricken. Surely you haven't done that? No, I didn't tell her, in words, but she understood a great deal. She heard you talking in your sleep. I am sure she half understands it already. Perhaps I did wrong in going to see her. I don't know why I did go. I am a contemptible person, Dunia. A contemptible person, but ready to face suffering. You are, aren't you? Yes, I am going. At once. Yes, to escape the disgrace I thought of drowning myself, Dunia, but as I looked into the water, I thought that if I had considered myself strong till now I'd better not be afraid of disgrace, he said, hurrying on. It's pride, Dunia. Pride, Rhodia. There was a gleam of fire in his lusterless eyes, he seemed to be glad to think that he was still proud. You don't think, sister, that I was simply afraid of the water? he asked, looking into her face with a sinister smile. Oh, Rhodia, hush, cried Dunia bitterly. Silence lasted for two minutes. He sat with his eyes fixed on the floor. Dunia stood at the other end of the table and looked at him with anguish. Suddenly he got up. It's late, it's time to go. I am going at once to give myself up. But I don't know why I am going to give myself up. Big tears fell down her cheeks. You are crying, sister, but can you hold out your hand to me? You doubted it? She threw her arms round him. Aren't you half expiating your crime by facing the suffering? She cried, holding him close and kissing him. Crime? What crime? He cried in sudden fury. That I killed a vile noxious insect, an old pawnbroker woman, of use to no one. Killing her was atonement for forty sins. She was sucking the life out of poor people. Was that a crime? I am not thinking of it, and I am not thinking of expiating it, and why are you all rubbing it in on all sides? A crime! A crime! Only now I see clearly the imbecility of my cowardice, now that I have decided to face this superfluous disgrace. It's simply because I am contemptible and have nothing in me that I have decided to, perhaps too for my advantage, as that. Porphyry, suggested. Brother, brother, what are you saying? Why, you have shed blood, cried Dunia in despair. Which all men shed, he put in almost frantically, which flows and has always flowed in streams, which is spilt like champagne, and for which men are crowned in the capital and are called afterwards benefactors of mankind. Look into it more carefully and understand it. I too wanted to do good to men and would have done hundreds, thousands of good deeds to make up for that one piece of stupidity, not stupidity even, simply clumsiness, for the idea was by no means so stupid as it seems now that it has failed. Everything seems stupid when it fails. By that stupidity, I only wanted to put myself into an independent position, to take the first step, to obtain means, and then everything would have been smoothed over by benefits immeasurable in comparison. But I... I couldn't carry out even the first step, because I am contemptible, that's what's the matter. And yet I won't look at it as you do. 
If I had succeeded, I should have been crowned with glory, but now I'm trapped. But that's not so, not so. Brother, what are you saying? Ah, it's not picturesque, not aesthetically attractive. I fail to understand why bombarding people by regular siege is more honorable. The fear of appearances is the first symptom of impotence. I've never, never recognized this more clearly than now, and I am further than ever from seeing that what I did was a crime. I've never, never been stronger and more convinced than now. The color had rushed into his pale exhausted face, but as he uttered his last explanation, he happened to meet Dunya's eyes, and he saw such anguish in them that he could not help being checked. He felt that he had, anyway, made these two poor women miserable, that he was, anyway, the cause. Dunia darling, if I am guilty forgive me, though I cannot be forgiven if I am guilty. Goodbye. We won't dispute. It's time, high time to go. Don't follow me, I beseech you, I have somewhere else to go. But you go at once and sit with mother. I entreat you to. It's my last request of you. Don't leave her at all. I left her in a state of anxiety that she is not fit to bear. She will die or go out of her mind. Be with her. Razumihin will be with you. I've been talking to him. Don't cry about me. I'll try to be honest and manly all my life, even if I am a murderer. Perhaps I shall someday make a name. I won't disgrace you, you will see, I'll still show. Now goodbye for the present, he concluded hurriedly, noticing again a strange expression in Dunya's eyes at his last words and promises. Why are you crying? Don't cry, don't cry, we are not parting forever. Ah, uh, yes. Wait a minute, I'd forgotten. He went to the table, took up a thick dusty book, opened it and took from between the pages a little watercolor portrait on ivory. It was the portrait of his landlady's daughter, who had died of fever, that strange girl who had wanted to be a nun. For a minute he gazed at the delicate expressive face of his betrothed, kissed the portrait and gave it to Dunia. I used to talk a great deal about it to her, only to her, he said thoughtfully. To her heart I confided much of what has since been so hideously realized. Don't be uneasy, he returned to Dunia, she was as much opposed to it as you, and I am glad that she is gone. The great point is that everything now is going to be different, is going to be broken in two, he cried, suddenly returning to his dejection. Everything, everything, and am I prepared for it? Do I want it myself? They say it is necessary for me to suffer. What's the object of these senseless sufferings? Shall I know any better what they are for, when I am crushed by hardships and idiocy, and weak as an old man after twenty years' penal servitude? And what shall I have to live for then? Why am I consenting to that life now? Oh, I knew I was contemptible when I stood looking at the Neva at daybreak today. At last they both went out. It was hard for Dunia, but she loved him. She walked away, but after going fifty paces she turned round to look at him again. He was still in sight. At the corner he too turned and for the last time their eyes met, but noticing that she was looking at him, he motioned her away with impatience and even vexation, and turned the corner abruptly. I am wicked, I see that, he thought to himself, feeling ashamed a moment later of his angry gesture to Dunia. But why are they so fond of me if I don't deserve it? Oh, if only I were alone and no one loved me and I too had never loved anyone. Nothing of all this would have happened. But I wonder shall I in those fifteen or twenty years grow so meek that I shall humble myself before people and whimper at every word that I am a criminal? Yes, that's it, that's it, that's what they are sending me there for, that's what they want. Look at them running to and fro about the streets, every one of them a scoundrel and a criminal at heart and, worse still, an idiot. But try to get me off and they'd be wild with righteous indignation. Oh, how I hate them all! He felt amusing by what process it could come to pass, 
that he could be humbled before all of them, indiscriminately, humbled by conviction. And yet why not? It must be so. Would not twenty years of continual bondage crush him utterly? Water wears out a stone. And why, why should he live after that? Why should he go now when he knew that it would be so? It was the hundredth time perhaps that he had asked himself that question since the previous evening, but still he went. When he went into Sonia's room, it was already getting dark. All day Sonia had been waiting for him in terrible anxiety. Dunia had been waiting with her. She had come to her that morning, remembering Svidrigailov's words that Sonia knew. We will not describe the conversation and tears of the two girls, and how friendly they became. Dunia gained one comfort at least from that interview, that her brother would not be alone. He had gone to her, Sonia, first with his confession, he had gone to her for human fellowship when he needed it, she would go with him wherever fate might send him. Dunia did not ask, but she knew it was so. She looked at Sonia almost with reverence and at first almost embarrassed her by it. Sonia was almost on the point of tears. She felt herself, on the contrary, hardly worthy to look at Dunia. Dunia's gracious image when she had bowed to her so attentively and respectfully at their first meeting in Raskolnikov's room had remained in her mind as one of the fairest visions of her life. Dunia at last became impatient and, leaving Sonia, went to her brother's room to await him there. She kept thinking that he would come there first. When she had gone, Sonia began to be tortured by the dread of his committing suicide, and Dunia too feared it. But they had spent the day trying to persuade each other that that could not be, and both were less anxious while they were together. As soon as they parted, each thought of nothing else. Sonia remembered how Svidrigailov had said to her the day before that Raskolnikov had two alternatives, Siberia or... Besides she knew his vanity, his pride, and his lack of faith. Is it possible that he has nothing but cowardice and fear of death to make him live? She thought at last in despair. Meanwhile, the sun was setting. Sonia was standing in dejection, looking intently out of the window, but from it she could see nothing but the unwhitewashed blank wall of the next house. At last when she began to feel sure of his death, he walked into the room. She gave a cry of joy, but looking carefully into his face, she turned pale. Yes, said Raskolnikov, smiling. I have come for your cross, Sonia. It was you told me to go to the crossroads. Why is it you are frightened now it's come to that? Sonia gazed at him astonished. His tone seemed strange to her, a cold shiver ran over her, but in a moment she guessed that the tone and the words were a mask. He spoke to her looking away, as though to avoid meeting her eyes. You see, Sonia, I've decided that it will be better so. There is one fact. But it's a long story, and there's no need to discuss it. But do you know what angers me? It annoys me that all those stupid British faces will be gaping at me directly, pestering me with their stupid questions, which I shall have to answer, they'll point their fingers at me. Tfu! You know I am not going to Porphyry, I am sick of him. I'd rather go to my friend, the explosive lieutenant, how I shall surprise him, what a sensation I shall make. But I must be cooler, I've become too irritable of late. You know I was nearly shaking my fist at my sister just now, because she turned to take a last look at me. It's a brutal state to be in. Ah! What am I coming to? Well, where are the crosses? He seemed hardly to know what he was doing. He could not stay still or concentrate his attention on anything, his ideas seemed to gallop after one another, he talked incoherently, his hands trembled slightly. Without a word Sonia took out of the drawer two crosses, one of cypress wood and one of copper. She made the sign of the cross over herself and over him, and put the wooden cross on his neck. It's the symbol of my taking up the cross, he laughed. As though I had not suffered much till now. The wooden cross, that is the peasant one, the copper one, that is Lizavita's, you will wear yourself, show me. So she had it on, at that moment? 
I remember two things like these two, a silver one and a little icon. I threw them back on the old woman's neck. Those would be appropriate now, really, those are what I ought to put on now. But I am talking nonsense and forgetting what matters, I'm somehow forgetful. You see I have come to warn you, Sonia, so that you might know, that's all, that's all I came for. But I thought I had more to say. You wanted me to go yourself. Well, now I am going to prison and you'll have your wish. Well, what are you crying for? You too? Don't. Leave off. Oh, how I hate it all. But his feeling was stirred, his heart ached, as he looked at her. Why is she grieving too, he thought to himself. What am I to her? Why does she weep? Why is she looking after me, like my mother or Dunia? She'll be my nurse. Cross yourself, say at least one prayer, Sonia begged in a timid, broken voice. Oh, certainly, as much as you like. And sincerely, Sonia, sincerely. But he wanted to say something quite different. He crossed himself several times. Sonia took up her shawl and put it over her head. It was the green drapped dame's shawl of which Marmeladov had spoken, the family shawl. Raskolnikov thought of that looking at it, but he did not ask. He began to feel himself that he was certainly forgetting things and was disgustingly agitated. He was frightened at this. He was suddenly struck too by the thought that Sonia meant to go with him. What are you doing? Where are you going? Stay here, stay. I'll go alone, he cried in cowardly vexation, and almost resentful, he moved towards the door. What's the use of going in procession, he muttered, going out. Sonia remained standing in the middle of the room. He had not even said goodbye to her, he had forgotten her. A poignant and rebellious doubt surged in his heart. Was it right, was it right, all this, he thought again as he went down the stairs. Couldn't he stop and retract it all, and not go? But still he went. He felt suddenly once for all that he mustn't ask himself questions. As he turned into the street, he remembered that he had not said goodbye to Sonia, that he had left her in the middle of the room in her green shawl, not daring to stir after he had shouted at her, and he stopped short for a moment. At the same instant, another thought dawned upon him, as though it had been lying in wait to strike him then. Why, with what object did I go to her just now? I told her, on business, on what business? I had no sort of business. To tell her I was going, but where was the need? Do I love her? No, no, I drove her away just now like a dog. Did I want her crosses? Oh, how low I've sunk. No, I wanted her tears, I wanted to see her terror, to see how her heart ached. I had to have something to cling to, something to delay me, some friendly face to see. And I dared to believe in myself, to dream of what I would do. I am a beggarly contemptible wretch, contemptible. He walked along the canal bank, and he had not much further to go. But on reaching the bridge, he stopped and turning out of his way along it went to the hay market. He looked eagerly to right and left, gazed intently at every object and could not fix his attention on anything, everything slipped away. In another week, another month I shall be driven at a prison van over this bridge, how shall I look at the canal then? I should like to remember this, slipped into his mind. Look at this sign. How shall I read those letters then? It's written here company, that's a thing to remember, that letter A, and to look at it again in a month, how shall I look at it then? What shall I be feeling and thinking? Then? How trivial it all must be, what I am fretting about now. Of course it must all be interesting, in its way. Ha ha ha. What am I thinking about? I am becoming a baby, I am showing off to myself, why am I ashamed? Foo! How people shove! 
That fat man, a German he must be, who pushed against me, does he know whom he pushed? There's a peasant woman with a baby, begging. It's curious that she thinks me happier than she is. I might give her something, for the incongruity of it. Here's a five kopeck piece left in my pocket, where did I get it? Here, here, take it, my good woman. God bless you, the beggar chanted in a lachrymose voice. He went into the hay market. It was distasteful, very distasteful to be in a crowd, but he walked just where he saw most people. He would have given anything in the world to be alone, but he knew himself that he would not have remained alone for a moment. There was a man drunk and disorderly in the crowd, he kept trying to dance and falling down. There was a ring round him. Raskolnikov squeezed his way through the crowd, stared for some minutes at the drunken man and suddenly gave a short jerky laugh. A minute later he had forgotten him and did not see him, though he still stared. He moved away at last, not remembering where he was, but when he got into the middle of the square an emotion suddenly came over him, overwhelming him body and mind. He suddenly recalled Sonia's words, go to the crossroads, bow down to the people, kiss the earth, for you have sinned against it too, and say aloud to the whole world, I am a murderer. He trembled, remembering that. And the hopeless misery and anxiety of all that time, especially of the last hours, had weighed so heavily upon him that he positively clutched at the chance of this new unmixed, complete sensation. It came over him like a fit, it was like a single spark kindled in his soul and spreading fire through him. Everything in him softened at once and the tears started into his eyes. He fell to the earth on the spot. He knelt down in the middle of the square, bowed down to the earth, and kissed that filthy earth with bliss and rapture. He got up and bowed down a second time. He's boozed, a youth near him observed. There was a roar of laughter. He's going to Jerusalem, brothers, and saying goodbye to his children and his country. He's bowing down to all the world and kissing the great city of St. Petersburg and its pavement, added a workman who was a little drunk. Quite a young man, too, observed a third. And a gentleman, someone observed soberly. There's no knowing who's a gentleman and who isn't nowadays. These exclamations and remarks checked Raskolnikov, and the words, I am a murderer, which were perhaps on the point of dropping from his lips, died away. He bore these remarks quietly, however, and, without looking round, he turned down a street leading to the police office. He had a glimpse of something on the way which did not surprise him, he had felt that it must be so. The second time he bowed down in the hay market, he saw, standing fifty paces from him on the left, Sonia. She was hiding from him behind one of the wooden shanties in the marketplace. She had followed him then on his painful way. Raskolnikov at that moment felt and knew once for all that Sonia was with him forever and would follow him to the ends of the earth, wherever fate might take him. It wrung his heart, but he was just reaching the fatal place. He went into the yard fairly resolutely. He had to mount to the third story. I shall be some time going up, he thought. He felt as though the fateful moment was still far off, as though he had plenty of time left for consideration. Again the same rubbish, the same eggshells lying about on the spiral stairs, again the open doors of the flats, again the same kitchens and the same fumes and stench coming from them. Raskolnikov had not been here since that day. His legs were numb and gave way under him, but still they moved forward. He stopped for a moment to take breath, to collect himself, so as to enter like a man. But why? What for? he wondered, reflecting. If I must drink the cup what difference does it make? The more revolting the better. He imagined for an instant the figure of the explosive lieutenant, Ilya Petrovich. Was he actually going to him? Couldn't he go to someone else? To Nikodim Fomich? Couldn't he turn back and go straight to Nikodim Fomich's lodgings? At least then it would be done privately. No, no. To the explosive lieutenant. 
If he must drink it, drink it off at once. Turning cold and hardly conscious, he opened the door of the office. There were very few people in it this time, only a house porter and a peasant. The doorkeeper did not even peep out from behind his screen. Raskolnikov walked into the next room. Perhaps I still need not speak, passed through his mind. Some sort of clerk not wearing a uniform was settling himself at a bureau to write. In a corner another clerk was seating himself. Zaintov was not there, nor, of course, Nikodim Fomich. No one in? Raskolnikov asked, addressing the person at the bureau. Whom do you want? Aa. Not a sound was heard, not a sight was seen, but I sent the Russian, how does it go on in the fairy tale? I've forgotten. At your service, a familiar voice cried suddenly. Raskolnikov shuddered. The explosive lieutenant stood before him. He had just come in from the third room. It is the hand of fate, thought Raskolnikov. Why is he here? You've come to see us? What about, cried Ilya Petrovich. He was obviously in an exceedingly good humor and perhaps a trifle exhilarated. If it's on business, you are rather early. It's only a chance that I am here, however, I'll do what I can. I must admit, I, what is it, what is it? Excuse me. Raskolnikov. Of course, Raskolnikov. You didn't imagine I'd forgotten? Don't think I am like that. Rodion Ro, Ro, Rodionovich, that's it, isn't it? Rodion Romanovich. Yes, yes, of course, Rodion Romanovich. I was just getting at it. I made many inquiries about you. I assure you I've been genuinely grieved since that, since I behaved like that. It was explained to me afterwards that you were a literary man, and a learned one too, and so to say the first steps. Mercy on us! What literary or scientific man does not begin by some originality of conduct? My wife and I have the greatest respect for literature, in my wife it's a genuine passion. Literature and art. If only a man is a gentleman, all the rest can be gained by talents, learning, good sense, genius. As for a hat, well, what does a hat matter? I can buy a hat as easily as I can a bun, but what's under the hat, what the hat covers, I can't buy that. I was even meaning to come and apologize to you, but thought maybe you'd. But I am forgetting to ask you, is there anything you want really? I hear your family have come? Yes, my mother and sister. I've even had the honor and happiness of meeting your sister, a highly cultivated and charming person. I confess I was sorry I got so hot with you. There it is. But as for my looking suspiciously at your fainting fit, that affair has been cleared up splendidly. Bigotry and fanaticism. I understand your indignation. Perhaps you are changing your lodging on account of your family's arriving? No, I only looked in. I came to ask. I thought that I should find Zaintov here. Oh, yes. Of course, you've made friends, I heard. Well, no, Zaintov is not here. Yes, we've lost Zaintov. He's not been here since yesterday, he quarreled with everyone on leaving, in the rudest way. He is a feather-headed youngster, that's all, one might have expected something from him, but there, you know what they are, are brilliant young men. He wanted to go in for some examination, but it's only to talk and boast about it, it will go no further than that. Of course it's a very different matter with you or Mr. Razumihin there, your friend. Your career is an intellectual one, and you won't be deterred by failure. For you, one may say, all the attractions of life nihil est, you are an ascetic, a monk, a hermit. A book, a pen behind your ear, a learned research, that's where your spirit soars. I am the same way myself. Have you read Livingstone's Travels? No. Oh, 
I have. There are a great many nihilists about nowadays, you know, and indeed it is not to be wondered at. What sort of days are they? I ask you. But we thought, you are not a nihilist, of course? Answer me openly, openly. And no. Believe me, you can speak openly to me as you would to yourself. Official duty is one thing, but, you are thinking I meant to say friendship is quite another? No, you're wrong. It's not friendship, but the feeling of a man and a citizen, the feeling of humanity and of love for the Almighty. I may be an official, but I am always bound to feel myself a man and a citizen. You were asking about Zaintov. Zaintov will make a scandal in the French style in a house of bad reputation, over a glass of champagne, that's all your Zaintov is good for. While I'm perhaps, so to speak, burning with devotion and lofty feelings, and besides I have rank, consequence, a post. I am married and have children, I fulfill the duties of a man and a citizen, but who is he, may I ask? I appeal to you as a man ennobled by education. Then these midwives, too, have become extraordinarily numerous. Raskolnikov raised his eyebrows inquiringly. The words of Ilya Petrovich, who had obviously been dining, were for the most part a stream of empty sounds for him. But some of them he understood. He looked at him inquiringly, not knowing how it would end. I mean those crop-headed wenches, the talkative Ilya Petrovich, continued. Midwives is my name for them. I think it a very satisfactory one, ha <laughs> ha. They go to the academy, study anatomy. If I fall ill, am I to send for a young lady to treat me? What do you say? Ha <laughs> ha. Ilya Petrovich laughed, quite pleased with his own wit. It's an immoderate zeal for education, but... Once you're educated, that's enough. Why abuse it? Why insult honorable people, as that scoundrel Zaintov does? Why did he insult me, I ask you? Look at these suicides, too, how common they are, you can't fancy. People spend their last halfpenny and kill themselves, boys and girls and old people. Only this morning we heard about a gentleman who had just come to town. Neil Pavlich, I say, what was the name of that gentleman who shot himself? Svitergalov, someone answered from the other room with drowsy listlessness. Raskolnikov started. Svitergalov. Svitergalov has shot himself, he cried. What, do you know Svitergalov? Yes. I knew him. He hadn't been here long. Yes, that's so. He had lost his wife, was a man of reckless habits, and all of a sudden shot himself, and in such a shocking way. He left in his notebook a few words, that he dies in full possession of his faculties and that no one is to blame for his death. He had money, they say. How did you come to know him? I was acquainted, my sister was governess in his family. Ba ba ba. Then no doubt you can tell us something about him. You had no suspicion? I saw him yesterday, he was drinking wine, I knew nothing. Raskolnikov felt as though something had fallen on him and was stifling him. You've turned pale again. It's so stuffy here. Yes, I must go, muttered Raskolnikov. Excuse my troubling you. Oh, not at all, as often as you like. It's a pleasure to see you, and I am glad to say so. Ilya Petrovich held out his hand. I only wanted. I came to see Zaintov. I understand, I understand, and it's a pleasure to see you. I am very glad, goodbye, Raskolnikov smiled. He went out, he reeled, he was overtaken with giddiness and did not know what he was doing. He began going down the stairs, supporting himself with his right hand against the wall. He fancied that a porter pushed past him on his way upstairs to the police office, that a dog in the lower story kept up a shrill barking and that a woman flung a rolling pin at it and shouted. 
He went down and out into the yard. There, not far from the entrance, stood Sonia, pale and horror-stricken. She looked wildly at him. He stood still before her. There was a look of poignant agony, of despair, in her face. She clasped her hands. His lips worked in an ugly, meaningless smile. He stood still a minute, grinned, and went back to the police office. Ilya Petrovich had sat down and was rummaging among some papers. Before him stood the same peasant who had pushed by on the stairs. Hello! Back again! Have you left something behind? What's the matter? Raskolnikov, with white lips and staring eyes, came slowly nearer. He walked right to the table, leaned his hand on it, tried to say something, but could not, only incoherent sounds were audible. You are feeling ill, a chair. Here, sit down. Some water. Raskolnikov dropped onto a chair, but he kept his eyes fixed on the face of Ilya Petrovich, which expressed unpleasant surprise. Both looked at one another for a minute and waited. Water was brought. It was I, began Raskolnikov. Drink some water. Raskolnikov refused the water with his hand, and softly and brokenly, but distinctly said, It was I killed the old pawnbroker woman and her sister Lizaveta with an axe and robbed them. Ilya Petrovich opened his mouth. People ran up on all sides. Raskolnikov repeated his statement. Siberia. On the banks of a broad solitary river stands a town, one of the administrative centers of Russia. In the town there is a fortress, in the fortress there is a prison. In the prison, the second-class convict Radion Raskolnikov has been confined for nine months. Almost a year and a half has passed since his crime. There had been little difficulty about his trial. The criminal adhered exactly, firmly, and clearly to his statement. He did not confuse nor misrepresent the facts, nor soften them in his own interest, nor omit the smallest detail. He explained every incident of the murder, the secret of the pledge, the piece of wood with a strip of metal, which was found in the murdered woman's hand. He described minutely how he had taken her keys, what they were like, as well as the chest and its contents. He explained the mystery of Lizaveta's murder, described how Coke and, after him, the student knocked and repeated all they had said to one another, how he afterwards had run downstairs and heard Nikolai and Dmitri shouting, how he had hidden in the empty flat and afterwards gone home. He ended by indicating the stone in the yard off the Voznesensky prospect under which the purse and the trinkets were found. The whole thing, in fact, was perfectly clear. The lawyers and the judges were very much struck, among other things, by the fact that he had hidden the trinkets and the purse under a stone, without making use of them, and that, what was more, he did not now remember what the trinkets were like, or even how many there were. The fact that he had never opened the purse and did not even know how much was in it seemed incredible. There turned out to be in the purse 317 rubles and 60 kopecks. From being so long under the stone, some of the most valuable notes lying uppermost had suffered from the damp. They were along while trying to discover why the accused man should tell a lie about this, when about everything else he had made a truthful and straightforward confession. Finally, some of the lawyers more versed in psychology admitted that it was possible he had really not looked into the purse, and so didn't know what was in it when he hid it under the stone. But they immediately drew the deduction that the crime could only have been committed through temporary mental derangement, through homicidal mania, without object or the pursuit of gain. This fell in with the most recent fashionable theory of temporary insanity, so often applied in our days in criminal cases. Moreover, Raskolnikov's hypochondriacal condition was proved by many witnesses, by Dr. Zosimov, his former fellow students, his landlady, and her servant. All this pointed strongly to the conclusion that Raskolnikov was not quite like an ordinary murderer and robber, but that there was another element in the case. To the intense annoyance of those who maintained this opinion, the criminal scarcely attempted to defend himself. 
to the decisive question as to what motive impelled him to the murder and the robbery, he answered very clearly with the coarsest frankness that the cause was his miserable position, his poverty and helplessness, and his desire to provide for his first steps in life by the help of the three thousand rubles he had reckoned on finding. He had been led to the murder through his shallow and cowardly nature, exasperated moreover by privation and failure. To the question what led him to confess, he answered that it was his heartfelt repentance. All this was almost coarse. The sentence however was more merciful than could have been expected, perhaps partly because the criminal had not tried to justify himself, but had rather shown a desire to exaggerate his guilt. All the strange and peculiar circumstances of the crime were taken into consideration. There could be no doubt of the abnormal and poverty-stricken condition of the criminal at the time. The fact that he had made no use of what he had stolen was put down partly to the effect of remorse, partly to his abnormal mental condition at the time of the crime. Incidentally, the murder of Lizavita served indeed to confirm the last hypothesis, a man commits two murders and forgets that the door is open. Finally, the confession, at the very moment when the case was hopelessly muddled by the false evidence given by Nikolai through melancholy and fanaticism, and when, moreover, there were no proofs against the real criminal, no suspicions even, Porfiry Petrovich fully kept his word, all this did much to soften the sentence. Other circumstances, too, in the prisoner's favor came out quite unexpectedly. Razumihin somehow discovered and proved that while Raskolnikov was at the university he had helped a poor consumptive fellow student and had spent his last penny on supporting him for six months, and when this student died, leaving a decrepit old father whom he had maintained almost from his thirteenth year, Raskolnikov had got the old man into a hospital and paid for his funeral when he died. Raskolnikov's landlady bore witness, too, that when they had lived in Another house at five corners, Raskolnikov had rescued two little children from a house on fire and was burned in doing so. This was investigated and fairly well confirmed by many witnesses. These facts made an impression in his favor. And in the end the criminal was, in consideration of extenuating circumstances, condemned to penal servitude in the second class for a term of eight years only. At the very beginning of the trial Raskolnikov's mother fell ill. Dunia and Razumihin found it possible to get her out of Petersburg during the trial. Razumihin chose a town on the railway not far from Petersburg, so as to be able to follow every step of the trial and at the same time to see Avdosha Romanovna as often as possible. Pulcheria Alexandrovna's illness was a strange nervous one and was accompanied by a partial derangement of her intellect. When Dunia returned from her last interview with her brother, she had found her mother already ill, in feverish delirium. That evening Razumihin and she agreed what answers they must make to her mother's questions about Raskolnikov and made up a complete story for her mother's benefit of his having to go away to a distant part of Russia on a business commission, which would bring him in the end money and reputation. But they were struck by the fact that Pulcheria Alexandrovna never asked them anything on the subject, neither then nor thereafter. On the contrary, she had her own version of her son's sudden departure, she told them with tears how he had come to say goodbye to her, hinting that she alone knew many mysterious and important facts, and that Rodia had many very powerful enemies, so that it was necessary for him to be in hiding. As for his future career, she had no doubt that it would be brilliant when certain sinister influences could be removed. She assured Razumihin that her son would be one day a great statesman, that his article and brilliant literary talent proved it. This article she was continually reading, she even read it aloud, almost took it to bed with her, but scarcely asked where Rodia was, though the subject was obviously avoided by the others, which might have been enough to awaken her suspicions. They began to be frightened at last at Pulcheria Alexandrovna's strange silence on certain subjects. She did not, for instance, complain of getting no letters from him, though in previous years she had only lived on the hope of letters from her beloved Rodia. This was the cause of great uneasiness to Dunia, the idea occurred to her that her mother suspected that there was something terrible in her son's fate and was afraid to ask, for fear of hearing something still more awful. In any case, Dunia saw clearly that her mother was not in full possession of her faculties. 
It happened once or twice, however, that Palcheria Alexandrovna gave such a turn to the conversation that it was impossible to answer her without mentioning where Rodia was, and on receiving unsatisfactory and suspicious answers she became at once gloomy and silent, and this mood lasted for a long time. Dunia saw at last that it was hard to deceive her and came to the conclusion that it was better to be absolutely silent on certain points, but it became more and more evident that the poor mother suspected something terrible. Dunia remembered her brothers telling her that her mother had overheard her talking in her sleep on the night after her interview with Svidrigailov and before the fatal day of the confession, had not she made out something from that? Sometimes days and even weeks of gloomy silence and tears would be succeeded by a period of hysterical animation, and the invalid would begin to talk almost incessantly of her son, of her hopes of his future. Her fancies were sometimes very strange. They humored her, pretended to agree with her, she saw perhaps that they were pretending, but she still went on talking. Five months after Raskolnikov's confession, he was sentenced. Razumihin and Sonia saw him in prison as often as it was possible. At last the moment of separation came. Dunia swore to her brother that the separation should not be forever, Razumihin did the same. Razumihin, in his youthful ardor, had firmly resolved to lay the foundations at least of a secure livelihood during the next three or four years, and saving up a certain sum, to emigrate to Siberia, a country rich in every natural resource and in need of workers, active men and capital. There they would settle in the town where Rhodia was, and all together would begin a new life. They all wept at parting. Raskolnikov had been very dreamy for a few days before. He asked a great deal about his mother and was constantly anxious about her. He worried so much about her that it alarmed Dunia. When he heard about his mother's illness, he became very gloomy. With Sonia, he was particularly reserved all the time. With the help of the money left to her by Svidrigailov, Sonia had long ago made her preparations to follow the party of convicts in which he was dispatched to Siberia. Not a word passed between Raskolnikov and her on the subject, but both knew it would be so. At the final leave-taking he smiled strangely at his sister's and Razumihin's fervent anticipations of their happy future together when he should come out of prison. He predicted that their mother's illness would soon have a fatal ending. Sonia and he at last set off. Two months later Dunia was married to Razumihin. It was a quiet and sorrowful wedding, Porfiry Petrovich and Zosimov were invited, however. During all this period Razumihin wore an air of resolute determination. Dunia put implicit faith in his carrying out his plans, and indeed she could not but believe in him. He displayed a rare strength of will. Among other things he began attending university lectures again in order to take his degree. They were continually making plans for the future, both counted on settling in Siberia within five years at least. Till then they rested their hopes on Sonia. Pulcheria Alexandrovna was delighted to give her blessing to Dunia's marriage with Razumihin, but after the marriage she became even more melancholy and anxious. To give her pleasure Razumihin told her how Raskolnikov had looked after the poor student and his decrepit father and how a year ago he had been burnt and injured in rescuing two little children from a fire. These two pieces of news excited Pulcheria Alexandrovna's disordered imagination almost to ecstasy. She was continually talking about them, even entering into conversation with strangers in the street, though Dunia always accompanied her. In public conveyances and shops, wherever she could capture a listener, she would begin the discourse about her son, his article, how he had helped the student, how he had been burned at the fire, and so on. Dunia did not know how to restrain her. Apart from the danger of her morbid excitement, there was the risk of someone's recalling Raskolnikov's name and speaking of the recent trial. Pulcheria Alexandrovna found out the address of the mother of the two children her son had saved and insisted on going to see her. At last her restlessness reached an extreme point. She would sometimes begin to cry suddenly and was often ill and feverishly delirious. One morning she declared that by her reckoning Rodia ought soon to be home, 
that she remembered when he said goodbye to her he said that they must expect him back in nine months. She began to prepare for his coming, began to do up her room for him, to clean the furniture, to wash and put up new hangings, and so on. Dunia was anxious, but said nothing and helped her to arrange the room. After a fatiguing day spent in continual fancies, in joyful daydreams and tears, Pulcheria Alexandrovna was taken ill in the night and by morning she was feverish and delirious. It was brain fever. She died within a fortnight. In her delirium she dropped words which showed that she knew a great deal more about her son's terrible fate than they had supposed. For a long time Raskolnikov did not know of his mother's death though a regular correspondence had been maintained from the time he reached Siberia. It was carried on by means of Sonia, who wrote every month to the Razumihins and received an answer with unfailing regularity. At first they found Sonia's letters dry and unsatisfactory, but later on they came to the conclusion that the letters could not be better, for from these letters they received a complete picture of their unfortunate brother's life. Sonia's letters were full of the most matter-of-fact detail, the simplest and clearest description of all Raskolnikov's surroundings as a convict. There was no word of her own hopes, no conjecture as to the future, no description of her feelings. Instead of any attempt to interpret his state of mind and inner life, she gave the simple facts, that is, his own words, an exact account of his health, what he asked for at their interviews, what commission he gave her and so on. All these facts she gave with extraordinary minuteness. The picture of their unhappy brother stood out at last with great clearness and precision. There could be no mistake, because nothing was given but facts. But Dunia and her husband could get little comfort out of the news, especially at first. Sonia wrote that he was constantly sullen and not ready to talk, that he scarcely seemed interested in the news she gave him from their letters, that he sometimes asked after his mother and that when, seeing that he had guessed the truth, she told him at last of her death, she was surprised to find that he did not seem greatly affected by it, not externally at any rate. She told them that, although he seemed so wrapped up in himself and, as it were, shut himself off from everyone, he took a very direct and simple view of his new life, that he understood his position, expected nothing better for the time, had no ill-founded hopes, as is so common in his position, and scarcely seemed surprised at anything in his surroundings, so unlike anything he had known before. She wrote that his health was satisfactory, he did his work without shirking or seeking to do more, he was almost indifferent about food, but except on Sundays and holidays the food was so bad that at last he had been glad to accept some money from her, Sonia, to have his own tea every day. He begged her not to trouble about anything else, declaring that all this fuss about him only annoyed him. Sonia wrote further that in prison he shared the same room with the rest, that she had not seen the inside of their barracks, but concluded that they were crowded, miserable and unhealthy, that he slept on a plank bed with a rug under him and was unwilling to make any other arrangement. But that he lived so poorly and roughly, not from any plan or design, but simply from inattention and indifference. Sonia wrote simply that he had at first shown no interest in her visits, had almost been vexed with her indeed for coming, unwilling to talk and rude to her. But that in the end these visits had become a habit and almost a necessity for him, so that he was positively distressed when she was ill for some days and could not visit him. She used to see him on holidays at the prison gates or in the guard room, to which he was brought for a few minutes to see her. On working days she would go to see him at work either at the workshops or at the brick kills, or at the sheds on the banks of the Irtish. About herself, Sonia wrote that she had succeeded in making some acquaintances in the town, that she did sewing, and, as there was scarcely a dressmaker in the town, she was looked upon as an indispensable person in many houses. But she did not mention that the authorities were, through her, interested in Raskolnikov, that his task was lightened and so on. At last the news came, Dunia had indeed noticed signs of alarm and uneasiness in the preceding letters, that he held aloof from everyone, that his fellow prisoners did not like him, that he kept silent for days at a time and was becoming very pale. In the last letter Sonia wrote that he had been taken very seriously ill and was in the convict ward of the hospital. He was ill a long time. 
but it was not the horrors of prison life, not the hard labor, the bad food, the shaven head, or the patched clothes that crushed him. What did he care for all those trials and hardships? He was even glad of the hard work. Physically exhausted, he could at least reckon on a few hours of quiet sleep. And what was the food to him, the thin cabbage soup with beetles floating in it? In the past as a student he had often not had even that. His clothes were warm and suited to his manner of life. He did not even feel the fetters. Was he ashamed of his shaven head and party-colored coat? Before whom? Before Sonia? Sonia was afraid of him, how could he be ashamed before her? And yet he was ashamed even before Sonia, whom he tortured because of it with his contemptuous rough manner. But it was not his shaven head and his fetters he was ashamed of, his pride had been stung to the quick. It was wounded pride that made him ill. Oh, how happy he would have been if he could have blamed himself. He could have borne anything then, even shame and disgrace. But he judged himself severely, and his exasperated conscience found no particularly terrible fault in his past, except a simple blunder which might happen to anyone. He was ashamed just because he, Raskolnikov, had so hopelessly, stupidly come to grief through some decree of blind fate, and must humble himself and submit to the idiocy of a sentence, if he were anyhow to be at peace. Vague and objectless anxiety in the present, and in the future a continual sacrifice leading to nothing, that was all that lay before him. And what comfort was it to him that at the end of eight years he would only be thirty-two and able to begin a new life? What had he to live for? What had he to look forward to? Why should he strive? To live in order to exist? Why, he had been ready a thousand times before to give up existence for the sake of an idea, for a hope, even for a fancy. Mere existence had always been too little for him, he had always wanted more. Perhaps it was just because of the strength of his desires that he had thought himself a man to whom more was permissible than to others. And if only fate would have sent him repentance, burning repentance that would have torn his heart and robbed him of sleep, that repentance, the awful agony of which brings visions of hanging or drowning. Oh, he would have been glad of it. Tears and agonies would at least have been life. But he did not repent of his crime. At least he might have found relief in raging at his stupidity, as he had raged at the grotesque blunders that had brought him to prison. But now in prison, in freedom, he thought over and criticized all his actions again and by no means found them so blundering and so grotesque as they had seemed at the fatal time. In what way, he asked himself, was my theory stupider than others that have swarmed and clashed from the beginning of the world? One is only to look at the thing quite independently, broadly, and uninfluenced by commonplace ideas, and my idea will by no means seem so strange. Oh, skeptics and halfpenny philosophers, why do you halt halfway? Why does my action strike them as so horrible, he said to himself. Is it because it was a crime? What is meant by crime? My conscience is at rest. Of course, it was a legal crime, of course, the letter of the law was broken and blood was shed. Well, punish me for the letter of the law, and that's enough. Of course, in that case many of the benefactors of mankind who snatched power for themselves instead of inheriting it ought to have been punished at their first steps. But those men succeeded and so they were right, and I didn't, and so I had no right to have taken that step. It was only in that that he recognized his criminality, only in the fact that he had been unsuccessful and had confessed it. He suffered too from the question, why had he not killed himself? Why had he stood looking at the river and preferred to confess? Was the desire to live so strong and was it so hard to overcome it? Had not Svidrigailov overcome it, although he was afraid of death? In misery he asked himself this question, and could not understand that, at the very time he had been standing looking into the river, he had perhaps been dimly conscious of the fundamental falsity in himself and his convictions. He didn't understand that that consciousness might be the promise of a future crisis, 
of a new view of life and of his future resurrection. He preferred to attribute it to the dead weight of instinct, which he could not step over, again through weakness and meanness. He looked at his fellow prisoners and was amazed to see how they all loved life and prized it. It seemed to him that they loved and valued life more in prison than in freedom. What terrible agonies and privations some of them, the tramps for instance, had endured! Could they care so much for a ray of sunshine, for the primeval forest, the cold spring hidden away in some unseen spot, which the tramp had marked three years before, and longed to see again, as he might to see his sweetheart, dreaming of the green grass round it and the birds singing in the bush? As he went on he saw still more inexplicable examples. In prison, of course, there was a great deal he did not see and did not want to see, he lived as it were with downcast eyes. It was loathsome and unbearable for him to look. But in the end there was much that surprised him and he began, as it were involuntarily, to notice much that he had not suspected before. What surprised him most of all was the terrible impossible gulf that lay between him and all the rest. They seemed to be a different species, and he looked at them and they at him with distrust and hostility. He felt and knew the reasons of his isolation, but he would never have admitted till then that those reasons were so deep and strong. There were some Polish exiles, political prisoners, among them. They simply looked down upon all the rest as ignorant churls, but Raskolnikov could not look upon them like that. He saw that these ignorant men were in many respects far wiser than the Poles. There were some Russians who were just as contemptuous, a former officer and two seminarists. Raskolnikov saw their mistake as clearly. He was disliked and avoided by everyone, they even began to hate him at last, why, he could not tell. Men who had been far more guilty despised and laughed at his crime. You're a gentleman, they used to say. You shouldn't hack about with an axe, that's not a gentleman's work. The second week in Lent, his turn came to take the sacrament with his gang. He went to church and prayed with the others. A quarrel broke out one day, he did not know how. All fell on him at once in a fury. You're an infidel. You don't believe in God, they shouted. You ought to be killed. He had never talked to them about God nor his belief, but they wanted to kill him as an infidel. He said nothing. One of the prisoners rushed at him in a perfect frenzy. Raskolnikov awaited him calmly and silently, his eyebrows did not quiver, his face did not flinch. The guard succeeded in intervening between him and his assailant, or there would have been bloodshed. There was another question he could not decide, why were they all so fond of Sonia? She did not try to win their favor, she rarely met them, sometimes only she came to see him at work for a moment. And yet everybody knew her, they knew that she had come out to follow him, knew how and where she lived. She never gave them money, did them no particular services. Only once at Christmas she sent them all presents of pies and rolls. But by degrees closer relations sprang up between them and Sonia. She would write and post letters for them to their relations. Relations of the prisoners who visited the town, at their instructions, left with Sonia presents and money for them. Their wives and sweethearts knew her and used to visit her. And when she visited Raskolnikov at work, or met a party of the prisoners on the road, they all took off their hats to her. Little mother Sofia Semyonovna, you are our dear, good little mother, coarse-branded criminals said to that frail little creature. She would smile and bow to them and everyone was delighted when she smiled. They even admired her gait and turned round to watch her walking, they admired her too for being so little, and, in fact, did not know what to admire her most for. They even came to her for help in their illnesses. He was in the hospital from the middle of Lent till after Easter. When he was better, he remembered the dreams he had had while he was feverish and delirious. He dreamt that the whole world was condemned to a terrible new strange plague that had come to Europe from the depths of Asia. All were to be destroyed except a very few chosen. 
Some new sorts of microbes were attacking the bodies of men, but these microbes were endowed with intelligence and will. Men attacked by them became at once mad and furious. But never had men considered themselves so intellectual and so completely in possession of the truth as these sufferers, never had they considered their decisions, their scientific conclusions, their moral convictions so infallible. Whole villages, whole towns and peoples went mad from the infection. All were excited and did not understand one another. Each thought that he alone had the truth and was wretched looking at the others, beat himself on the breast, wept, and wrung his hands. They did not know how to judge and could not agree what to consider evil and what good, they did not know whom to blame, whom to justify. Men killed each other in a sort of senseless spite. They gathered together in armies against one another, but even on the march the armies would begin attacking each other the ranks would be broken and the soldiers would fall on each other, stabbing and cutting, biting and devouring each other. The alarm bell was ringing all day long in the towns, men rushed together, but why they were summoned and who was summoning them no one knew. The most ordinary trades were abandoned, because everyone proposed his own ideas, his own improvements, and they could not agree. The land too was abandoned. Men met in groups, agreed on something, swore to keep together, but at once began on something quite different from what they had proposed. They accused one another, fought and killed each other. There were conflagrations and famine. All men and all things were involved in destruction. The plague spread and moved further and further. Only a few men could be saved in the whole world. They were a pure chosen people destined to found a new race and a new life, to renew and purify the earth, but no one had seen these men, no one had heard their words and their voices. Raskolnikov was worried that this senseless dream haunted his memory so miserably, the impression of this feverish delirium persisted so long. The second week after Easter had come. There were warm bright spring days, in the prison ward the grating windows under which the sentinel paced were opened. Sonia had only been able to visit him twice during his illness, each time she had to obtain permission, and it was difficult. But she often used to come to the hospital yard, especially in the evening, sometimes only to stand a minute and look up at the windows of the ward. One evening, when he was almost well again, Raskolnikov fell asleep. On waking up, he chanced to go to the window, and at once saw Sonia in the distance at the hospital gate. She seemed to be waiting for someone. Something stabbed him to the heart at that minute. He shuddered and moved away from the window. Next day Sonia did not come, nor the day after, he noticed that he was expecting her uneasily. At last he was discharged. On reaching the prison he learned from the convicts that Sofia Semyonovna was lying ill at home and was unable to go out. He was very uneasy and sent to inquire after her, he soon learnt that her illness was not dangerous. Hearing that he was anxious about her, Sonia sent him a penciled note, telling him that she was much better, that she had a slight cold and that she would soon, very soon come and see him at his work. His heart throbbed painfully as he read it. Again it was a warm bright day. Early in the morning, at six o'clock, he went off to work on the river bank, where they used to pound alabaster and where there was a kiln for baking it in a shed. There were only three of them sent. One of the convicts went with the guard to the fortress to fetch a tool, the other began getting the wood ready and laying it in the kiln. Raskolnikov came out of the shed onto the river bank, sat down on a heap of logs by the shed and began gazing at the wide deserted river. From the high bank a broad landscape opened before him, the sound of singing floated faintly audible from the other bank. In the vast steppe, bathed in sunshine, he could just see, like black specks, the nomads' tents. There there was freedom, their other men were living, utterly unlike those here, their time itself seemed to stand still, as though the age of Abraham and his flocks had not passed. Raskolnikov sat gazing, his thoughts passed into daydreams, into contemplation, he thought of nothing, but a vague restlessness excited and troubled him. Suddenly he found Sonia beside him, she had come up noiselessly and sat down at his side. 
it was still quite early, the morning chill was still keen. She wore her poor old burnous and the green shawl, her face still showed signs of illness, it was thinner and paler. She gave him a joyful smile of welcome, but held out her hand with her usual timidity. She was always timid of holding out her hand to him and sometimes did not offer it at all, as though afraid he would repel it. He always took her hand as though with repugnance, always seemed vexed to meet her, and was sometimes obstinately silent throughout her visit. Sometimes she trembled before him and went away deeply grieved. But now their hands did not part. He stole a rapid glance at her and dropped his eyes on the ground without speaking. They were alone, no one had seen them. The guard had turned away for the time. How it happened he did not know. But all at once something seemed to seize him and fling him at her feet. He wept and threw his arms round her knees. For the first instant she was terribly frightened and she turned pale. She jumped up and looked at him trembling. But at the same moment she understood, and a light of infinite happiness came into her eyes. She knew and had no doubt that he loved her beyond everything and that at last the moment had come. They wanted to speak, but could not, tears stood in their eyes. They were both pale and thin, but those sick pale faces were bright with the dawn of a new future, of a full resurrection into a new life. They were renewed by love, the heart of each held infinite sources of life for the heart of the other. They resolved to wait and be patient. They had another seven years to wait, and what terrible suffering and what infinite happiness before them. But he had risen again and he knew it and felt it in all his being, while she, she only lived in his life. On the evening of the same day, when the barracks were locked, Raskolnikov lay on his plank bed and thought of her. He had even fancied that day that all the convicts who had been his enemies looked at him differently, he had even entered into talk with them and they answered him in a friendly way. He remembered that now, and thought it was bound to be so. Wasn't everything now bound to be changed? He thought of her. He remembered how continually he had tormented her and wounded her heart. He remembered her pale and thin little face. But these recollections scarcely troubled him now, he knew with what infinite love he would now repay all her sufferings. And what were all, all the agonies of the past? Everything, even his crime, his sentence and imprisonment, seemed to him now in the first rush of feeling an external, strange fact with which he had no concern. But he could not think for long together of anything that evening, and he could not have analyzed anything consciously, he was simply feeling. Life had stepped into the place of theory, and something quite different would work itself out in his mind. Under his pillow lay the New Testament. He took it up mechanically. The book belonged to Sonia, it was the one from which she had read the raising of Lazarus to him. At first he was afraid that she would worry him about religion, would talk about the gospel, and pester him with books. But to his great surprise she had not once approached the subject and had not even offered him the testament. He had asked her for it himself not long before his illness, and she brought him the book without a word. Till now, he had not opened it. He did not open it now, but one thought passed through his mind, can her convictions not be mine now? Her feelings, her aspirations at least. She too had been greatly agitated that day, and at night she was taken ill again. But she was so happy, and so unexpectedly happy, that she was almost frightened of her happiness. Seven years, only seven years. At the beginning of their happiness at some moments, they were both ready to look on those seven years as though they were seven days. He did not know that. The new life would not be given him for nothing, that he would have to pay dearly for it, that it would cost him great striving, great suffering. But that is the beginning of a new story, the story of the gradual renewal of a man, the story of his gradual regeneration, of his passing from one world into another, of his initiation into a new unknown life. That might be the subject of a new story, but our present story is ended. The End